Good morning, everyone. The conversations are going, but to be punctual and on time, we have decided to sit to start exactly at nine. So I do see some people are trying to take their seats. So let me just give them a few seconds. Okay, okay. So good morning once again, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, invited speakers, all protocols observed. A very warm welcome to uh, the capacity building workshop uh, in building the Ethiopian capital market ecosystem. As you all are well aware, the development of the capital markets uh, is a key element of the Ethiopian government's homegrown economic reform agenda. And in line with that commitment uh, to make the capital market a reality, the proclamation, which includes uh, the establishment of the Ethiopian Security Exchange, ASX, um, was adopted two years back. Time flies, doesn't it? Uh, with the support of FSD Africa, uh, a dedicated exchange project office has been established uh, to adopt the launch of the exchange uh, with the support of, of course, the Ethiopia Capital Markets Authority. Uh, the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa uh, also has been assisting the exchange uh, project in collaboration with Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation uh, and uh, has been supporting in proposed stakeholder engagements. A particular emphasis on specific thematic areas like money, fixed, and um, fixed income and equity markets. And today's session is brought to you uh, to deliver that. And we do wish we could learn together. Before I introduce and hand over to uh, our guest of honors to give their opening remarks, which is going to be virtual, thanks to technology, uh, I do have some few housekeepings, if that's okay. So just to ensure that we can engage with each other, I would ask that you all take your mobile phones and kindly put them on silent. Thank you very much. Okay. So the second one is very simple. If there is anyone that hasn't seen the venue, the washrooms are just on your right side on the door. So in case there are anything you need, the team would also be assisting as well. Now, without further taking much time, I would want to, uh, we would want to kickstart with the opening remarks. Like I said, it's going to be a virtual one. Uh, and I would call upon um, the acting executive secretary of uh, UNECA, Mr. Antonio Pedro, to give us uh, the first uh, opening remarks. Good morning. I'm pleased to welcome you to this capacity building workshop for the Ethiopian Securities Exchange, organized in partnership with Ethiopian Investment Holdings, the Ethiopian Securities Exchange, and FSD Africa, with technical support from the Ethiopian Capital Market Authority and financial backing from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. This workshop is a critical step for the preparation of the launch of Ethiopia's first securities exchange and the development of Ethiopia's financial system. We have a series of presentations and interactive sessions prepared for you to strengthen the capacity of the market participants, prepare potential issuers and investors, introduce ESX to key policymakers and regulators, and bridge discussions among stakeholders. Distinguished participants, ECA has been growing with our host country, Ethiopia, for the past six decades. 
as the political hub of the African continent and the second most populous country in Africa, Ethiopia's reform agenda and pathway of inclusive and sustained development have significance for its own citizens as well as for the region. Therefore, ECA spares no effort in supporting Ethiopia's socioeconomic development and structural transformation. Since the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic, Ethiopia, as many African countries, has faced a series of challenges, including a high burden of external debt service, a food and energy price crisis, and difficult weather conditions fueled by climate change. It is time we build inclusivity and resilience against future shocks by reforming internal institutions and deepening domestic markets. Robust local capital markets allow to us to effectively mobilize domestic resources for long-term investments in a country's productive capacity, thereby providing a significant boost to structural transformation. This bolstering of Africa's country's fiscal space is more sustainable than a heavy reliance on external funding, which is frequently exposed to exchange rate risks and vulnerable to sudden capital flight. In this regard, the Ethiopian Securities Exchange is a game changer for Ethiopia and for the region. It will not only build an ecosystem where issuers and investors make their needs met, but also, more fundamentally, improve fiscal and corporate governance, boost market transparency, and catalyze financial education and capacity building of market participants in Ethiopia. Dear colleagues, as we are about to enter a new era for Ethiopia's capital markets and embark on a new journey, it is high time for us to think about inclusivity, sustainability, and connectivity when we prepare for the launch of ESX, so that we can make the best out of this important platform. For inclusivity, we must ensure small institutional investors and retail investors have equal access to information and opportunities. Extensive consultation with representatives from the different market segments, such as this event, would help us to design and operationalize a better ESX. The roles of micro, small, and medium enterprises and women entrepreneurs cannot be overemphasized, and they shouldn't be left behind in the process of capital market development. For sustainability, we must encourage innovative instruments and solutions in our capital markets for green transition. The awareness, standards, and regulatory frameworks are just as important as the tools themselves, and the launch of ESX will be a catalyst for regulators, the market, and all stakeholders to take resolute actions in financing for sustained development. For connectivity, we must build a strong pan-African network of capital markets for standard setting, information sharing, peer learning, and eventually listing and trading. Today, we have over 30 stock exchanges operating in Africa, but individually, our capital markets are still generally small, thus vulnerable to headwinds from global markets. By joining hands with peer African exchange and harmonizing the rules and standards, we can facilitate capital flows and investments across the continent, create market resilience against external turbulences, elevate the African continental free trade area, and boost private sector development. Therefore, I'm very glad to hear that this event has gathered many experts from different countries of our continent to share their experience and expertise. Distinguished participants, ECA is a reliable partner to African countries for socioeconomic development. In the area of domestic financial market development, ECA has supported OMFIF 
to produce the APSA Africa Financial Markets Index, partnered with FrontClear to support Uganda, Tanzania, and Zambia to develop their money market and help Angola develop its domestic local currency bond market. Today, we are very glad to support the ESX, Ethiopia's groundbreaking initiative on financial market development, together with partners. I encourage all of you to have dynamic discussions and interactions in this two-day event and move forward the launch of ESX in its best shape. I thank you very much for your kind attention. So I guess, um, if anything, we have taken three basic things in terms of inclusivity, sustainability, and connectivity to consider when we're working on the exchange. In terms of, it's always fair uh, that we have our authority uh, to give us the opening uh, remark as well. So I'd like to uh, call upon His Excellency Dr. Brook Taye, Deputy Director General for Ethiopian Capital Markets Authority, who is also joining us virtually. So um, I would give it to Sheng. Good morning, esteemed guests. My name is Brooke Taye. I'm the Director General of the newly established Ethiopian Capital Market Authority, the apex regulator of the Ethiopian Capital Markets. I would like to start off by saying a special thank you to the UNECA, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and FSD Africa for the special support provided in organizing this exciting capacity building workshop, which illustrates the strong backing towards establishing capital markets from our development partners, as we work diligently to realize the launch of the Ethiopian Securities Exchange in 2024. The launch of the capital market is one of the government's key economic reform elements in the homegrown economic reform agenda, as shown by the successful ratification of the Capital Markets Proclamation in 2021, which included the establishment of the exchange by law, the first securities exchange in Ethiopia. The capital markets provide a critical avenue to address our development goals by helping fulfill both the public and private sector capital needs for the development of the country. The presence of the capital market significantly promotes and provides additional new options and instruments for investment as well as improving access to finance. With extensive effort and collaboration between the key market stakeholders, including the exchange, the Capital Market Authority, the National Bank of Ethiopia, Ministry of Finance, and the market intermediaries, along with the many technical support from development partners, we can gradually and successfully achieve the access to finance levels achieved in other countries with existing capital markets, bringing positive results to the wider economy. The main outcome of this effort is to successfully help elevate millions out of poverty by increasing access to capital. The Ethiopian Capital Market Authority is now fully established and has already delivered and consulted on some of the key directives going through the public consultation phase with the relevant stakeholders. The authority has been extensively engaging with the public through various means and continues to develop the nascent capital market. The principal objective of the authority include to protect investors, ensure the existence of a capital market environment in which securities can be issued and traded in an orderly, fair, efficient and transparent manner, reduce systemic risk by ensuring the integrity of the capital market and transactions, also to promote the development of the capital market by creating an enabling environment for long-term investment. The exchange will be a key part of a broader ecosystem of institutions, markets, and participants that make up a functioning Ethiopian capital market ecosystem. Putting in place a successful securities exchange heavily depends on involvement and participation of market participants, including issuers, investors, intermediaries, service providers, and policymakers. As the development of this market intermediaries in Ethiopia is at early stage, both the authority and the exchange are required to play a leading role in the development of securities market, including market awareness raising, increase investors' appetite, build market attractiveness to issuers, build capacity of capital market participants, 
and educate the general public. The development of capital markets can contribute to changing the dynamics of how both public and private sector fill the gap for long-term finance and investment, as has been seen in countries across the world to drive economic growth in a sustainable manner. Within the public sector sphere, the development of a liquid and deep government secrets market has the potential to make a significant dent in the government existing financing needs and expand opportunities for government to finance in its future finance needs through market-based instruments in a sustainable manner by issuing longer dated bonds. This can be achieved among others by focusing on domestic and local currency bond issuances, targeting both existing fixed income investors, such as pension funds and commercial banks, but also expanding and diversifying the investor base by tapping into a larger retail and institutional investor base, both local but also foreign investors, which is only feasible in the presence of capital markets, helping capital flow more efficiently between issuers of financial instruments and investors. Efficient capital flows in turn fuel innovation, product development and create more jobs and prosperity. The development of capital markets will also provide and enhance the existing practice of raising long-term finance in the form of equity for the private sector, which is dominated currently by the financial sector, and expand this to other sectors of the economy, as well as by adding a portfolio of data instruments in the form of corporate, municipal, and newer innovative thematic instruments, such as suk, -suk bonds for both financial and non-financial issuers. Companies can also access short-term finance to fund working capital needs through money market commercial papers that can be quoted and traded on the exchange. Debt capital markets offer significant benefits for central banks and the wider economy. Developing a market-based T-bill market is a central building block for establishing a yield curve which can be used by policymakers to gauge inflation expectations and market expectations of the paths of interest rates, helping central banks conduct monetary policy more effectively and help sustain overall economic stability. In addition to being a key element in the development of a liquid bond market and for the transmission of monetary policy, a benchmark yield curve is also a key anchor in the pricing of other data instruments. Furthermore, a well-functioning interbank market contributes to the efficient allocation of capital in the economy, providing a well-tested tool in the implementation and transmission of a monetary policy as central banks globally use the short-term interbank market to monitor and influence prices, the liquidity of the banking system, and the structure of a short-term interest rate, thereby stabilizing economic cycles. Given these benefits, which are supported by observation in other financial markets across the world, it is very critical to develop and build the surrounding markets and trading infrastructure to facilitate an efficient interbank market in Ethiopia. To conclude, I would like to reiterate that the Ethiopian Capital Market Authority is fully committed to supporting the launch of the Ethiopian Securities Exchange and will work closely with the exchange team as it becomes a fully-fledged securities exchange over the next year. With no legacy systems or vested interest, the exchange will be a modern, multi-asset securities exchange featuring an efficient, automated trading system and trading platform, supported by a state-of-the-art central securities depository to ensure seamless trading and post-trade settlement process from its inception. The exchange and the authority will work closely with the relevant intermediaries to prepare them for the launch of the market through a series of tailored trainings, workshops and a public consultation to ensure the successful launch of the exchange, of which this technical workshop will be the first. Having the exchange in place will allow the listing and trading of government securities on the secondary market, significantly enhancing participation in the primary market as investors can trade these securities in the secondary market without having to hold until maturity, as is the case now. Increased participation in treasury bill market by a wider set of investors can help lower the cost of funding for the government. I encourage the financial sector in particular to evaluate the wide-ranging benefits the exchange will bring to the economy and the industry in particular. Capital markets will unlock 
new business lines for the sector as capital market service providers and present a means to expand and help innovate the capabilities of the domestic financial sector as you evaluate the proposition of becoming licensed members of the exchange as a service provider as well as users of the exchange trading platform for your treasury management function. I sincerely express may this be a fruitful and successful event. I thank you. So, so, so hard. <laughs> thank you, sir. So, I think this does bring us to the next session, but before that, I do want to say two things. One is that they say, if you want to get the best out of people, you always give them a very warm hand whenever they're coming to the podium. If you give them a warm hand, they open up their heart, not only their, you know, they're speaking just to say what they need to say. So, okay. 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 So, Shang is saying, Yodit, you're done with your uh, remarks. You need to introduce the second person. Um, but I do want to reflect on two things uh, that His Excellency Dr. Brooke has said, which is about elevating poverty, which is really key, and also opening up new businesses. I think those two should be the key takeaways, apart from what has been said on that. Now, without taking much time, I do want to introduce my next presenter. Uh, Mr. Mikhail Habte, who's the project manager for the Ethiopian Securities Exchange. And he brings with a wealth of knowledge and experience from the sector as, has, as he has worked in Bloomberg and Citigroup, understanding the sector very well. And he would be sharing with us today uh, a bit about money and interbank market uh, with a case study and also to bring that to life, uh, talk about the local context, but above all, I guess the role of the exchange in these markets would be the key thing that he would be sharing with us. So before I call him up on the stage, if you have any questions, and I'm sure you do have many, hopefully, uh, we do have a Q&A session. Uh, so you can take them at that later stage. But if they are so burning that they cannot wait until the q and I'm sure uh, Mikael would actually give you some few minutes just to take some few questions from the audience. So please help me in welcoming uh, Mr. Mikhail Hapte to the stage. Thank you, Yodit. I guess my heart is opened up now. <laughs> uh, good morning, everyone. And I'm not there, uh, so nice to see a lot of faces. A lot of you I've seen before, I think, in various uh, circumstances. I think uh, it looks like I have the most time from everybody. So I'll try to give you a little bit of a background about ESX for those of you who may not be familiar. Uh, we have a lot of colleagues here from Kenya. We have a wide group of uh, experts, investment bankers, traders, uh, treasurers, etc., policy, public actuaries. So we're very excited about this workshop. I think one thing we constantly hear is we have a lot of demand as a project team to do capacity building. So we've been looking forward to this session. Uh, it's, it's more geared towards technical concepts, but at the same time, I think a key element of it is we want to bring it home. We don't want to just copy and paste whatever's happening in the West or, or even in other African countries, which are a little more developed, but we want to find ways where we can connect and kind of tailor it in an Ethiopian way. Um, and I think I'll start with that. And also I'll, I'll give, I'll spend maybe two minutes, uh, two, three minutes giving a project update where we are before I get into the actual presentation. So I myself, I lead a project with my colleague Talahun here. We are project managers for the ESX, uh, which is currently a project office. But in about a year or so, we pl plan on launching the actual exchange. So. We've had about four or five major th areas that we focused on as a team. Uh, first and foremost, we've done a feasibility business plan for the, for the exchange. So what do exchanges do? What are the main products, services? Uh, how feasible it is given the local context? And part of that is understanding what are these products? So money markets, repos, uh, the equity markets, what is the supply and demand for each product and service line? So we've spent a lot of time 
doing both desktop research as well as engaging banks, uh, insurance, et cetera, trying to understand what, what will this business look like when this exchange launches. Uh, that's number one. Secondly, we've spent a lot of time communicating with the stakeholders, engaging, uh, as I said earlier, uh, also doing study tours. We visited Nigeria, Kenya, uh, Ghana, uh, as well as France recently, just trying to understand what, what are the things that are working and also what are the things that are not working. So we see a lot of segmentation in markets, especially in African markets, lack of, lack of liquidity and see ways we can improve uh, as a new market. And as Brooke stated in his speech, you know, we know we don't have legacy issues. We're starting from zero, but at the same time, we don't have a lot of vested interests. We don't have a brokerage industry already set up, you know, controlling the market as you see in some other, other countries. So we have certain advantages that we can work with to leverage. Uh, so that's one area. Uh, also, obviously, communication, understanding the technology systems, uh, procuring the technologies a very big effort from our project team. Uh, we have to spend a lot of time on that, uh, understanding the systems, what are the best systems out there, what's economical for the exchange, etc. So we have a very broad range of things, and obviously capacity building is a big part of our job as well, uh, both as a project office as well as going forward once the exchange is started. We'll have a formal academy. You know, we'll, we'll post all of these types of workshops online so people can look at them at, at their own schedule uh, and be very accessible and multilingual as well. So we have a lot of things, we have a lot of ambition, but at the same time, we have to start somewhere and be practical. So I think I'll start with that to frame the conversation. And then um, I'll explain a little bit about money and interbank markets. So as an exchange team, what we've looked at is, you know, there's three or four key areas to build a market, a capital market. And I think a money market is really your starting point. It's not really something that gets the most media attention. Usually you hear about stocks, uh, the stock indices or der derivatives, et cetera, but the building block of the financial markets, how you price a lot of assets, et cetera, start with the interbank markets. So if you've heard of LIBOR or Euro IBOR, some of these overnight lending rates, they're, they're usually used to price a lot of assets in the financial markets, a lot of derivatives, interest rate swaps, uh, anything that you see very more advanced markets more or less they always started with money markets. So I'll, my presentation will cover that. This is one area that we believe there's a lot of potential, both based on the regulatory aspect, you know, the central bank utilizes money markets to regulate monetary policy, and then banks themselves leverage money markets to optimize their balance sheets, et cetera. So I'll dive into the details as we go in the presentation, but I just wanna give this to you so you can frame it. So what I'll do is I'll talk a little bit about theoretical, what the background is on money markets, but also give some case studies on various countries and what's happening uh, and the evolution of the money markets. <clears throat> you can hear me okay, right? I just wanna make sure. So to start off with, you know, let's define things. What are exactly our money markets? You know, because this is not something we think we hear about every day. It's more, it's more like one way I try to think of it is it's like the plumbing of the financial system. You don't always see it. It's like in your house, you don't see the plumbing necessarily, but you need it. It's very fundamental. So just to give you a definition, when we say money markets, it's really anything that matures in less than a year. So it can be an instrument like an interbank market, an unsecured repos or secured repos, uh, commercial papers. I don't know if you can see it on the right side, but certificates of deposit, T-bills, anything that matures in less than one year and is tradable. But also even common things like a demand deposit technically is a money market instrument, the money you put in your bank, because you can access it at any time. So anything that matures in less than one year, and then we define capital, and it's usually regulated by central banks around the world, a lot of these instruments. Um, capital market debt, debt instruments, fixed income, treasury bills, which uh, Evan will talk about later, those are regulated more by the capital market authorities or security exchange commissions in various countries. And this is some, anything that matures in a year or longer. So lo higher risk, longer tenor. Uh, yeah, just to state some of the obvious things, you know, money markets are usually, you know, a way to connect investors and issuers. The investors in these markets would be, you know, banks, retail investors who have funds to park in low risk investments that they can access at any time very easily. And then borrowers tend to be banks, broker dealers, for example, market makers, they fund their market making activities using money market instruments. They borrow from the money markets. And this is the case across countries, uh, developed, developing. 
And they're very, like I stated earlier, very essential to the development of capital markets. So this is one reason we're, we're building a capital market from scratch here. So we've really paid a lot of attention to this side of the business. So if we can do this right, we really believe we can build the rest of the um, ecosystem better. So there's a lot on this slide. Um, I won't go through each one, one by one here, but we're trying to just really explain. Okay. Yeah, that's better. What we're trying to do here is really see, you know, explain some of the things I've said earlier, like why do they matter exactly? So it touches many areas. So capital markets, secondary market for government securities, government securities market itself. So your treasury bills market is very heavily dependent on money market activity, as well as a central bank policy trans, um, transmission, liquidity management for banks, as you, many of you in this room are aware. So what I'll do is I'll cover one of, each one of these in a little more detail in the next few slides. And I didn't mention, yeah, setting the yield curve, of course, is very important. If you think about it on this chart, it doesn't show it exactly, but if you look at the right side, the first part below the two years is basically your money market yield curve. So anytime you're building a yield curve or a formal yield curve, any country in the world, you have to have a functioning money market. So your overnight rates, et cetera, they set basically the anchor, the yield curve. That's your lowest cost of capital. So there's various things here. I think it serves as a market-based benchmark for other rates. It's a building block and asset pricing. So if you're familiar with the capital asset pricing models, how you value stocks, it usually has a risk-free rate. And that risk-free rate is built off of the interbank rate. Eventually, it's, it's a treasury rate normally or a treasury bond, but even that treasury bond rate is, is interlinked with your interbank rates. So it's a very key aspect of what you call a risk-free risk -free rate. And then a yield curve, it serves as a barometer of the wider economy. And what I've posted here is not really easily visible, but you'll get the slides after the presentation. So you can look at this on your own time, but it gives you some information as to what's going on in the economy. Generally, yield curves are upward sloping. So the longer farther out you go in the, in the yield curve, the higher the interest rate. But also it gives you information. So for example, and my Kelly and colleagues can correct me on this, but this chart shows the yield curve where it was six months ago, the dotted lines on the bottom. And you notice the blue line is a bit higher now. It could be higher inflation expectations, uh, FX pressures, et cetera. But you get information out of it, number one, on the wider economy, and also the banking sector itself. Uh, banks make money by lending long-term and borrowing short-term from depositors. So a lot of times you see correlation in terms of bank profitability, et cetera. If the yield curve steeps upward or the yield curve increases more, banks tend to be more profitable. They do more lending and vice versa if the opposite happens. So very informative. Uh, and, and you see this across the world. So on central bank uh, policy transmission, I think I stated some of these points, but it touches many areas. You know, Central banks conduct a lot of the monetary policy operations using repos. So they go into the markets, they inject money using repos uh, when liquidity is needed and when liquidity needs to be withdrawn. They do money market operations by taking uh, money out of the system. So that's one aspect that the interbank market serves. Um, Short-term lending and deposit rates in well-functioning markets are determined by the interbank market because this is the shortest you know, end. Uh, prices, real economy, especially on the short end of the yield curve, and then um, reserve requirements, discount facility. So the main point here is the interbank market touches many areas. It's, it's very critical. We don't see it, like I said earlier, but it's, it's very important to, to regulators, to the banking sector, and the wider economy in general. So one thing we'll try to do as much as possible, I think the way we've structured this workshop in general, just to step back, is uh, we talk a little bit about the theory, but actually in the real world, how is it done? Uh, so what are open market operations, I think, uh, be useful to, I think, illustrate? In a simple case, what you're doing, the central bank is basically acting like a money manager of the country. So it's trying to match supply and demand of money supply on a daily basis is monitoring. So this is what's happening in most countries around the world. And they use money market operations to inject money and take out money. So if you see on the left side, it might not be as easily visible, but when you're expanding money, to money into the system, so let's say liquidity is short, so the central bank would step in and pump money into the economy. 
the use of this, this transaction called a repurchase agreement. So it's a very short term uh, transaction where the central bank basically buys security. So it buys T-bills, for example, from, from banks and give them money. Very short term, overnight, usually to seven days. And then this is a temporary uh, act. So this is sending a signal to the market. Okay, I'm releasing money. I'm trying to increase the supply of money in, in the system. And then on the flip side, if there's a lot of inflation, for example, or the central bank wants to lessen inflation expectations, they would do contractionary monetary policy. So they would have an actual trading desk performing these operations every day, buying and selling repos. And we can, and we can discuss this at further length, but I think the key takeaway here is more or less you are doing this to manage the money supply efficiently in a market-based manner and transparently. Uh, so that's the key thing. As we try to, I think, evolve, we have Wayne Shatir from the Central Bank. So I think she'll, she can comment later during the panel discussions, but the goal is to eventually have the exchange, have the, uh, the, uh, the uh, Central Bank work more efficiently to perform monetary policy operations like many other countries do. And, and she'll be able to comment on that better. Um, and then also, yeah, the last thing I want to state is a vertical repo, just to, just to give definitions, a vertical repo is just saying it's a repo between a central bank and a bank. And there's a horizontal repurchase agreement, which is between banks. So we'll cover that a little bit more in detail, but this is really your kind of starting point of money market operations. So even further to this, you know, additional points. So we spoke a little bit about central bank policy transmission, uh, yield curve. So for banks, you know, for a lot of you in this room, why do these markets matter? Uh, I think this is probably more or less obvious, so I won't take too much time, but there are several angles of it that you can look at. Um, one of them is that obviously liquidity positions. So your daily liquidity can be managed more efficiently when you're using the money markets. So if you have excess, you know, excess, Excess bur sitting in the vault today, it doesn't have to sit and not earn interest. You can use the money markets to lend it very short term, lower risk and get it back. And not only that, but it doesn't have to be unsecured. It can be secured using some, some T-bills. So a borrowing bank can basically lend out their securities for cash. So that's one aspect. So balance sheet management. Uh, secondly, banks don't have to rely on standing facilities from the central bank. They can rely on each other. Uh, as well as other players. So pension fund, uh, microfinance, et cetera, can be brought into the system, the money market system, so that you, you alleviate some of the seasonal issues that happen that we see in the market. Um, also, obviously not to state the obvious, but you have a proper platform to perform these trades. Uh, you know, having an exchange or any other kind of pro service provider that provides a platform, a money market platform, uh, allows you to see a little bit more visibility into the market and can see where prices are, where interest rates are, et cetera. So you see a little more transparency, less transaction costs. Uh, yeah, the fourth part, and then, yeah, I think it's just more about the key, the three key takeaways here is balance sheet management. Uh, you know, you don't, you can, it's more market-based and more transparent and more using state-of-the-art technology to do this in a well-regulated fa um, fashion. Yeah, so for government debt markets, I don't think I'll spend too much time on this, but having better liquidity as a bank. So for example, what we see now is there's not a lot of participation in the treasury bill market, even though it's you know, not long-term. But one thing we hear from banks is that I have to hold it to maturity. Uh, I, I don't have a secondary market. But if you have an interbank market, if you think about it, it gives you flexibility to cover your short-term funding needs and you can participate more actively in the government debt market itself. That way for short-term lending, borrowing, you can go to the interbank. But for, if you know that for six months, you know, you'll have better, better seasonal factors that you can find, you know, you can hold on to the security longer. So you'll be more incentivized to purchase a treasury bill in six months. If you know for your intermediate funding needs, you can go to the interbank, interbank market. So that's one area. Uh, liquidity and depth improve in, uh, in your short-term markets. And then I think, yeah, opportunity cost of storing government securities to maturity significantly reduces when you have a functioning inter interbank market. I think I spoke a little bit about this. So 
one, one product that I think as an exchange, we believe there's a lot of potential based on discussions with the MBE, uh, as well as banks, is having secured interbank. So a lot of countries we see in Africa, they still rely on an unsecured uh, interbank market. But what you see in general in the evolution of interbank markets around the world is when it's become secured, the velocity, the trading increases significantly and the risk reduces significantly as well. So as fresh starters, we want to really emphasize the use of uh, the repo instrument. Uh, technically, it's not a very complicated uh, instrument. This has been around for over 100 years. And it's very short term, low credit risk. All you're saying is, I'm, if I am a holder of securities, I'll, I'll, I'll give you my securities as collateral. It's a, it's a collateralized loan. So you, 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 you lend your securities as a bank and you get cash. And then you, 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 you will sell it at a very, uh, sorry, you'd return the cash maybe a day or two later, very short term. And what we see in many markets is that the trade velocity of these instruments is very high because banks are constantly managing their balance sheets. Yeah, and legally, it's basically a sequential pair of sales. It's, it's just a short-term interest-bearing loan against collateral, um, to summarize. And when I'm saying this, I'm really focusing on horizontal, so bank-to-bank -bank transactions. I think, yeah, let's come back, you know, a little bit, uh, step back. Who regulates this market? I mean, I think I stated it earlier. It's primarily central banks. Uh, central banks are overseers of the short-term money markets. Uh, they set the policies. And in terms of specifics, you know, what are the approaches that are taken around the world? Uh, one thing we've seen is, you know, as these markets have evolved and become much more sophisticated and deep, uh, you have these things called global master repurchase agreements. So these are more or less standardized contracts saying, you know, who's legally, um, how, how the markets legally operates, how defaults are, uh, are settled, et cetera. So these are agreements that really cover a lot of cross-border transactions. So anything involving FX, you know, there's an FX interbank market as well as a local currency. Um, if you want to participate cross-border, et cetera, generally the best practice is to use this GMRA. But necessarily one thing I want to emphasize is as a new, as a new starter in this area, you don't have to abide by GMRA principles on day one, uh, especially if you're focusing on local currency issuances or local currency markets. There are national agreements. So Nigeria, for example, has a national, a Nigerian master repurchase agreement that they use for local currency uh, trades that is uh, enforced by the central bank. And then you have national guidelines also issued by central banks and codes of conduct. And then secondly, I think bringing it a little more closer to us, exchanges also publish trading rules. So the SX will actually have a trading rule specifically to the repo markets that all dealing members have to abide by and, 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 and go through. And then CCPs, et cetera. I'll talk that a little bit about that later, but key, key takeaway here is that there's different prongs of regulation, but very well established, very, very highly standardized. Like I said earlier, a key thing to keep in mind is these are not very sophisticated products. So the regulatory framework is more or less something we can easily adopt that we see in other countries. So I think this is one interesting area is, you know, how have interbank markets evolved over time? Uh, like I said earlier, the US Federal Reserve, the central bank in America, started repos over 100 years ago um, with, with basically none of the technology we have today, et cetera, pricing transparency. And currently, I think I was checking, it's about $5 trillion was being traded on the repo market in one month. So that just shows you, I mean, I think the economy of the US is $13 trillion roughly. So it's not insignificant. These are huge, huge, huge markets uh, with a lot of players. It's not just banks, you know, there's money market funds, pension funds are involved because all, all you're doing is bringing short-term issuers and investors together in an organized market. So they've evolved a lot, uh, being used pretty much by all central banks around the world, including a lot of the African central banks that we see, both East Africa, West Africa, et cetera. Uh, so that's kind of a macro view. In terms of trading systems, so one thing that's really helped the evolution is um, a lot of times your classical repo trade is usually bilateral. So it's me against facing one other bank. What's happened now is that you have a second, a third party in the middle. So basically a clearinghouse. 
kind of if you're familiar with clearing houses on the commodity side, it's a very similar concept here. Your clearing house, basically a buyer and a seller face the clearing house. They don't face each other directly. So it significantly reduces your counterparty risk. And then also combined with that, there's trading systems used by exchanges, et cetera, that have really helped evolve this market. So a lot of the world is moving in that direction. And then thirdly, like I said earlier, I think I stated this, a lot of loans, uh, derivatives. So in the American markets where I used to work, you know, I think about 80% of the loans at the bank I worked on, I worked at, were pr priced off of LIBOR. So they were variable loans. So if you go and buy a mortgage, so I had a mortgage, for example, if I decided on having a variable rate, it would basically fluctuate based on the LIBOR rates. So every month it would reset based on the LIBOR rates. So trillions of dollars were priced off of these assets. And this is the case in Europe, uh, Japan, et cetera. So very important, uh, important rate. Coming back a little closer to Africa, um, what we've seen lately is still maturing, I think in terms of interbank, but a lot of progress in a short amount of time. I think a lot of payment systems, settlement systems, et cetera, have been modernized in many markets. So what you see here, I mean, the key highlight is you have some countries, almost 30% of GDP is the trading size. So, you know, like we said in America, it's really large, of course, but even in Africa, 30, 28, 30% in Uganda, uh, Malawi is the, is the volume, trade volume being conducted every year. And this is data, I think, as of 2021. So it's probably higher today. It's been two years. So what has, hap what has helped is kind of, you know, the financial, ma financial markets, infrastructure upgrades, uh, trading platforms. Some countries are slowly going to clearing, such as Nigeria. Although they are very low here, I think that number will increase quite a lot. Same thing with Ghana, they have, you know, more, they've, I think, adopted GMRA now. Um, the exchange is getting more involved in repo trades. So we expect these numbers to gradually increase as the market gets organized a little better. So a lot of progress, a lot of improvement in different parts of the world. So yeah, like, I think one thing we've studied as a team is what are the challenges? Why, why are African countries, you know, not advanced as much in this, in this space is, what you see a lot is there's a lot of market segmentation. So large banks, for example, trade with other large banks. Even if the smaller bank is credit is fine, et cetera, there's you know, self-selection bias that happens. Uh, also ownership bias. So foreign owned banks tend to do more interbank trades as opposed to the domestic banks, et cetera. Information asymmetry, um, the lack of like, you know, the clearing structure without the third party in the middle. Um, not as much secure trading, and then, yeah, absence of guidelines, code of conduct. But also this presents a lot of opportunities because you can understand what the issues are. You can see how to, how to provide solutions. So, you know, developing collateralized, collateralized markets, promoting repos a little more, um, increased adoption of these uh, GMRA standards, and then obviously financial market infrastructure enhancements and credit uh, guarantees. Credit guarantees, I mean, just to give a quick, brief understanding and definition is basically you have firms, companies like FrontClear, for example, who guarantee repo trades cross borders. So a Ghanaian bank can trade with a Nigerian bank and the credit will be, and that would be guaranteed uh, by, a, by a firm like FrontClear or DFIs, et cetera. This will significantly boost uh, uh, trading. And also, yeah, having more participants outside of banks, uh, fund managers, pensions, et cetera, would significantly boost uh, activity. So these are a lot of opportunities we see and we want to actually apply to our market, at least you know, from a starting point. I know you already said that if there's questions, we can stop. Usually we take questions at the end, but it's a lot of information, I think. So feel free to stop me at any moment. Any questions? No? Okay. So, yeah, so, you know, as we discuss a little bit about the theory, the history, et cetera, you know, what are, what are we seeing in different countries? You know, wh what are the most efficient markets that we see around the world? So we picked a couple of countries as a case study. Uh, the first one is Switzerland, it's, which is pretty interesting because in Switzerland, basically the central bank actually conducts its monetary policy through the exchange repo system. So they were one of the first banks to automate repo trading about 25 years ago. And then um, 
so two things happened. Number one, the central bank decided to do it directly through the exchange, number one. Number two, the exchange and the, uh, the CSD, which is your central securities depository, uh, where all securities are held, merged together. So you have an integrated exchange, CSD, CSD uh, company, and then the central bank conducts its policy operations every day through there. And about 100 billion euros takes place on a daily basis. It's one of the most efficient systems probably in the world. Uh, so that's in Switzerland. It's significantly boosted activity, efficiency. It's become a role model actually for other countries around the world. More and more countries have adopted this approach in terms of automated trading systems for repos. And yeah, maybe let me stop real quick just to give definition. When I say automated trading system is you're matching um, it's not by it's not like you're picking up the phone, making sure you know you agree with 10 other people or you're contacting 10 other banks, what the price is, et cetera. The system will show you basically the best prices and the best offers. And you could, it's more efficient in terms of uh, as a treasurer, if you're sitting as a treasurer at a bank, quickly you can see transparently what the prices are, and it's more it's more less lesser cost. I guess transaction costs are lower too. I think coming a little closer, uh, you know, okay, another case study we want to use, um, not really just for the repo market necessarily, but for fixed income in general, is called FMDQ. It's a relatively new exchange in Nigeria uh, that some of you may be familiar with. But the way FMDQ is set up, basically, it has an exchange, it has a clearing part, a clearing uh, group, or a clearing um, uh, subsidiary that acts as a central clearing counterparty. So it acts as your middleman your tri in, in the tripartite repo. And then you have a CSD also. So it's an integrated exchange from top to bottom. So the exchange basically is where you execute the trade. You see the prices, uh, you see the system, uh, the yields on the interbank market, and then the operational standards, uh, framework, et cetera, are defined by the exchange. And then your collateral types, you know, is it government bonds, treasury bills, uh, et cetera? It defines it clearly there. And then most importantly, I think, is pricing information. Every day, prices are published uh, on the exchange system. All members can see it. So where the interbank rates at, it's very transparent and reported on a regular basis. So that's the trading platform. And then the clearing, I think I don't have to say much, but it acts basically as your central counterparty. And then the collateral is valued every day by the clearing, uh, clearing house to make sure that in case the collateral drops below a certain point, a margin is posted. And I'll explain that a little better later. And then your depository is your CSD. So what's interesting about this is that they basically have the whole chain. Uh, FMDQ was started by banks actually, by the Central Bank of Nigeria and banks are the main shareholders. So it's grown quite a lot in 10 years. Uh, you can look at it in your own time, but it's a very interesting model and something that we really li uh, like to emulate, I think, uh, going forward. And the CSD from FMDQ is connected to the central bank CSD. So Nigeria has multiple CSDs. So the central bank CSD is fed all of this information on a daily basis whenever transactions happen. I think just this graphic, what I want to show here is that, you know, as time has gone, repo, repos, interbank, et cetera, used to be more OTC markets. And they still are to a certain extent, but exchanges have become much bigger players in this area as systems have advanced and efficiencies have come. So you can see all around the world, more or less, exchanges are playing a big role, uh, especially in Latin America, in Europe, uh, Ukraine, et cetera, Istanbul, um, like I said earlier, FMDQ, South Africa, all of these countries have exchanges that run repo markets, highly efficient and we actually believe going forward, this will transition more and more to exchanges and automated trading systems. The lines have become much more blurrier between exchanges and OTC over time. Because a lot of your OTC functionalities now can be performed on, a, on an exchange, uh, you know, anonymous trading, bilateral trading, et cetera. So I won't spend too much time on this, but really I think it's good, you know, exactly how does a repo work? Um, in general, what you're saying when you do a repo trade is that you are collateralizing a certain asset. So if you have a T-bill worth, let's say, 105 uh, today, 105 bur, you are going out in the market and borrowing 100 bur. So that 5% uh, 
that haircut basically is to insure the lender. So the lender of the funds, it's kind of a, basically what they're getting is interest. So that's the payment that they're receiving. And this depends on markets and very developed markets is very low actually, sometimes close to zero uh, for overnights, et cetera. So, but in frontier markets, Nigeria, I think the data point I saw was about 5% to 10%. Um, obviously, depending on the volatility of the market, but in general, pretty low. And then this is agreed upon by the counterparties within the trading system or on the phone, negotiated ahead of time. And then every day, let's say you have a seven day. So if you think about it this way, this is the left side is really at trade when you're initiating the trade. So your haircut is determined then, um, your, your market value, et cetera, is priced at T. And then after the trade is done every day, your, your collateral is revalued in the system. How much is my market value of my T-bill? Is it going up or down? And then it's marked, to, we, it's marked to market. It's the concept of saying how much is the value of the collateral on a daily basis. So very transparent, both counterparties can see it. Um, and in the case of a CCP, if, if the CCP is managing or a central counterparty is managing, they would manage the margin on this. And I can, I, I can explain this in detail if necessary. I just don't want to spend too much time on it. But yeah, basically what, what happens is if your collateral, let's say this 105, in five days is down to 95. You'd have a pre-agreed amount that you'd say, okay, I need to fund that, 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 uh, that collateral uh, to get back up to 105 or so. So your lender or your borrower would have to fund that position back after a certain point. And that's usually agreed upon between the buyer and the seller at the time of transaction. It's what you call a margin call. And this is true with interest rates, derivatives, uh, same thing with commodities. So conceptually, it's it's not that different. So if you're trading gas, commodities, soft commodities, et cetera, mark to market works more or less in this manner. So I think, you know, as, I, as I'm trying to wrap up a little bit, coming back home, you know, where are we at? You know, we've discussed a lot about the global experience, the African experience. Where are we at in Ethiopia? You know, uh, one thing we've understood uh, from our research and a lot of our engagement so far, there's a lot of appetite for an interbank market, but it's not organized. It's not formally organized. Banks do lend to each other uh, more in time deposit manner, very long term, uh, if you think about it relatively. Uh, so there's no financial market infrastructure. It's a lot of it's done on a phone, high transaction costs. Um, Shortest tenor that you can do interbank, as, as we're familiar with at least, is three months, which is quite long when you compare it to global experience and best practices. So a lot of, a lot of liquidity is being locked up and not being optimized on a lot of bank balance sheets in our view, um, which can be very significantly improved with this market. Yeah, lack of short-term markets uh, prevents uh, you know, these efficiencies. So looking at number three, I think looking more optimistically, we do have the open market opera, um, directive issued by M MBE. It's just not been implemented technically, but it is there. The legal foundation is there for the monetary policy to be conducted using repos with banks. Uh, electronic trading platform, CSD needed. So you need, you need these key financial ma market infrastructures to operationalize this market. The good news is we are in the process of building that. I mean, that's part of this workshop is to help you understand where we are. We will have that when the exchange launches. And then having code of conduct guidelines for this horizontal markets so that we have proper regulatory foundation for banks to trade with each other. So this is usually issued by central banks, but also by exchanges, as I said earlier. And we're working closely with the MBE and the team there to help actualize this over the next year. So this is just to give you kind of dynamics. I, I think it's, it's okay to discuss a little bit verbally, but what is the data showing us actually in Ethiopia, we're very well aware, you know, we know that right now there's a lot of liquidity challenges, uh, structural changes that I think have happened in the last six, seven months. But I think as analysts, we try to look at long-term trends instead of just the short-term what's been happening. So the chart on the right, what it shows you is basically where, what have reserves been, excess reserves. So this is reserves in addition to what MBE requires. So on average from 2011 to 2021, reserves were almost 60% higher than the excess reserves. 
in Ethiopia on average. Obviously, they fluctuate a lot, but the long term trend is telling you there's more reserves. Banks are holding on to more cash than they need to. And that's money basically that's sitting idle, not earning interest, et cetera. So if you think about the velocity, it multiplies quite a bit over time. Uh, so that's one thing. That's one inefficiency. It's an indicator of inefficiency. Uh, and this is actually seen in other markets in Africa too. This is not just here. Even in other African markets, we see a lot of excess reserve uh, hoarding. So this can be rapidly, significantly improved, I think, uh, going forward. Um, I think that's the main thing I want to say here. Uh, what main takeaway? So I'll keep going. So yeah, you know, I might have summarized some of this, but I think just to kind of uh, see where we are, you know, what what do we see in the next couple of years uh, once ESX launches, as it pertains just to this market on interbanks? So we'll bring the technology. The exchange will have the technology in place. That infrastructure we spoke about, the CSD, um, etc. Number one, and then. Secondly, I think one key thing to bring about is being a late comer, being a late starter, we don't have legacy problems, legacy system issues. We start fresh. So the best trading technology at a lower cost can be basically distributed to the, to the, to the environment. So the exchange system will, will take the burden of the cost and it will be basically providing this interbank market as a service. So banks, as they transact with each other, they basically pay as a service instead of having a subscription fee, et cetera. You can pay as a service and based on your you know, daily needs. And obviously this will be discussed with banks, the fees, et cetera, will be very extensively discussed, clearly stated in the rules and um, market friendly. And obviously you'd have your trade reporting, transparency, uh, a lot of things we spoke about earlier, your mark to market, et cetera, from day one. So you wouldn't have as much information asymmetry and hopefully higher liquidity, etc. We don't expect it to be a perfect market, obviously, but with a lot of with time, with training, uh, bringing in the stakeholders, organizing the market, I think we have we see a lot of potential in this space. I think in the long term, you know, as we develop uh, as an exchange, as a banking sector grows, we we you know we want to emulate the model that we see in other countries that brings the most efficiencies as an exchange. You know, having central clearing uh, through the exchange itself, we believe you know the size of the economy can support this. Uh, number one, and the banking sector itself is very large. I mean, uh, I, I think it's no. As Ethiopians, we're not all. We're always very cautious, etc. But if you look at the data, it's kind of interesting. You know, we're almost equal to Kenya. I mean, we're we're reaching Kenya's in terms of assets, so lo loans, etc. In dollar terms, we're almost approaching Kenya, but growing faster. So I think about $45 billion worth in assets as of last year. Kenya is around 50, 50 or so. So we're rapidly growing. We have the space, we have the population. So, and then you're going to have foreign banks coming in as well who are going to be very active in this area. So I think that's one other thing to think about, I think, as bankers, as treasurers, is that they will be doing, they will be participating in this market. It will be an active market going forward. So the next steps, I think this is my last one. Um, I think we've broken it out into kind of for banks, for the MBE, and then for the SX. So these are the key stakeholders I think we've identified. So preparation, you know, what do you need? And my colleague Victor here will talk a little bit more about the fundamental day-to-day -day treasurers aspect of what they do. But you have to have your front office, your back office um, team, treasury team training system, training training, and then systems, uh, onboarding, et cetera. One thing I wanna, I wanna really state here, and I've put it in the slide, but when we speak with bankers a lot, uh, there's this, I think, feeling that you need a lot of staff to run these groups. To illustrate, I mean, my previous job in the US, I worked in a treasury group. There were three people managing a $12 billion portfolio. On the repo, on the treasury side, so you, you don't really need a lot of people. It's it's more of a capacity issue, more human capital. So it's very doable with proper capacity building and work, etc. And then, but I'll I'll let Victor speak a little bit more about that. He has a much more practical experience in this area. And then uh, from the MBE, you know, like I said, we discussed quite a bit with Wayne Shatter and her team on how we can actualize this market, make it a proper market for the country. You know, 
having a trading desk in place is necessary. Like I said in one of the slides earlier, there's a proper financial markets desk in many countries, uh, central markets that basically look at this market every day. That's their job. And then operating procedures help, you know, guidelines for the central bank uh, will need to be drafted, uh, capacity building, peer central trading desks. So let's say Ghana, Nigeria, all these central banks have these functional trading desks that you can do a lot of peer-to-peer -peer learning with. And then donors, et cetera, of course, can step in with technical assistance. And I think for us, I mean, we've said it a lot of times, we say this a lot when we engage with bankers uh, directly, capacity building, you know, sessions like this, but also coming, you know, training uh, banks at their location sometimes if necessary, treasury teams on the trading system, how to onboard, how to do it, how to use it, how does the actual market work, et cetera, something we will spend a lot of time with and work on with you uh, going forward. And then we'll also kind of serve as a project manager for this market because we believe there's a lot of potential and we really want to um, help build a successful market. And then, yeah, formalizing treasurers associations, forming groups. We've seen a lot of successes in other countries uh, in the region. Uh, the bond markets, et cetera, have taken off with the formation of associations, really. Uh, I think in Kenya, Uganda, and various countries, we've seen this. And we think it's a model we can emulate. I think that's it uh, for my part. Thank you very much. And if you have questions. So Mike is running away. It means you don't have any question for him, I guess. Okay. Oh, Mike, before you leave, I see two hands there because we have a few minutes. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Mike. That was, uh, well, a very loaded, uh, a little bit loaded uh, presentation. Very nice. Uh, uh, I've, I've tried to follow, but uh, pardon my ignorance if some of the, the questions I have can be very basic. Uh, hope you can hear me. Can you hear me well? Just a little bit, if you can speak up a little bit. Okay. Uh, so <clears throat> my question pertains to the repo of interbank instruments. I mean, if, if we are going to securitize them, they become repos. Uh, I presume that the holder, the initial holder of the instruments are banks themselves. Yeah. Um, so my question is, uh, do the public uh, get to invest in those um, in general? Or are, the, are, are other banks going to be the ones that are uh, entering into that repurchase agreement? Who are the parties entering into that repurchase agreement is my question. Basically, are, is the general public going to invest in, that, in, the, in those instruments? Uh, or or are, are we uh, just focusing on, on banks? The other, uh, the other question is that interbank market uh, it's not. I mean, it's not new to Ethiopia. There, there used to be a, an interbank market. Uh, maybe you. Um, so, how did that function? And what were, uh, you know, after a certain period? Of course, it was not functional. But I want to uh, just highlight that there used to be an interbank money market, or was it not totally, you know, what up to par? Um, or if you could say a little bit about what used to happen in the past. Thank you. Sure. I'm probably not the best place to answer the second question, but let me start with the first can one. I, can I add one more? Oh, sure, sure, sorry. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think uh, I'm coming from ECA, but I was been uh, previous bankers. So during my time back 13 years, we have been discussing about these issues mm -hmm. and we have done a lot and still I have some fear about the way how we moved on because still the banks have a feeling of infant after 13 years. Even I was being in bank after 13 mm -hmm. years, when I had a conversation with people, they were still feeling they are infant. And we are planning to bring new foreign bank to the system. And we need to have a good mindset how to operate this uh, operation. To come to my questions, as you know, uh, most of the countries they are using professional associations. Unfortunately, in these countries, we have around 300 professional associations. Out of these 300 professional associations in Ethiopia, 
almost 40 professional associations are engaged in business and economics. And uh, most of us know economic association, the Ethiopian Economic Association is one of the leading professional associations contributing to the economy. And we have been this uh, capacity building. Is there a room for professional association? We even have a heart for professional association because we are already establishing professional association alliance in Ethiopia. There are around uh, 300. Out of 300, those who are around 15 are engaged directly to this sector. Is the project are considering professional association into account because we have done one uh, seminar in collaboration with a professional association, which were being highly related to this market. And we have seen a lot of synergies. Rather than the bank, the professional association, as you said, there is a code of conduct which needs to be enforced. So we need to equip and to capacitate professional associations so we can run because as you uh, explained, the experience we have uh, globally, we have seen a lot of uh, the pros and the cons and we are in a good position to move on with the best track of uh, success. To do that, we need to use capacity professional association. Do you have any plan on that? And uh, the other is optimization of uh, liquidity. Still, we are not good enough in technology. When you go to all the financial institutions uh, balance sheet, we have a lot of liquidity issue. So how do you break this a breakthrough a strategy to make an idle money to be operational to the economy? Thank you. Thank you. May, may I answer those and then if there's more questions? So Teddy, I'll start with your questions. So. Uh, good question on repo for retail. What generally happens with retail customers? You don't, okay, let me start this way. From day one, I think the way we see the repo market is mainly between banks, but not just banks, but even you can have pension funds. The, the people holding these, uh, who have the cash more or less, and who need to invest it. Uh, they're, what's happening with the pension funds is they don't really use, optimize even the treasury bill sitting on their on their balance sheet for example so this is this bring, this instrument brings another avenue for pension funds to basically earn more money on the treasury bills number one uh, but insurance microfinance you know having it in a centralized ecosystem an organizer can bring you know 60 70 institutions together versus just the banks so your seasonal patterns, et cetera, don't match exactly. So if 30 banks have similar seasonal patterns, the, M the microfinance might not, just as an example, hypothetically. So these are the areas you can bring in uh, before I go to the retail. But retail generally doesn't involve directly in a repo market, but money market funds, what we call money market funds, which are basically collective investment schemes for retail investors. So if I'm a retail investor, I don't want to invest in the stock market but I want to earn something more than 7% at a bank. I, I want to buy a T-bill, for example. I can invest in a, in a market, money market fund. When I invest in that money market fund, that fund usually can fund a bank. They can operate in the repo market. So a money market fund is, is generally a lender uh, to a bank, to other financial institutions. So indirectly, yes, a retail investor is participating in it, but not, I wouldn't say directly. This is a wholesale market where dealers are dealing with each other directly. So indirectly, yes, they do. Historically, we don't have much data on the interbank. So we, we try to rely a lot on the data and I mean, people in this room can educate me and us. We just don't have a lot of information. It's been a long time since we had a proper function, any kind of interbank market. Even if you look at the MBA reports, there's the last many years, there's really not a lot of information on interbank. So. We're working with very little uh, on that front. Uh, and to the gentleman here, I think in terms of, yeah, the association, it's interesting. Yeah, there's a lot of professional associations, but I think the way we try to look at it from our approach using other country experiences, number one, is this will be very specialized and it will be more or less managed by the exchange because it's in our interest. It's in the interest of the exchange commercially to establish this market, it's, it's, an, it's a revenue source. So it'd be very specialized, geared toward treasurers. I mean, we've already had a couple of discussions with some of the treasurers here. We're trying to form this group. 
so the thinking is it will be very professional, professionalized code of conduct, you know, regular meetings, etc. Uh, we'll formulate it better, of course, and more be more specific over time. But it'll be a, it, it, we see a lot of value in that area because we it's it's been successful across the world, uh, both at bond markets, treasury, etc., U.S., Latin America, Asia. So there's a lot of potential in that. And obviously, if there's room for collaboration with the Economic Association, et cetera, of course, synergies are very important. We can discuss that, obviously, offline. Um, you had another question, I think, about bank liquidity and technology. Is it technology? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly one of the charts it tells you. I mean, 60%. It's, it shows you, and I understand CBE is part of it too, but it's not always CBE, uh, just to keep in mind. There are times when CBE is actually less liquid than the private banks, historically. So it's a process. We're not trying to build it in one day. <laughs> we have to start somewhere. We can, we can make a dent. I think over time, the value will be realized. One advantage is you know, having it on an exchange, something, something centralized. Banks don't have to have their own IT systems to process these, et cetera. I think having treasury management systems in place at banks will help. But I think once you have one or two banks pick up on this and understand the value, the others will slowly adopt it, uh, is my view. Uh, any other questions? I wish we could take more questions, but I yeah, do time. have to cut you off. And, and we'll have a Q&A session Absolutely. later, so we can continue. Absolutely. So please do give him a warm hand once again. <laughs> So to keep you energized and keep, keep the conversation going, as Mike has said, we do have a session on Q&A. So uh, anything that has not been answered or you need it burningly, you can do that during coffee as well. But also we have a Q&A. Uh, we do have 30 minutes for uh, tea and coffee and health break. Uh, the tea is being served right here and you can actually take it inside as well. But to maintain the momentum, of being on time, it's 30 minutes, actual 30 minutes. And I hope to see you back in uh, 11.45. Thank you. <laughs> 10, 10.45. <laughs>
Okay. I'm glad to see we're just two minutes late. <laughs> so um, I do see some people coming in, but I think in the interest of time, we should just kick start. Okay. Because we've had a very energizing coffee and break, I see the conversation is still continuing in the room. Uh, so yeah, let's, let's just give them 30 seconds. So before taking uh, on the q and session and having that engaging discussion we started with, we do have one more presentation uh, from Mr. Victor Nikiro uh, on interbank markets from a commercial bank's perspective. So Mr. Victor is the capital market specialist for FSD Africa, uh, supporting with the exchange, with an 80 years of experience in capital markets across Africa. I, I think his focus is particularly on ESG and impact investment, uh, investing. Without taking much time, please help me in welcoming Victor to the stage. And don't forget to open his heart. He needs Thank you so much. Uh, good morning. Yes, technical issues. I think uh, that is welcome. Let me just pick my notepad in case there are questions. Yes, so I think that gives me an opportunity to do something I, I actually wanted to do. Um, first of all is introduce myself. Uh, and then, I mean, I've been introduced to say my name, but my intention is also, uh, since this is a capacity building workshop, um, is for the team that all the stakeholders that have come here in the room and those who are online to just also understand uh, what the project team he is and who you probably can strategically sit with and interact with for the next two days during your coffee and your lunch sessions. Uh, so my name is Victor Nkiri. I work with the financial sector Deepening Africa, which has its offices located in Nairobi. Um, we actually were invited into Ethiopia by the Central Bank. Uh, that is the National Bank of Ethiopia, who uh, I can see here, uh, Wayne Shet is there. Uh, just let me ask the NB team, please, to, to stand up. And because this is how this particular project began uh, uh, with the NB and the Ministry of Finance. Is there anyone from the Ministry of Finance? Yeah, oh, perfect. And also from the Ministry of Finance. And then we as FSD Africa joined up as project partners with EAH. Uh, anyone from EAH here? EH, please. Oh, good. Thank you. So the Ethiopian Investment Holding is a partner uh, for this particular project. We uh, are just delighted to have such a knowledgeable partner and capable for uh, executing this project in, in Ethiopia. So we didn't stop there. We've actually added more partners and we are here today because UNECA actually is supporting this uh, fast capacity building session. And we are so grateful to have UNECA now also as a partner for this project. Let me just ask the UNECA team, please, to stand, uh, Sonia and your team, so that guys can strategically sit with you during lunchtime. Thank you so much, UNECA, for this support. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, as I said, we've continued to grow our partnership. And now we also have a partner that we are very excited about, and that is FSD Ethiopia, who's now also supporting this particular project. 
I can see the team here. This, this is the FSB on the ground. If you need to talk to any financial sector, depending on the ground, Hermias and team, please stand up because some of these guys in the room might actually need your support. So thank you so much, FSB Ethiopia, uh, for, for that. They are, of course, uh, being funded by FCDO uh, locally here, together with uh, Bill and Melinda Gates, who have also actually, who are the sponsors for this particular capacity session. Anyone from Bill and Melinda Gates in the room or FCDO, just to recognize our sponsors, you've done an amazing job and we couldn't do this without you. So I just want to really appreciate uh, Bill and Melinda Gates and also FCDO for their support for this. So that said, and knowing the partners and all those who are supporting this, I want to introduce to you the ESX team. And I want to ask Tilahun and Mike to come up. Uh, Enku, uh, Eskeda, you, you did, who else? Do you have the IT, has the IT guy joined? Not yet? He's virtually, oh, he's there? Excellent. I guess IT guys, I mean, they, he had to join virtually. So please guys, just, just come to the front because we are doing this capacity building session because of you. So I'm, I'm giving some of my time for my presentation because I think it's very key for everyone to know who is ESX, who can they meet, who can they talk to? And uh, yeah, Tilawan probably, this team has grown over the last uh, eight months or so uh, quite significantly. So uh, Tilawan, let me just give you the mic. Thank you, Victor. We did not expect him doing this. Uh, he's the elder in the room, as you can see. Thank you, and we definitely appreciate uh, for, uh, uh, for your presence and the idea of, of course, expanding the collaboration here is, is for you to see faces. It's good. it's good that you've seen Sonia and Schenk because they know all about money markets and capital markets in Africa. They, they just didn't get the platform to speak about it. Uh, Victor worked exactly on the topics that we were talking about. Uh, I'm sure many of you had in different capacities um, uh, worked on these topics. So the idea is obviously down the line, we don't want workshops like this to be uh, sort of, you know, really unidirectional. We will definitely have a more, perhaps a rectangular or a circular session from the here forwards. Uh, and yes, and thank you for our team, obviously. We're a small team now, only a you know, team of seven, but down the line, we'll, we'll expand to 35 by June next year. Uh, so expect a lot of, perhaps from Yudit, expect a lot of, you know, communication workshop, market development, activities. I think we're more or less done on the exchange setup work. Uh, so down the line, conversations would be about markets, products. So if you're interested to talk to us about any specific product that you have in mind, uh, you know where to reach us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, SX team. Um, I, my work has been done very been made very easy by Mike this morning. He, 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 he took a deep dive into Interbank. And so I should be able to deliver this in a very short time and keep time so that uh, we can move into something a little bit more exciting. Uh, the panel coming up next, I think, is probably what you want to listen more to. So my background is a treasurer before I joined uh, FSD Africa. Um, I, was, I was a general manager for a commercial bank, uh, managing a treasury team. And uh, what I'm going to speak to you about today is generally about interbank and how that uh, can, can be run within a treasury. Now, it's good for me also to mention that a treasury team is not necessarily specific for commercial banks but can be expanded to any uh, organizations. Uh, for example, yesterday I had a meeting with a treasurer for uh, uh, Ethiopia, if, if, is it tell uh, at uh, EIH offices. And that was just really exciting uh, to see that many other organizations that are not financial institutions uh, actually have set up their own treasury departments to, to manage their liquidity and manage uh, their money. Uh, in terms of all the instruments that I'll be speaking about, I also uh, have been spoken to. So all I'll be doing is just adding a little bit 
extra additional uh, things to that. Sorry. Perfect, good. Okay, so, sorry. Yeah, uh, so we'll, we'll look at uh, different functions of these interbank markets. We'll look at the instruments, we'll look at the risks, and we'll look at some of the roles of the treasury, of the treasury department, and also some of the day-to-day -day activities that uh, are taking the, these treasury departments actually do. So interbank money markets, as explained by Mike, uh, they're generally short-term markets um, whereby you have this uh, money being lent between uh, uh, the, the banks themselves or institutions, uh, either financial or non-financial institutions. And by short-term, we mean maturities normally from one day to six months can extend even up to 364 days, but uh, that is generally uh, what the interbank markets uh, uh, are, uh, from one day, which is overnight, to uh, six months or 200, like uh, in markets in Nigeria, where they, they are able to raise money for 270 days, they uh, are called demand deposits. So, um, Generally, uh, these markets are very active, uh, especially by commercial banks, and this is understandably why, because of the managing their deposits and all these withdrawals that happen within uh, clients, and it is very important for them to make sure that uh, they actually create a balance within their, 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 their books uh, or within their balance sheets themselves. Um, the central bank also is uh, very key in use of interbank markets because then the central bank is is able to uh, implement their the central bank rates, which is a money monetary policy tool uh, for controlling the markets and or not really controlling but for managing the markets uh, efficiently. Uh, the role of interbank markets. Uh, one of the role of interbank markets is to avail short-term funding. Uh, Mike spoke about uh, something called horizontal and also something called uh, vertical. Horizontal is when uh, commercial banks are facing the regulator. This is the central bank, money moving between the commercial banks and the central bank. Horizontal is when money is moving between the commercial banks themselves. So uh, availing of short-term funding, you're really talking about the horizontal movement where banks are able to lend money between each other comfortably. And this availability of short-term funding actually creates efficiency in the financial system and creates a stability. As this money is being lent, then there are interest rates that gets determined so the interbank market influences the interest rate. Uh, Mike mentioned that actually the interbank markets set the pace for all other markets. Because once your one day money can be priced, if you know the cost of one day money, then that actually helps you price 30 year money. It helps you price two year money. It helps you price all other funds that you have. So the interbank market are very, very key in the, in, in the pricing of, of money. The other thing is management of your reserves as a bank. You're able to manage whatever reserves that you have more efficiently as a bank. You're able to make sure you meet the reserve requirements that the central bank has set for you. Uh, in this case, what NB has set for you uh, and make sure that you're following uh, the particular policy that is in place. Uh, they also help, um, uh, as I say, the NB is, is able to, to execute their mandate, which is making sure there's, there's good supply of money, there's availability of money, and there's a cost to that particular money that is managed uh, at all times by the central bank. They help smoothen out the financial system, 
Uh, this is because you will find that in the financial markets, you have different financial institutions serving different sectors in the financial markets. So you'll have different commercial banks that have different target clients. You'll have commercial banks which are serving probably the their target is the small, uh, medium sized. You have commercial banks that are even more focused on women uh, serving the, 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 the women in the society. So you have all these financial markets institutions which are focusing on different sectors in the economy. So once money is able to move easily across all these financial companies, you actually smoothen out the financial system and you create an equitable access to capital across the whole economy in Ethiopia. So money markets are very key to ensure that all these institutions, uh, both financial markets institutions, and even your non-financial markets institutions are able to, to access cash. The other thing, of course, is an avenue for central bank to intervene for liquidity management and monetary policy. Cent the central bank needs to be confident that if there is a need for them to intervene in the market, they have a proper channel and an efficient channel in which they can intervene. They can do what is called uh, OMO, open market operations, by injecting money into the market and injecting it in a way that it actually reaches the economy at the shortest time possible to create a better effect in their policy. Or if there is so much money in the, within the markets, they can be able to sponge that money out as quickly as possible as they can in a very efficient way. So this is basically what the interbank markets do. And that is now the vertical relationship that is between the central bank and the commercial banks, which basically act as agents of the, the central bank when, you, when it comes to monetary policy um, execution. They also help provide effective price discovery in the money market. As I said, price is very key. You need to know what is the cost of your money, either one day money or two day money. I'll quickly jump to the instruments. I don't need to mention these instruments. They have already been mentioned. Uh, repos are very key in any market. And what are repos? These are repurchase agreements. And who are they normally used? Who normally uses repo? This is a wholesale instrument. And by wholesale, I mean it's used by corporates only and not individuals. And this is because Repo is a way of organizations to manage their liquidity between each other. And why is a repurchase agreement very key? Uh, in the next slide, I'll talk about risks and you will see why repo is a very key instrument in any economy and why they are traded heavily is because in a repurchase agreement, you're actually able to borrow money. If you're short of money, you're able to borrow money using a security that you're either holding or you're having uh, in your portfolio. This security preferably can be a government security. Why government security? Because government securities are naturally regarded as risk-free when you're in that jurisdiction. Uh, that doesn't mean they don't have risk at all. They have other risks, but they are regarded as risk-free because they are market risks that um, are regarded as not affecting government securities. But that's a different masterclass for another day on, on risks. We will delve into that. But the, mostly you will find that in repos, the security that is being uh, used as the underlying or the one that is being used to borrow uh, the, the money is actually a government security. So if you're holding treasury bills, say you're holding a treasury bill for one year, and you actually just need to fund yourself for a, uh, a week, seven days. You can actually give that security to another institution or another organization, and they give you cash equivalent to that security or slightly less to that particular security. Slightly less because of something Mike raised, something called a haircut. So instead of receiving I have a security of 100, uh, I'm holding a treasury bill of 100 bir. I give it to Hermias. 
Hermias gives me cash of 95 beer instead of 100. So what Hermias has already done is put a haircut of 5%. He's saying he cannot give me exactly 100 in case I default, then he's covered with the 5% because that now becomes his cost. He'll be forced to hold that security for the rest of the year. So he puts a haircut to cover his own self. That is called a risk management. It is a first layer of risk management when you're doing such securities as repo. So Hermias needs to be able to put that 5% in this transaction as we are agreeing the transaction. And now this is where ESX comes into play. Because for these securities to transact, they need a railway line. They need an infrastructure on which they can move on. That railway line is what we are calling the electronic trading platform. That is the platform that Hermias needs to log into. That is the platform he needs to call me. I respond to him. We negotiate the pricing. He puts his haircut. I ask him to be a little bit more gentle with me and cut my hair a little bit longer. He agrees or he disagrees and cuts it at 3%. So he tells me he'll give me 97. So that railway line is what ESX is providing for this economy. They are providing an infrastructure where these instruments can be traded and not just traded, they can be managed. If you're going to trade, if I'm going to trade a repo with Hermias, then I need to manage my risks outside the transaction. There is something that was mentioned called a collateral management platform. Now that is managing risks, which is my next slide. Managing a risk that is called a market risk, which is a risk of price fluctuations. Now, since the treasury bill I gave Hermias is being priced every day, that treasury bill value can go up, can go up or go down. Now, that value needs to be tracked. Somebody needs to keep tracking the value of that treasury bill. And that is an automated system that keeps tracking it and sending notices to all of us, to both Hermias and I, we receive notices. The system keeps tracking that valuation. And if that valuation goes too low, Hermias money is at risk because he gave me money, I gave him the security. Then what happens, I need to give Hermias more security because now he's at risk, the value has gone too low, I need to add a treasury bill to him. So this happens now outside the transaction and again being carried by this railway line that we are calling the electronic, uh, electronic trading platform. There are other things that support this whole infrastructure. And that, for example, is the clearing and settlement system. And let me pause here so that I can introduce someone who's very key here in this room, because um, Dr. Brooke mentioned that we are setting up a state of the art clear, clearing and settlement system. This is a CSD that is being set up by the NBE. Winshet is the captain. So, uh, and I know she's, she's been managing this project from the NBE side, but we have a project manager in the room who's overseeing this installation of the system. And let me ask Asefa, please, could you stand so that uh, anybody who has any question about the CSD system that is being installed, please talk to Asefa and Winshet. They're the ones running that particular project. The settlement system is very key because you need to have what is called DVP, but I'll not go dwell deep into that. That is delivery versus payment. I cannot give you money without receiving my security immediately. Even if there's a few seconds delay, there's a risk because you might disappear. So those are the kind of things now the settlement system removes. You don't have to sleep and get worried that you might actually give money and not receive a security. So that is what Asefa and Winchet are doing, making sure that that settlement system at the back happens 
and is efficient and holds all your securities safely such that there is that. So without this clearing and settlement system, then you ESX cannot function efficiently. So these are support systems that you need. Payment system, I don't need to mention that. This is a system all of you are aware about and use regularly. Regulatory frameworks, very, very key to make sure that uh, all the frameworks that are there are not just for, regulate, for the sake of regulation, but are relevant regulations for the market. And not just relevant for any market, but they are relevant for Ethiopian market because the way your market is structured and the rules and the acts that you have implemented are very different, even from your neighbors uh, just across here, Kenya, Uganda, and anyone else who surrounds you. So those regulations have to be relevant for you as market players here. I've mentioned market risk already. I have also touched on credit risk. This is why repo becomes very important because when Hermias gave me his cash, I gave him a treasury bill and that treasury bill, the title or the name of that treasury bill transferred to Hermias. So if anything happens to me, Hermias is covered in terms of his, 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 his risk, his credit risk in, in case I default, he still is left with a risk-free security that he's, he's well aware when it matures, how much is being paid for that risk-free security, all the details and the characteristics of that instrument are clear to him and will not change until maturity. Then you have liquidity risk, of course, which is potential of you not being able to fund yourself. Uh, you might wake up and your, the market is not able to fund yourself. You call people on screen or through the system itself, and you're not able to fund yourself. So one of the things ESX is doing is bringing an efficient system of how to call each other as market players. Now, when I talk about repo, um, there are other instruments that regulations will keep introducing, things like security and lending. Um, and I can see, Hannah here from the ECMA, uh, ECMA, the Ethiopia Capital Markets are really working hard on introducing all these uh, regulations to you. And this actually, the security lending really opens up the market for you because now the non-banking financial institutions, if you have say if Ethiopian Airways who are holding billions of treasury bills, and they're willing to see to those treasury bills till maturity. And Ethiopian Airways wants to fund themselves, say for the next 30 days. Ethiopian Airways can actually uh, lend those T-bills to a bank or to several banks and they get funded. But let's say you're trading in the market and you need the security because you want to short it. You've seen something called arbitrage in the market. And this is now one of the functions of a, of a, of a treasury, which is uh, looking for arbitrage opportunities. And there's a price difference and you as a treasurer wants to capitalize on this. Then you can actually go borrow a security from someone, sell it, and then return it later. But you need a system that agrees on all these things that there, anyone can see there's a ticket produced there is, you know, the regulator, even your auditor who comes to audit you at the end of the year needs to see you lent the security, you didn't sell it. If you did a repo, the auditor needs to see you actually did a repo and you didn't sell that security. When the auditor comes to Hermias, he needs to see, that auditor needs to see that Hermias lent me, uh, I, I, sorry, I, when lent me money and I lent Hermias a treasury bill for 21 days and it returned back. So even for audit purposes and for your own internal things, these are very key. Functions of a treasury, three things. Um, mismatch, that is your assets and liability management. You do not want any of your liabilities mismatching with your assets. Why? It affects your profit as an organization. The more you match this, the better your profits. 
You need to look at the cost of money coming in and the cost of money you're lending out. The more you efficiently manage this, the better the spread that is left with you. That spread affects your profit. The second thing is arbitrage. Price movements, looking at mispricing of securities and knowing how to take advantage of that. The third thing is risk. I've already talked about risks. I don't need to talk about this slide. This was mentioned and um, I've already spoken to this. Uh, activities of treasury, day-to-day -day managing of your cash, uh, managing of FX and long-term positions and settlement, which I've already discussed. So I think I'm done with that. I have just presented this slide again. Uh, these, are the, these are the numbers you need to have on speed dial for as far as ESX is concerned. Tilaun, uh, I hope I didn't share your wife's number. Yeah, anyway, that's on a light note. So in case, do we do Q&A now or do we jump into the session and take the Q&As during the session? So I think he needs a very warm hand. Thank you very much, Victor. Um, so without taking much time, and also for us to take on a lot of questions, uh, we would have the Q&A session. And I would like to call upon Ms. Sonia uh, Izomach, um, I, I hope I pronounced it right, <laughs> Chief Innovative Finance and Capital Markets Section uh, from the Economic Commission for Africa to the stage uh, to moderate the Q&A session. A hand is needed again. Good morning, everyone. And it's a pleasure to be with you all. Um, allow me to call my speakers. Uh, I will start with Mr. Mike Apte, uh, project manager at ESX. And please, um, you know, give them a round of applause. I will then call Mr. Uh, Mr. Victor Curie, capital market specialist at FSG Africa. And finally, Ms. Weinichet Zerberger, Director, Monetary Analysis Section, NBE. Thank you. Yes, it's better for me so I can interact with the audience and also with the speakers. Uh, thank you all for being with us. You have to notice this is a perfectly gender balanced um, panel, right? And also maybe I have to apologize for Mr. Sisai Mola. He thought that since it's perfectly gender balanced, he does not have to come, but to be honest, that's not the reason he had an impeachment. He was impeached this morning because uh, you know he had other things to, to handle. So apologies on his, behalf, on his behalf, but I'm pretty sure that he would have loved to be with us. Um, without further ado, let me ask my first question to Ms. Uh, Um We spoke about money in interbank markets. Uh, we know that the conditions prevailing in money markets serve as a true indicator uh, of the monetary statute of an economy. Hence, it serves um, as a guide to the government in formulating and revising the monetary policy. Um, depending upon, of course, the market, uh, the monetary condition prevailing in the market. Uh, in the absence of a developed uh, money market, uh, the government will be forced to print and issue more money or borrow from the central bank, uh, both of which could um, lead to an increase in price and, and potentially inflation. My question for you is, what is your lecture about the development of this market in Ethiopia how conducive is the current regulatory framework? And in your opinion, what is preventing the effective transmission of uh, monetary policy to the market? You have the floor. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. I, I think we no, no need to just introduce myself. You already introduced me well. Thank you for that. Yeah, thank you, moderator, for asking a question 
before just starting the assessment of the development where we are. Let me start just the general view when we think and when we talk about the money market, mostly the experts are argued that the core one is interbank money market that reflect all money without excluding the treasury bill market that has reflecting government security. Then when we come the development in the, my view, I wanted to just refer period that are before the reform period and after the reform period. As Victor and Mikhail is saying, well, the development of the internet money market in general, the broader one is not overnight work. It needs time. It needs the sound financial system. It, it needs very framing the regulatory framework in the economy. Then when I came, I, I, I just, I wanted to just compare with the building block that indicate how the market are developing that most experts are argue or most experts are just accepted. The one that indicate market are well developed depending on the, the participant, the investment base. When we look our participants, the investment base, it is starting in slow and shallow one. Why I'm saying that in the, in the beginning of the 2090, the, the pillar that in the put in the homegrown economy were that just developing the primary market, create robust primary market that support to just financing the government from the market rather than from direct advance the central bank. Depending on that, the government already introduced the market-based treasury bill. What we see market-based that increase investors from investor, the participant investor from the banking part. Before that, most of the participant was pension fund and the process was captive and the rate are determined by the policy, not the market. So this one, the bigger reform that coming after the homegrown reform. And when we look at the separate interbank money market, still the participant are not that much. Mostly the bank are placed deposit, time deposit in the other bank. But when we look the structure and we look the characters, it's not secured. It is not collateralized. Mostly it depends on the trust and friendships. So we can say from the participant perspective, we can say the market are not well developed, especially the interbank money market. Then come to the second, the building block that is the availability of instrument. When we look at the instrument that we have, it's very limited because the robust existence of the robust the instrument that help development of interbank money market and for the broader sense for the, the broader money market. But we look the instrument that we have, only the government security that can use as a collateral. And that in this sense, we have behind lag but the good news, we are working strongly. The Mikhail just explained, we are introducing OMO and standing facility directive, theoretically, which put all in instruments that are in place seems forward looking because we are not operationalizing because of different technical and internal shock. But these are hope that give a market, we will have a robust interbank money market and a robust broader money market in the Ethiopia. So we are not just fearing that even if we are coming in late, so with support of the stakeholder, the partner, we are just working too strong to implant this robust money market in Ethiopia. The other one, we can talk about the collateral. He already mentioned, the Victor already spoken well about the collateral. When we look at the collateral, most of the loan or most of the time deposit that in place the bank, I already say it's not collateralized because it's mostly based on trust. But it needs well-established collateral that use for avoiding risks that already mentioned, like credit risk, uh, default risk, and other risks. So it's the one that we are looking for work strongly, and we are working to just in place in the coming the, the, the coming year or so as well. 
The other one, can I mention the monetary framework? The region the country are following matters the development of bank money market. Then the, after the reform, the National Bank collaboration with the other supporters strongly are working with just modernizing our monetary policy framework. Currently, just we are following the reserve targeting anchor that are things that hinder the development of money market. But the central bank is working and has been just approved the moving market, moving from indirect monetary policy to direct monetary policy that we are thinking that increase the development of the money market as well. So the other perspective I can raise to state it that develop how look like the development of many market in Ethiopia is the infrastructure. Having the robust infrastructure like the CSD is very important to transfer ownership from one participant to the other, like repo market and the other market. This one is the key block that we were missed, but with the support of FCD Africa, with the collaboration with other stakeholders like the Capital Market Authority, ESA and the other stakeholders are working strongly to acquire this CSD system. So maybe this also solve our the blocking the lag that behind the developing interbank money market. Having said all that, we can I can conclude that we are we have no the robust interbank money market, very robust and dynamic primary market. But as a government, as a central bank, we are working strong to going forward for acquiring more robust and more active interbank money market in the place. But I wanted to reflect in the in the room that all stakeholders that need to collaborate to build the capacity building, the ecosystem, Simon Telesti, just to build the missing building block in the market with forward looking to the develop very robust interbank money market within the broader sense of developing money market as. What steps are being taken to integrate the development of
Access to funds, um, or yeah, uh, depending on other uh, factors in the economy that can actually make them look more preferable uh, uh, from even how they have positioned themselves in the market. So you tend to have those organizations dealing with themselves uh, and creating two parallel markets, whereby, as you've said, smaller banks might find themselves um, easily segmented off. So currently in Kenya, we have two parallel markets in the money market. Uh, you have the larger banks lending themselves money at a different rate, much lower rate, and the smaller banks lending each other money at a much, much higher rate, sometimes even double what the larger banks are lending each other in the money market. So that happens uh, because you find the larger banks don't want to lend to the to the to the to the smaller banks because of risk, and they feel that probably they just don't want to give money without any security to coming back to them because uh, you have what we call clean line lending that is lending money without any security or unsecured lending as it's normally called, uh, and that creates that problem of those. Uh, parallel markets or segmentation in the market. Uh, the beauty, as you've said, of Ethiopia is that Ethiopia is, it a, is at a very enviable position. These markets have not yet been fully set up or not mature. So Ethiopia has the opportunity of leapfrogging and not repeating the same mistakes that have been repeated in other markets. You don't need to have segmentation here in Ethiopia. So that's why it becomes very key to have a properly set up infrastructure. And that's why ESX becomes really, really critical on how it's set up to ensure that there are no parallel markets, that there's an equitable access of this liquidity between the different sizes of organization, may it be a larger bank or a smaller bank, that even if you're a smaller bank, 
you can actually easily access money from any bank, regardless of the size, because you can use the securities that you have. These are the treasury bills or treasury bonds, which are regarded as risk-free securities. You can lend this through a repo transaction and you get money. So you might not get money unsecured from a larger bank, but you have the power of the treasury bills seated with you. That means you can still borrow, borrow money at the same rate as the larger banks are lending each other, but now you're using your treasury bills as a security. So this creates an equal platform for all the players in the market and you avoid this segmentation of having two parallel markets happening at the same time. So I think Ethiopia is actually at a very enviable position. Many markets in Africa have not been able to to, to deal with the parallel markets because there's no proper infrastructure set up for these repos to move. Remember I told you the repo has other supporting structures, which uh, Wayne Shet has just talked about, collateral management and all these other supporting structures must be in place for repo to be efficient. So I think that is what ESX is actually bringing on board uh, for this market in Ethiopia. Thank you, Victors. We also want to hear from the floor. I'm pretty sure you have a lot of questions. So maybe Solana, sorry. My oh, yes, please. Said, I forget to just record the third question. Can I? Yes, please go ahead. Thank you so much. And so you have more my... time to prepare your questions. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the last question that we were reading is just what the preventing for the transition of monetary policy. Then I wanted to just connect in our case and in general as well. When we look the the transmission mechanism more effective, the need well functioning interbank money market, it one is crucial for the development and the effectiveness of monetary policy in the economy. Why it's important? Because the operation of the monetary policy is interlinked with the interbank money market, right? Why? the banks are determined their lending rate and the retail lending rate and the deposit rate based on the cost that the fund raise, um, and the cost that the fund raise is coming from the intermarket market. So which is our return in reflecting in the, the, the general lending and the aggregate demand that simultaneously affect the conception, investment, and in. the main objective of the central bank is just achieving price stability through managing demand. So it's reflect the impact on the management side or demand side. So this one is the very crucial for the more effective transmission mechanism the implant in the country. And not only the, the robust central bank money market, it needs very liquid secondary market that support facilitating the monetary policy transmission in the, in the economy. Not only that, it's the one that we already stated the emplacement of the other, the liquidity instrument that are reflecting the robust security market, including treasury bill and well liquid managing the debt market, existing debt money that improve the transmission of monetary policy that we are going to work and has been started to working by the issuing the market-based treasury bill. That is crucial for the, the limiting the financing from central bank to the government. And we have also planned to work strongly with the, the other stakeholder collaboration with Ministry of Finance that just establishing well debt management and well cash flow that are supporting for the the establishment and the transmission mechanism in the, the economy. So in general, I just I wanted to conclude that the transmission mechanism to be effective, the precondition that, that is the key one is this robust money market development. So I can assure that the, as a beginner, the central bank have greater role to play with the implement of the market and facilitating the sign that I already mentioned by the president and Mikael, like the national agreement, code of conduct and other guidelines are working just in placing this. So as a participant, the market should be aware and prepare themselves to, to be collaboration with us and work in the building capacity for the internally. And the stakeholder also just focus the, as, as I already said, the capacity building to create awareness. This kind of workshop is very important to create the environment to conducting for the emplacement of the market. So as a beginner, we are learning a lot from the others. We try to not just repeating what they are doing, 
but we try to just lessen the best one from the other country. We really appreciate our colleagues in Ivory countries, East Africans, and we try to learn a lot from other, and we have a big appetite. So we are trying to work toward achieving more effective monetary policy, achieving just more market-based monetary in instrument as initial stage, we already allow bank to just implement averaging reserve money, that average reserve requirement that help to just manage their liquidity and give room to play in the interbank money market. As Tedros well said, we have no any preventing law or regulation that are not prevent or not prohibited to trading bank to each other. More than that, we have a regulation that allow bank to trade each other, but you are right in our report, we have no information in terms of money market. Why I saying we have no any information because the information that the trading arm and the bank are not publicly published, including the maturity, including the collateral that they are using, but internally we know the total amount and the maturity the, in the rate, but public is not. The information very matter for the transmission mechanism for monetary policy communication is very strong one that we think to support. So in final word, I wanted to say thank you so much for the organizing this kind of workshop and very creative and we are very happy to support this kind of workshop as well. Thank you. Thank you. So basically this is a win-win situation. Uh, for the banking sector, but also for the um, central bank and the entire economy. And clearly because uh, we are still at a very early stage of developing money uh, markets in, in Ethiopia, uh, this is also the opportunity of market participants to share the concern, uh, you know, to share the feedback so that it could also be integrated as we are developing this project. Having said so, let me open the floor for questions. Good. So we will take a first round of questions, three maybe, and then maybe we can have a second one. Good afternoon. <clears throat> Sorry. Good afternoon. My name is Joe, Joe Atamensa with the ECA. Uh, my question is for any of the panelists, but it's more centered on uh, the central bank. And I, I think, uh, Mike, in your presentation, you talked about visiting other countries, including my country, Ghana. And uh, what I find, and again, it comes back to Winshet, your just inter last intervention about transmission mechanism, about transmission mechanism. Most of African countries, from what I've seen in the literature, is that it appears that the transmission mechanism doesn't exist. So therefore, even if you build the money market, it is just trading, which is going to be happening within the uh, banks themselves. Because for instance, in my country, inflation is around 42%, right? Interest rates are very high. So you find a situation where you are either having negative interest rates because of the high inflation. And this is the inflation on the books. So my question for you is, how is the governor, Mamo, conducting monetary policy without a money market? How does it work in terms of the transmission mechanism? Because it seems to me, like I always you know, tell my, colleague, my friends and relatives in Ghana that, I mean, it, it seems like the governor of the Bank of Ghana is just going to bed and coming up and say, interest rate should be this. But in terms of it's not having any impact on inflation, right? So the question is, how do you ensure, as you talked about, about monetary transmission mechanism, which takes about, at times, 18 months before it achieves this because of the lacks in the system, right? So in organizing, in organizing um, um, these markets, which I applaud, uh, Mike and your team and everybody who is involved in uh, getting this money market, you need it. Because at the end of the day, it is about domestic resource mobilization. That's the way I see it. Because we cannot continue to depend outside. We need to find a way to use capital. The other part which I wanted to say, which maybe the bankers here can uh, attest to, I don't know whether 
there's a need for any central bank to set a reserve requirement. It should be abolished so that banks themselves can have a way to determine how much money they want to hold in their vaults, right? Because like you said, I mean, a lot of money is being held in their vaults, right? Excess reserves, right? Which we need it for, for productive activity. At the end of the day, that's what it's about, isn't it? To get to the private sector who can use the money to do something, right? The ripple market is just an overnight, I'm short of cash. It's just like a family, you're in the house, so you say, Joe, can you give me $10? I'll, I'll, I'll bring it back tomorrow. So because you want to solve some problem immediately. But in the long run, it's about investments, right? So how eventually would this lead into an investor who wants to bring something to this country, right? And not necessarily having to go to the external market. I'm sorry that my question and my comments are all looped into it, but uh, I hope, I'm sure you can understand where I'm coming from and uh, I'm sure you can uh, respond to it. I thank you. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. I think we get a, a very a clear insight, but I want to brought to your attention to know histories. We learn from histories. Ethiopian back 1960s have a step on this type of issues during Haile Selassie regimes. And to be frank enough, Ethiopia in 1942, most of African country was in colony. Ethiopian have a professional association. We call it commercial graduate associations. And I want to come to your point, especially, uh, Salamite, I'm very happy, your enthusiasm and passions to move on. Uh, as you know, the physical policy, the monetary policy is a key for any country's development. And as you see what was happening in our countries and a day a day, we are not in a position to control inflations. Very little life is in a very challenging situation. So sometimes when you have a lot of ambitions without having the necessary preparations that make the development to be in difficult situation. Do you have a mitigation strategy? How we go? Because no money, no money. So without having sustainable uh, resource, how do you believe that you maintaining? Even to be frank enough, this initiative is back 2018. Now you are in 2023. You see, a lot of things to be done. Historically, a lot of uh, initiative is coming. Why we fail? And there are a lot of good practice all over the world, even nearby our neighbor, Nairobi, South Africans. They have a good way to step in for us as uh, a case to move on. So how do you see from institutional capacities of our bank? We have around 30 in names for me. Can you put it as five bucks? Because we are opening for foreign markets. The foreign markets have a muscle, as my brother Jose said, to get $10, we have been struggling here and there, and we cannot control the black market. If the foreign bank is coming, we all are go to that because to get a good product and service. Do the banks are the preparation for this? Because we are already opening on the way. In other to that, I think for this forum, I think most of them are a treasury. There is a treasury association ongoing. I, I don't think so, it is already registered, but it's registered as civil society. But in other countries, they were being engaged in a, a business community to be a tank, think tank for the general public. Do you have a room for us to work on this? Because if you are working as a think tank group for uh, the general public, because when you see the 13 banks, their money is the general public money. When you see the share, it is very, even five or uh, this requires some study. But as to my general understanding, all the money is the public money. So they play, most of the bank are profitable. But if one bank or two bank of international is intervening, all goes to down. Do you have a strategy and a mindset to move out of this? Thank you. 
Thank you. I will kindly ask, um, you know, uh, for very short questions so that we, you know, bear them in mind as we will respond. So one additional question before I give back the floor to the panelists. Uh, first, allow me to say thank you for the presenters and the panelists. My name is Indris Umar. I'm from uh, Zamzam Bank. Uh, well, a lot of uh, issues has been raised here, uh, fundamentally in terms of inclusiveness and uh, equitable access to capital. These are, I think, I'll consider them are, as basic principles for the task of ESX. Uh, my first question is a concern that is, uh, in the financial sector of our country, we have been witnessing and observing a lot of uh, interest-free banks coming up and uh, uh, others are also joining this uh, area of uh, service. So uh, to what extent is the future or the upcoming ESX uh, ready to accommodate and to consider the interest, the, the characteristics and expectations of these uh, interest-free banks uh, in the coming, like the trading platform engines, the procedures and the regulations. So I'm, I'm, I'm considering this as a concern because the presentation most of the time was focusing on interests and uh, those collateral issues. And I couldn't see the color of this, this bank's nature in the presentation. That's my first concern and question. The second one is in terms of uh, banks, so the ESX is doing a lot of work and moving forward. So what should the financial sectors do to make themselves ready uh, in the meantime or until the next year when the ESX becomes operational, specifically to the money market uh, in particular, and in general also to the services of ESX? What should these banks consider and prepare themselves for the future? In this regard. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so I will give the opportunity to the panelists to respond to the three first question. Uh, maybe I will start with uh, why uh, That question about, uh, you know, the transmission mechanism uh, uh, that currently does not exist. Uh, but uh, so the question of juries is relevant. Um, how is the government conducting monetary policy without money markets? Thank you. Thank you so much. It's a very critical question that everyone can request. Yeah, you are right. Depend on the channel, what the monetary policy transmission mechanisms are affecting. I totally agreed. The existence of internal money market, the robust money market as support and make more effective in monetary policy transmission. But saying that is not say that without interbank money market or without the robust money market is not doing monetary policy. Why I'm saying it depends on the regime, what the, the central bank is following. As previously explained up to recently, up to recent practice, we were just targeting the monetary aggregate target that is monetary regime. By nature, it's not need the emplacement of internal bank money market or money market other than it's mostly is used by the direct monetary policy instrument, like the one that you already mentioned, it's not frequently not changed the reserve requirement, liquidity requirement, and the other instrument that related with the government operation. But really appreciate to be effective the monetary policy transmission. I agree with you in need robust money market in the in the economy, but it depends on the competitiveness of the financial sector, depending on the development of the economy, depending on the availability of instrument that we already mentioned that should trade in the market. The government maybe have a choose to the monetary policy regime. That's why have own limitation. You are right. It's limit to just potentially affect the, the inflation that is the key objective for a central bank why it's limited because the most of the instrument without the money market is not frequently changed and not frequently affected the real economy in the every variable in the economy that is why we are just trying to move the from the 
monetary targeting regime to the, the more market-based and more the indirect monetary policy instrument. And that is why we are saying this need synchronizing to the other reform, reform from the physical side, reform from the, the, the many market as well. And that's why we are just putting strategy, how we are going forward. Initially, we are just doing hybrid one. That means we are doing hybrid. Internally, we are exercising the one that you already mentioned that need robust money market that we are setting the interest rate or policy rate. But for the moment, we are just practicing the hybrid that we are targeting these are money and we are implementing the indirect direct monetary policy instrument that I already mentioned, like reserve requirement, liquidity requirement, and the other instruments that are related with the, the operation of the government. But as I can say now, totally agreed to increase your potentially affect the key objective, the price stability, need to move the indirect one and we need to move more frequent the instruments that are in place to affect and more make effective the monetary policy transmission. We were doing that, but we hope we are just transiting from the indirect one, the, the, the direct that give and support our effort to control inflation. One thing that we, I wanted to just notify is that the impact of inflation diversify and very imperfect one. It's very different variable that determining the inflation but as a, the nation we have received by proclamation as a key objective for us, not only key objective, we have a multiple objective as well. This existing of multiple objects also affect the transmission mechanism when the shock is happening, is have no right to just prioritizing which variable are you are going to affect. Are you just the one that we have, there is a trade-off between trade, trade-off between the growth and inflation, as you already mentioned, trade-off between the financial soundness and the maintaining the price stability. So on this kind of happening, it needs to just prioritizing by law to the central bank. What we are doing now, the, by the, the modernizing the, the, the modernizing the monetary policy reform that give the central bank to prioritize to this multiple objective, we will have multiple objectives, but with sequencing and prioritizing one, that's why we are working on the amending our proclamation that allow to give prioritize and give power to just transmitting monetary policy. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, the two questions I will kindly ask Mike and Victor also to respond. Short, sharp answers, please, so that we can have another round of questions. Learn from history. Um, we mentioned the, challenging, the challenge of controlling inflation uh, and basically what is the ambition, uh, you know, and what would be done to support uh, the banking sector. Uh, I think there is also a, a question around the inclusiveness and access to capital, generally speaking. So maybe, Mike, you can start first and then I will give the floor to, to Victor. Thank you. Uh, okay, I'll try to quickly answer. I think learning from history, um, as we stated earlier, I think both of us doing our presentations, uh, there are segmentation challenges. We see issues and challenges across the, across the continent. So I think some of the lessons learned, we will really focus on from now, before the launch of this market, so that we can prepare. I think capacity building itself, it's one of the key things I think uh, that's lacking in some, some, some uh, regions. So, you know, a year ahead of time, establishing associations, getting people in a, in a room like this with all the various stakeholders together so that we can at least iron out what the differences are from now. You know, if there's a feel of lack of transmission on monetary policy, why? Uh, if, what, what is the infrastructure about? We want to understand it better. You know, these are questions we want to try to start answering now, uh, not after the exchange is launched and everybody's learning in, the, in real time, but now we can at least give us give ourselves a head start. I think both the central bank, the exchange, treasurers, banks, non-banks as well, try to get the whole ecosystem in one place so that we can you know, learn the history, learn together and build the market properly. Uh, and that's number one. Sorry, I'm really bad at remembering questions. What was the second question? Oh, inclusiveness. And also, you know, how, do we make sure that the, how do we make sure that the financial sector is ready? Okay, uh, 
uh, financial sector readiness. I think this is one of the main reasons we're doing this uh, is, is to prepare users uh, of the platform, users of the market, you know, technical capacity building, you know, give examples, you know, best country experiences. We have a lot to learn, you know, it's 2024, 23. There's, we, we don't have to really start everything from scratch. There's so much that we can learn. These are a lot of, these are standardized products. They're not um, complex in that respect. So we can use a lot of best practices from other countries, partner with other banks, both traditional banks, as well as non or Islamic banks, interest-free banks as well. We can use this time to really evolve in that respect, but also, you know, communicating with our team, communicating with the MB, we're all here, you know, we're all engaged stakeholders with an interest in this market and building it. So I think a lot of communication work, um, capacity building will help. Um, in terms of, if I may just answer your question, because I, I think we get asked this a lot in terms of inter interest-free. Um, we do take it very seriously. One of the reasons, it will actually be covered in the later presentations, uh, by the way. So we've structured this in a manner, even the invitations have gone out to have interest-free banks participate in these workshops for that reason. So capacity building will do. Um, I'm probably not the best place to speak about it, but the Capital Market Authority, I have my colleagues here, um, can speak more to that, I think, uh, offline as well. But there's regulations being drawn up for interest-free bank, bank, interest financial products. So we can discuss that with you at any time. So we, we're very cognizant of that, uh, just, to, just to say that. Yeah, Sonia, I'll keep it sharp. I know I'm standing between people and lunch. So um, a straight answer to the associations. Um, ESX will be seeking to be licensed as a self-regulatory organization. That means that associations will be very key because for you to self-regulate yourself, you have to put all your members in an orderly way. And there has to be a way each member conducts themselves. So um, the Treasury Association becomes something very key. Um, uh, FSD Africa has already uh, put in place plans to seed uh, a development fund into, into ESX that hopefully will get funded by other uh, development agencies. And one of the objective of these funds is to support uh, the bathing of a proper uh, commercial treasure, treasury association that will fuel this. It, it can be called treasure, treasury association or traders association or whatever you want to call it, but have people in an association whereby there's a way of conducting themselves, there's a respect that will be built, and there's an open way for communicating between the market players. So that is very key, and that is already in place just to give you comfort we are just not in a stage where we can announce it yet, but there's a lot going on in the background. And I think Tilahun and Mike will probably reach out to you and also see how uh, there can be more synergies with what is already happening in the market so that is not repeated. Um, to Zamzam Bank on how to prepare yourself, I think that's a very relevant question. It's very good to be strategic, especially when you see things moving in a certain direction. It's good to read the times and be ready for them. I think um, Ethiopia is about to blossom in a very, very beautiful way. So whoever finds themselves already prepared with oil ready in their jars. And uh, I think from internally as an organization, what structures do you have? Is treasury operation, for example, something key that you should think about? How do you restructure that within the organization? Uh, relook at it. Uh, also look at capacity for your team. Um, should your team go back and do certain courses within, I think we have the CSI course that is being done now, uh, is being offered. I know as FSD Africa, we've supported it quite a lot. You have your accounting associations here and all that. Make sure your team has capacity to deal with this. So that's one, another way of making sure you're ready and of course, that's why uh, UNECA has uh, seen that this is important for them to support a capacity building session. But when you go back uh, to your team, make sure your teams are ready for this. The other thing is that ESX is also looking forward to do like more, foc uh, more focused masterclasses 
for example, you will need, we will need to put all your risk and compliance people in a room. So, and talk to them a little bit deeper on things like trade limits and all these things that are very key for risk and compliance. So yes, there will be uh, ESX Academy. Am I busting the bubble? Am I, am I presenting the bride before? Okay. Yeah, so there are other things in play, like ESX Academy, which will be conducting those master classes uh, that will be very focused to certain teams uh, within your organization. So please, if you see something come out, make sure your teams uh, attend this because that's the way to prepare yourselves. Thank you. Thank you. Final round of question. I know there is a question from a lady there, um, and I hope we can give her the floor. Yes, thanks. We take additional three questions. And before uh, we give the opportunity to the panelists to, to respond, and it will be lunchtime. Thank you. Okay. Hi, everyone. Blaine from Ethiopian Investment Holdings. Just two very simple questions. The first one being repo markets, have they been known to occur cross boundary across countries, especially in an in East African community type of uh, region, number one? And number two is in your example, the, the key point seems to be the idea, the the idea that government treasury bills are, are risk-free or almost risk-free. In such a case, if you have um, a company, because I, I, this, this was triggered in my mind because you mentioned Ethiopian Airlines, which is a very highly respected rated company. Could a company like that, wouldn't it not be easier for it to issue its own securities or could other entities use uh, securities of Ethiopian Airlines if it's highly rated close to being risk-free to do repo type of markets, or would that be a different category? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay, good. So this will be our final question. Um, so who wants to start? <laughs> Well, um, probably let me, I, I am the one who opened the can of worms in the room uh, talking about government risk-free securities. So, well, let me close it since I opened it. Um, yeah, uh, and I was kind of cautious. I was wondering if to, 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 to raise that statement or not, but um, when I say risk-free, uh, it's part the jurisdiction that you're in, uh, of course. It, if, if, for example, if your tell is located in this jurisdiction of Ethiopia, it cannot globally receive a higher rating uh, than the country itself, if its operations are only inside the country, because that means it's exposed to all the macros that affect that particular country. So if you move out of uh, Ethiopia, then the government security in Ethiopia only receives the same credit rating as Ethiopia itself. So you revert back to what Ethiopia is credit rated at. And that might not probably be very, a very attractive rating if you now look at it from that particular point of view. So then from that angle, it does not become risk-free and might not even become attractive compared to many other government securities uh, that are in existence. So it's just good to settle that by closing it like that. Um, yes. This is why you need ESX. You need ESX so that corporates can actually come to market and be able to fund themselves. They can be able to issue securities that uh, will enable them to access capital in a quick and efficient ways. So one of the things that is, is we've seen that has grown big time, for example, in Nigeria, is the corporate paper. Um, there was a case study presented by Mike here and in the by of FMDQ. In the first quarter of this year, FMDQ issued 220 commercial papers. This is of different companies that are able to access six months money, eight months money, and they are able to raise this money within a week. And this is money that does not require any security at all. Unlike walking to the bank where you're, there's a long process and all this. In fact, in Nigeria, the biggest beneficiaries of commercial papers are the banks themselves. 
they are the biggest issuers of these commercial papers. So yes, you have corporates that can come to the market, issue things like commercial papers, issue even bonds themselves. You have even uh, what you would call environmentally sensitive and socially sensitive organizations that can come to the market and issue things like gender bonds, like we've seen in Tanzania. One of the bank issued a gender bond. And this, I have to say, it's just an impressive case study because this is the first Greenham, I think, from our end we've seen in Africa. What do I mean by Greenham? The commercial bank in Tanzania was actually able to issue the gender bond at a rate lower than the government interest rate. And more than 50% of the people who bought that bond were women, and they were women clients of the bank. They were willing to receive a lower interest rate than government rate because of the impact the bond was going to have, because it was going to be redirected to the women SMEs in Tanzania. So you have such corporate opportunities that can happen. And you present now a platform for all these institutions seated in this room, serving different sectors of the market. They can come to the market and they can access capital and say, mine is a labeled capital. It's an interest-free uh, bond that I'm issuing uh, or paper or whatever it is. Mine is a gender bond. Mine is a green one. Mine is on water and sanitation. Mine is on, you can even label them as much as you want. So it creates a lot of opportunity for these corporates to come to the market and actually issue all these different types of instruments. So this is, I think, um, an amazing platform to have uh, through ESX. Thank you, Victor. Mike, do you want to compliment? I think Victor summarized it very well. Just one or two quick things to address one thing you mentioned. Can you, you can do repos that are not government security backed. So to give you specific data points, so in the US about 10 years ago, I think about 30% of repos were non-government securities. Interestingly enough, over time it's become more towards government security. So even in America, in the most developed markets, I would say 80, 90% is backed by government securities, but it's not impossible. It's feasible, it can be done. Uh, and, and this market can allow that, uh, number one. And cross-border is very it's common. Even in Africa, it happens. Uh, cross-border repos are done, uh, you know, especially neighboring countries a lot of times. And, and just remember, there's foreign banks in a lot of countries. So they, they do a lot of their FX cross-border repos that way. So it's, it's both also happens. Thank you. Um, and with that, we will conclude this first panel. Uh, I think my key takeaways, uh, they are reforms. I think it's always good uh, to have the, regula the regulator being committed to support the development of the market, because without that you know, will, it will be difficult for commercial banks then to develop and even innovate in money markets. Um, number two, Building that ecosystem requires you know, the input of every market participants. So this is not just an initiative of the government or the regulator, but it's an initiative of the entire market. Um, and finally, I think there are concerns around you know, the capacity building and the readiness of you know, the banking sector to be fully engaged in, in, in money markets and clearly be assured that um, ESX, together with all the partners, we will keep you know, pushing for, for, for those activities. I like to say that um, you know, financiers, we are very concrete, right? When we do things, we are not economists per se because we do not rely on theory to assess the economy. We need figures. Uh, so unless you actually uh, you know, in, uh, trade in the money markets, everything we are doing here will remain theory. So we also need to start engaging in that market so that we can face and deal with the challenges and see how we can further improve them. Thank you, enjoy your lunch, and please stay with us for this afternoon session. We will still discuss, be discussing exciting topics. Thank you, and please join me in thanking the, the panelists. Thank you. And I ask you to thank the moderator herself. <laughs> So thank you very much, Sonia, for being on time. I know there are a lot of questions that could come and will come. Uh, so we would ask everyone to continue discussing and engaging throughout the lunch. 
Uh, lunch will be served downstairs at the terrace. Uh, so when you go out, the team would actually be handing over coupons. So kindly take that while you're going downstairs and enjoying your lunch. We need you to be back. This time I'm not gonna be making mistakes at 1.30 p.m., okay? So exactly at 1.30 would start. And if you come in early, we start early and we close early, giving you back the rest of the time. So enjoy your lunch and come back at 1.30. Thank you. I think in the interest of time, I love this. The chit chats are happening, disregarding if I'm quiet or not. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm going to continue. Uh, I think I don't need to introduce uh, uh, the presenter because you already had engaged with him. You've already heard him uh, share a lot about money market and interbank markets. Uh, in the afternoon, we're going to change gears and focus the session on fixed income instruments. And I guess to get uh, started with that conversation back again, I will call upon Mike to the stage. I know after lunch, it's going to be a graveyard shift and Mike would do an up job in keeping you all energized. <laughs> Thank you. I need help keeping myself energized. <laughs> um, I had a long presentation earlier, so I'm not going to go through slides and all that. I think it's more important to give the platform for two of our speakers today, uh, Evan and Paul will discuss a little bit more of the details of the fixed income market. So, you know, like I said earlier, we're trying to follow sequentially how the debt market works. We start with very short term, growing into the T-bills, treasury bonds, and then corporate securities, uh, thematic bonds, et cetera. So that's kind of the structure today with Evan's presentation. And then Paul will share some experiences from the private sector. Uh, how dealing works, et cetera. So I'll just spend like five minutes really about ESX's role. I think a lot of you in this room have been to some of our engagement workshops. Uh, so I won't repeat uh, too much, but uh, in general, what we were trying to establish is both an integrated view of the debt market. So we want to service money markets, interbank, but also, you know, your treasury bills. Um, when shit is not here, but the government is also interested in issuing longer dated securities or treasury bonds. And then corporate bonds, obviously. Uh, we don't have a functional corporate bond market, but we're having an exchange in place that will allow, you know, at least the railway, as Victor said, you have the infrastructure in place, you'll have issuers, investors, and intermediaries, your investment banks, um, that will help structure these deals and set up corporate bonds. So the exchange will basically be capable, the exchange platform will be capable of uh, listing bonds, uh, both government and non-government bonds, uh, municipal, green, etc. All of these things in today's technology, relatively easy to do. Uh, the harder work is on the capacity building, bringing the market, uh, bringing insurers and investors together, educating the market. So that's going to be a lot of our role, you know, through the academy we mentioned earlier. We'll do a lot of trainings, uh, master classes. I think the way Victor put it is really well said, we'll have master classes dedicated on each product. So today we're covering like everything. I mean, it's, it's a lot, it's a lot to take in, but the goal is down the road to focus on specific topics. So Islamic bond, finance, um, green bonds, we'll have dedicated sessions for these because these are big markets. Debt markets are very large in general. Uh, liquidity is much higher in the debt markets across the world, uh, more than the equity markets. So, I think the main points I want to state is that we will we plan on operating in different segments of the debt market, products, services, training, uh, capacity building, as well as establishing like a more formal uh, methodology and rules around the, the debt market. So that's kind of our structure. Uh, just one additional thing I'll share is, is as an exchange, we plan on having a fixed income and uh, equity 
uh, operational side. So you'll have a dedicated team managing the fixed income side, the money markets, et cetera, and a dedicated operational team managing the equity side. So from day one, we're aware that these are very functionally different markets. They behave differently and we don't want to run into what other exchanges across the continent have, have, have experienced where an exchange is set up to service the equity market, but they kind of neglect the debt market. And you have these other exchanges that come and open up just to service the debt market. That doesn't need to be the case in our scenario. We can start fresh and have a holistic view of uh, the capital markets, both at debt and equity. I think with that, I'll leave, I'll stop there. I'll let Evan get into his presentation. Uh, he'll cover a lot of the topics, uh, pricing, et cetera. So you'll have a lot of time. Uh, I want to give him more time to present. Thank you. Hello. All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Pleasure to uh, be here. I'm really delighted to be here. It's uh, an honor to be here, I'd say, and uh, be involved in this exciting initiative to uh, start up the capital markets exchanges in Ethiopia. Um, so I'm uh, just uh, delighted that, to have been asked uh, to participate. Um, the I'm going to talk about uh, fixed income and my, uh, let me share with you, first of all, my perspective on uh, fixed income. So I'm an actuary. I've worked with pension plans and retirement systems my whole life. And the way I think about fixed income is uh, I come at it from my actuarial side where I think about the, uh, the liability, the obligation uh, that I have or an investor that I'm working with has. And that's to uh, fulfill this obligation to make a payment at some point, to make a pension payment, to... Uh, be uh, providing income to a retiree at some point. And uh, so the idea that I'm uh, thinking about and working about the perspective that I have is I have the, this payment, it's uh, 20 years from now. And if I have an investment that will deliver me uh, a cash flow 20 years from now, at the same time I need to make a pension payment, then I like that asset. And if it's a high quality asset that I have confidence in uh, delivering that, uh, that cash flow, uh, it's a very good asset for me. It, it eliminates uh, all my risk and it eliminates investment risk, it eliminates liability risk because uh, it's gonna deliver the income I need to make the payment that I'm obligated to make. So that's the way I think about it. It's an, an asset liability management uh, perspective, an ALM perspective. And a lot of uh, fixed income investors uh, will think that way, but there are certainly other reasons for investing in fixed income and other, uh, other perspectives. Um, so I go around to uh, different countries. Um, I'm uh, often educating, kind of like I'm uh, doing today, and uh, often educating about asset liability management. Uh, but of course, this, when I go to a country, I want to, uh, I want to know a little bit about the country, know a little background about uh, the uh, economy and the, the capital markets and so on. And so the first thing I look at, I'll just give you a second to ponder what the first thing I look at might be. The first thing I look at to know something about uh, the local economy is the 10-year bond yield, the yield on 10-year uh, bonds from uh, the local government. And so if I, if I only had one thing to know about the local economy, it'd be the 10-year bond yield uh, the, uh, from the local government. And the reason is that uh, you can read a lot from uh, just that single uh, item. You can know a little bit about uh, economic growth. You can know a little bit about inflation. You can know a little bit about uh, expected uh, stock returns. And so there's a whole lot of information and just uh, kind of a perspective background on the local economy just from that single item. Uh, better yet is the whole yield curve of interest rates for on bonds from the local government. Then you have uh, an even greater perspective uh, uh, 
the slope of the yield curve, the, uh, the extent of the yield curve, how far does it go out, um, the interest rates at the short end of the curve, uh, all providing uh, lots of information. So uh, these interest rates and this uh, progression of interest rates as they go along uh, the term structure, uh, very useful uh, and important. And uh, those are the things that I look to uh, to initially understand uh, the, the local economy. So this uh, fixed income stuff that we're gonna talk about uh, is very important as, let's see, I'm, uh, I'm pressing the down arrow, but I'm not getting new slide. Just hit return. So I just hit this. Okay. Um, yeah, so fixed income market, uh, Mike just mentioned it, but uh, fixed income markets are amazing, huge, uh, complex. Uh, typically in most countries, the fixed income market is bigger and certainly worldwide, the fixed income market is bigger uh, than the equity market. But it's also a lot more complex. I mean, a single company is uh, often gonna have just a single equity security out in the market, but they may have uh, many, even uh, dozens of uh, fixed income securities out there, different maturities, um, different structures, different uh, covenants and provisions uh, on their fixed income. So, and there's, uh, we'll talk about in a second, uh, many different kinds of uh, fixed income. So just uh, lots of uh, interesting uh, complexities to uh, learn and understand in the fixed income world that you don't have in the equity world. And we'll try to cover some of those today. We only have 45 minutes and uh, to cover this uh, giant complex world in 45 minutes is, uh, is a daunting challenge. We're not really going to cover it in any depth, but what I'm gonna try to do is just uh, give you basic concepts, uh, theories, uh, get the ideas out there, get the terminology out there, so that then uh, you have a basis uh, to go further, to investigate these things further. Some of this will just maybe cement stuff you already know, and some of it will uh, maybe be a little new and uh, add to what you already know, and some of it will just be uh, background for further investigation. So here's kind of a structure to things. I'll talk about some background, talk about some kind of math and analysis that you do in the fixed income world, and then talk about uh, actually investing and what different perspectives different investors bring to, uh, to uh, fixed income and why they invest in fixed income and how they do it. Okay, so background. So first investment objectives. So what are investors trying to achieve when they invest in fixed income? Uh, so the first thing I think that an investor, at least in the U.S., would think about is it's just diversification. So the kind of the primary uh, investment vehicle, the primary asset class is equities. And I've got these equities. They're going to provide return for me. I'm going to get have more money in the future because my equities are uh, providing uh, this return. But my equity portfolio value is going to go like this. It's going to go up and down. Uh, it may be way down here at some points. It may lose 50% of its value at some point. And so I think about uh, the bonds that I invest in as just providing stability to that up and down uncertain uh, nature of returns from uh, equities. And I just want to smooth it out a little bit by having uh, bonds in the portfolio. The second reason is the one I talked about before, matching obligation cash flows. If I have an obligation to make a payment at some point in time, whether it's uh, as an insurance uh, company, a pension plan, uh, it could be investing for uh, college or buying a home where I wanna have money available at a certain time. Uh, I'm, I can use fixed income to provide that very predictable cash flow to make those payments. Predictable income, so uh, corporations may want uh, just predictable, stable income uh, from their, uh, from the cash that they're holding on their balance sheet. Retirees uh, want income during the retiree period and, and fixed income can provide that. And then of course, return. I may invest in uh, some riskier, higher returning uh, fixed income to provide return in a different way uh, than equity. So very different objectives, a different uh, approach to uh, thinking about 
investing when I'm thinking about fixed income versus equities. And of course, then the risks are different uh, as well. In equities, again, I, I'm going to have this up and down uh, different uh, value of my equity holdings as things progress, as people and investors have different perspectives on the future of a particular company, on the future of the economy, the way profits are going to grow, uh, the way they might uh, be worried about the management at a company and that uh, uh, profits are going to uh, drop off. So, so that's what I'm worried about in the equity world. In fixed income, uh, really it's all about interest rates. If I'm going to be trading fixed income in any way, interest rates are my first uh, concern and what I'm really thinking about first and foremost. If interest rates change in the wrong way, the value of my uh, fixed income investments change. Uh, but of course, I'm also worried about default that uh, whoever's issued the fixed income invested in isn't going to be able to make the payments. Uh, that they've promised. And uh, even before they actually default, I may be worried that the risk of them defaulting uh, increases such that the value of my bond uh, decreases and I'm not able to uh, trade it as, uh, at as high a price. So different uh, types of risk in the two worlds. So really what we're talking about here is the cost of money. Money costs something, money's a, a resource, uh, and we have to pay for it. And we pay for it uh, by paying interest, uh, providing a yield to someone that uh, loans us money so that we can use it uh, for whatever purpose it is, buying a car, uh, making investments at a corporation, as, as a government. Uh, I'm using money to uh, pay the general expenses of the government, but I have to pay for that. I pay interest rates. And uh, so there's all types, all types of uh, different borrowing and fixed income investments uh, are just another type of uh, borrowing. So I'm interested in these things at the bottom of the chart when, uh, when I'm interested in investing or in issuing, uh, issuing fixed income interest and how long the uh, loan is gonna be for, uh, whether I'm, what rate I'm gonna pay for it, whether that rate's gonna be fixed or variable. Um, I can pay off the principal in different ways. So those are some of the key things that I'm interested in when I'm doing any type of borrowing. And uh, the, the interest rate may be uh, first and foremost is, is what we look at when we're uh, taking out a mortgage, uh, when we're issuing a bond, when we're buying a bond. Um, and uh, the interest rates uh, are really the cost of money. So interest rate, we can think about interest rates uh, from a supply and demand perspective. Uh, so high interest rates really uh, are a blessing and a curse for uh, the high interest rates mean that it's hard to get money. Money is expensive. Uh, if I want money to use for something, then it's expensive to get it because I'm going to have to pay uh, a high yield for it. Uh, on the other hand, high yields are, are a good sign in the sense that if uh, issuers are able to, uh, or uh, lenders are able to charge a high yield, that means that, uh, that investors or those that are using the money are able to uh, find good uses for it even at that high interest rate. So corporations that are borrowing money at a high rate are able to use that to produce profits they expect at a high rate. So uh, high interest rates can be a good sign in that sense. So lots of different types of fixed income investments, as I uh, mentioned, uh, different types of uh, government bonds uh, that can be issued, uh, all different types of corporate bonds, uh, different uh, bonds with uh, economic, social, and uh, governance type uh, objectives these days, green bonds, sustainability bonds, which uh, have a little bit broader perspective beyond the environment uh, than green bonds, asset-backed securities. So this is... Uh, uh, kind of a bond that's uh, becoming more popular and uh, is uh, used a lot in the U.S. and other developed countries. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about it in a second. Sukuk, so uh, in the Islamic world, a Sharia compliant uh, bond replacement. Um, so lots of different types of fixed income investments. Uh, as Mike was saying, we could, uh, we could spend a course on any one of these uh, different types of investments, but we're really just going to go over basic concepts uh, today. So let's talk about uh, a typical bond, a conventional uh, type bond, and, and just what it is, how it works. So we have uh, this clear in our head. So the So the 
uh, investor who's going to uh, earn money off the bond loans money to the issuer. The issuer is a corporation or a government. So they're borrowing from the investor. And of course, they're going to pay back the money over time. And in a typical bond, uh, the money gets paid back uh, every six months. So there's a, what's called a coupon that comes from the fact that uh, originally bonds were just pieces of paper. They had little uh, strips of uh, coupons on them that you tore off and turned in uh, to get your interest payment. So the, uh, the coupons are interest payments. They're made twice a year. So if I have a bond that's paying me 10% interest, uh, each coupon is going to pay me 5%. So that the total at the end of the year is the 10% annual interest. This is a three-year bond, so it's making a coupon payment after six months, 12 months, 18 months, and so on until the end of the three years, at which time uh, the original loan also gets paid off. So this is just uh, the basic structure uh, that uh, most, of the, most of the world of bonds, both government and corporate bonds, follows. Now, uh, there's two different types of bond investors. Uh, well, there's many different types of bond investors, but let's just start off by categorizing uh, them into two camps. One is the hold to maturity, uh, the uh, investor that's going to buy a bond and then hold it until the end of its term. So that investor is going to get all these coupon payments. They're going to hold the bond the whole way, get the final coupon payment, get the uh, return of the original loan and uh, hold this the whole way. That investor is not so worried about interest rates during this time because each of these payments is fixed. It's already uh, determined in the original uh, agreement between the investor and the issuer. And uh, so investor who holds to maturity is not worried about how interest rates change. An investor who intends or possibly will trade the bond is worried about interest rates or interested in how interest rates change. Because if I have a bond that's paying me 10% interest and interest rates in the economy go down, now my bond that's paying 10% based on the way the economy was uh, when I bought it, uh, maybe the similar bond in the, the new economy is only providing uh, 7%. Now my 10% interest is uh, worth more. So a drop in interest rates has increased the value of the bond I hold. Uh, same thing if interest rates go up, now uh, my bond uh, is worth less. So even though I'd like to get paid 13% interest uh, on a bond, and that bond is worth more than a bond that pays 10% interest, um, if I already hold a bond paying 10% and interest rates go up, the value of my bond decreases. So this basic, uh, this basic idea that when interest rates change, the value of bonds change is, uh, is absolutely essential to understanding bond investing, thinking about bond investing and uh, operating in the bond market, understanding interest rates. And we'll come back to that uh, several times as we go through. Here's a different kind of uh, bond uh, called an amortizing bond. Uh, this is the way a lot of mortgage loans are set up. And here, instead of the uh, instead of the principal being paid back with coupons and then all of the principal being paid back at the end, the principal is paid back gradually over time. Gradually over time, I pay less and less interest because I've paid off some of the principal. So I have less and less loaned out. Uh, therefore, I pay less and less interest on it. And by the end, I make a final interest payment and a final principal payment. And it's just another structure for getting, uh, getting money back to the, uh, the investor, the, the uh, entity that loaned the money. Uh, this is a little bit lower risk uh, to the uh, investor because the principal is being gradually paid back. So the principal is not all pushed back to the end of the, end of the term. Uh, an asset-backed bond is uh, a different type of uh, entity, uh, but it's worth uh, knowing about because of uh, its popularity in uh, different places. So what happens here is that a whole bunch of loans of some kind, they could be mortgage loans, they could be car loans, they could be credit card loans, they're all packaged together. 
and the payments from these loans go to uh, some kind of entity, um, some issuer, some investment bank, uh, say, packages them together and then uh, separates them out into different tiers and they make the first payments to uh, the, the investors in the investment grade piece of this. Uh, a, a higher risk piece uh, gets paid after these and then the lowest risk piece called the equity piece uh, gets the last. So any loans that are uh, that default here, the default is first applied to this group and uh, any payments that don't come through here because of defaults uh, decrease the uh, this piece first. So this piece is uh, higher or lower risk. Uh, this piece is higher risk and gets a higher yield because of that. So just uh, another way to structure a fixed income type investment backed up by uh, securities, the uh, loans, and um, it's a way of monetizing these loans for, uh, for whoever holds them. Okay, let's talk a little bit about uh, government debt versus corporate debt. So, of course, uh, the basic idea here is exactly the same. Government needs money to uh, do all the things they do, uh, build roads, build bridges, um, provide assistance to people. Corporations need it uh, to invest, uh, to pay their workers, and so on. And, and so they, they loan money at times to, uh, to cover those expenses. Uh, but government debt and corporate debt are, are different in important ways. Um, so of course, uh, government is their uh, their payments on the money they loan are backed up by tax revenue. So what's important to understand about the government is their tax revenue source, uh, their the government budget. Uh, how close is the budget uh, to being balanced? Uh, there's political risk uh, that's involved there, and uh, so as an investor in government bonds. Uh, even though they're technically uh, low risk and uh, even considered no risk in many places, uh, you're paying attention to uh, how well the government is set up to, uh, to make the payments back. In the corporate world, of course, it's all about the profits and the money that the, the business is bringing in to, to pay, those, pay, back, um, pay back the loan. So uh, I've got a different type of risk for each type of uh, loan that the different entities are uh, taking out. A couple other uh, key things here are uh, the a government bond is typically issued uh, through an auction process. So the government or sometimes through the central bank uh, puts government uh, bonds out through an auction process. And uh, anyone interested could be individuals, more likely institutions, banks, pension funds, um, insurance companies put in a bid. Uh, the yield that they would accept on a particular term of bond, a, a two-year bond, we're willing to pay uh, X percent, a five-year bond, we're willing to pay uh, Y percent. And uh, the, uh, the issue, the government issue is uh, filled up to the extent that the yield or the uh, bids fill that up. In the corporate world, uh, bonds are issued through an underwriting process. So an investment bank typically will uh, work with uh, the issuer, the corporation that's issuing the bonds. Um, they'll go out to the, the investment bank, will go out to their clients, uh, assess interest amongst their clients uh, about investing in the corporates, uh, corporation's bonds, think, find out what yield they might be willing to uh, accept and that kind of thing. And eventually then uh, issue the bond uh, to the different uh, interested investors that the uh, investment bank has uh, connected with. So different processes. The corporate bond then is also, you're gonna be more interested in the different uh, provisions that are part of the bond covenant. So there'll be requirements in the covenant for, uh, there'll be financial requirements, uh, profitability requirements perhaps. There'll be requirements about uh, levels of debt, so you're going to restrict the corporation uh, to not taking on too much uh, other debt. Um, uh, the corporation, on the other hand, may want to have uh, a call provision in the debt, which allows them to pull the debt back in. They can buy it back from the investors, pull it back in, and then issue other debt in place of that. We can come back to that, talk about that a little more later. All right, so let's talk about uh, a few 
uh, bond markets uh, out there and just get a sense of uh, the size of things and kind of the relative size of uh, government and corporate uh, bond markets. You can see here uh, the U.S. bond market. Uh, this, these numbers are uh, a year and a half old or so, but uh, corporate or the total market in uh, the U.S. is about $50 trillion um, and about the same size, uh, government and corporate. Um, United Kingdom, much smaller. Japan uh, has a huge uh, level of government debt, as you uh, might know, and so they have a, a big government debt, uh, government uh, bond market in Japan. Uh, many uh, Japanese citizens own government debt, and um, uh, it, it's, uh, it's a big thing in Japan. Then uh, some of the developing countries, you can see the statistics there from uh, fairly large in China to, uh, to much smaller. Um, and uh, more developing bond markets in, uh, in other countries. Vietnam and Bangladesh are maybe of interest. Uh, I was telling someone earlier about uh, Vietnam. Vietnam uh, has put a lot of energy and a very uh, dedicated focus into developing a corporate bond market. And the, the story there is very interesting uh, to follow and, and maybe uh, can get shared with you at some point because I think there's uh, lessons to learn there. Bangladesh is on here because uh, I taught uh, much of this material to institutional investors in Bangladesh. Uh, there, they're trying to establish a corporate bond market. And uh, so you see that they have some issuance of government, but really no issuance of, uh, of corporate debt yet. So I think it's a, a common situation that uh, government debt is out there, but uh, lots of developing countries trying to uh, develop their corporate bond market. Okay, let's uh, turn to some other concepts here. There's going to be some questions throughout here, and the questions uh, that come up, uh, I'm not going to answer them for you. I'm just going to pose the question uh, to you, and you can think about the answer, and uh, hopefully the answer will come on the next couple slides, but I think it's useful to uh, have some, uh, some question in your head as, as we go through the material. So the first question here is if interest rates go up, what happens to the value of a bond held by an investor? Uh, so first, let's just cover some definitions. Uh, a lot of these terms may be familiar to you. The time until the final payment is the maturity of the bond. Uh, coupon payments, we just covered. Default is uh, when the loan can't be paid back. Um, par value of the bond is the face value of the bond, but it's not the market value of the bond. So the market value of the bond is gonna change when interest rates change. So often the face value is equal to the market value right when the bond is issued, but as time goes on, the value of the bond changes. It may be because interest rates have changed and uh, the value of the bond changes we talked about before, or it could be because uh, if it's issued by a corporation or a government, the uh, confidence in that issuer has changed and if there's more worry about the ability of that entity to pay back the money that it's uh, loaned uh, or borrowed, the, uh, the value of the bond may decrease. So par value is the original value, not the market value. Present value is very important. You discount future payments uh, with discount rates, often using the treasury yield curve as a discount rate. Um, to establish the value of uh, any bond that you hold. Uh, yield is a very important concept. And uh, so we talked about coupon yield, but uh, eventually as interest rates change, the coupons that you're receiving are not gonna define the actual yield that you're getting on the bond. Um, so we'll talk about uh, yield to maturity. Um, then yield curve we'll talk about uh, second and uh, credit spreads we'll talk about. So what's the difference in duration of a 10-year zero coupon bond and a semi-annual coupon bond? A, a zero coupon bond is a bond just like the three-year one that we looked at, but it doesn't pay coupons. It doesn't pay interest along the way. It pays all the interest back at the end in the final payment and then pays back uh, the original loan as well. So there are no coupons, final payment uh, made at the very end. So a 10-year bond would have no payments until 10 years from now. And so this question is about the duration of something that just gets paid once in 10 years, 
or something that gets paid gradually over time with, uh, with the final payment at uh, 10 years. And uh, so we're about to cover the concept of duration, which is a vital one uh, to bonds. So duration really uh, covers two concepts. The first one is uh, it's the weighted average maturity of the payments that are being made uh, on the bond. Um, so a 10 year zero coupon bond that just makes a payment 10 years from now has a duration of 10 because the weighted average timing of the payments is 10. Uh, the uh, coupon bond, 10-year uh, coupon bond that makes payments gradually and then also makes final payment at 10 years, the weighted average time is going to be somewhat less than 10. So the duration of the coupon bond is less than the 10-year uh, bond. Now, the, the timing of the payments also define the interest rate sensitivity. So the longer a bond is, the more interest rate sensitive is when you discount the future payments with discount rates and get the present value today, the change in value is gonna be different for a longer bond because you discount over a longer period. If you're, if you're uh, discounting at uh, 5% for 20 years, you get a bigger impact than if you're discounting at 5% for five years. So uh, the, the duration is also a measure of interest rate sensitivity. And that's really what we're interested in when we're thinking about bonds. Again, if we're holding the bond all the way to maturity, we're not really so concerned about the duration of the bond. We know we're gonna hold it. We know the payments that we're gonna get. We're not worried so much that the value may be going up and down as uh, time goes on. But um, if I potentially am gonna be trading the bond, uh, or if I'm accounting for it on my, uh, on my books uh, in a way that need, I need to keep track of the value, then, um, then I'm gonna be concerned with duration. Now, so the 10-year bond that has the zero coupon bond that has 10 years of duration is going to change by 10% if I move interest rates by 1%. So duration mean in terms of interest rate sensitivity tells me what percentage the value is gonna change by if interest rates change by 100 basis points. So if interest rates go from 5% to 6%, we know the value of the bond is going to go down, right? So the value of the bond is gonna go down. And if the duration is 10, if it's a 10 year bond, we know the value of the bond is gonna go down by 10%. So duration defines the impact of changes in interest rates on the value of the bond. So now we're gonna talk about yield curves. Interest rates for payments further in the future are usually higher, about the same or lower than uh, interest rates that are uh, coming soon. So in order to define this, uh, and talk about yield curves and the structure of a yield curve, the, the term structure of rates, we're going to start by talking about central banks, because central banks really define uh, the interest rates for us. And so we got to start here with uh, what the central bank is doing. Here's a list of central bank functions. They hold deposits for the government and for commercial banks. Uh, they usually hold securities, and through those, holding those securities, they're going to control rates. Uh, they're going to control the money supply. Sometimes they issue their own securities, and uh, by issuing their own uh, bills, they're going to uh, also control the money supply and interest rates. But it's through this, um, through these different functions, that they control uh, the money supply and interest rates. And so let's just uh, get clear about how that's done. Here we've got three different central bank actions, and these are really just a sample of the types of. Uh, approaches a central bank can use to control the money supply and uh, control thereby control interest rates. So one is uh, to decrease rates on the, the deposits. So if banks are going to get less on their deposits with the uh, central bank, then they're going to loan money out. They're, they're not going to hold as much money with the central bank. They're going to loan more money out to the economy. That's going to put more money into the economy and uh, thereby increase the money supply. Another way uh, we talked about, uh, I think it was uh, Mike that, uh, or maybe it was uh, Victor that had the uh, open market operations, uh, go out and buy securities from banks 
take uh, the securities off the bank's books, but give them cash. Now the banks have more cash. Now they can make more loans. Uh, money goes out into the economy, increases the money supply. The central bank, again, could issue securities. They could issue securities, have them bought by banks. Now the banks are paying the central bank. Money is going into the central bank away from the commercial banks, and therefore coming out of the economy. That lowers the money supply. So now when there's more money, uh, just going back to our basic uh, idea about how interest rates uh, are affected by uh, money. If there's more money, uh, that means it's cheaper money. That means interest rates go down. If there's more money out there, it's going to be cheaper to get, higher supply, lower cost. Uh, interest rates are going to go down. If there's more money, there's going to be more spending, and more spending is going to lead to higher inflation. So more money means both higher inflation and lower interest rates. And of course, we've had a lot of that uh, in the world in the last uh, 10, 15 years. A lot of central banks pushing more and more money into the economies, uh, thereby uh, pushing down interest rates and increasing inflation, and only just recently have uh, reversed that in a pretty severe way. So then we get to uh, yield curves. Uh, the central bank uh, really controls mostly the short end of the curve when they enter into the type of action called quantitative easing. They're trying to go further out on the curve and, interest in, and uh, impact rates further out the curve. But generally, the central bank is impacting the short end of the curve. And then the long end of the curve is being taken care of by the market. Uh, the market demands a risk premium. The longer uh, they've loaned money for, the more uh, yield they want to compensate for that. So yields further out on the yield curve are higher. Um, there's more risk. Uh, there's more risk that a default will happen. There's more risk that inflation will change and increase. So inflation is the enemy of bondholders. Bondholders are getting fixed payments generally. We talked about there are variable uh, yield bonds, but generally bonds are fixed payments. Uh, and so when interest rates increase, or when inflation increases, the spending power of that money that's gonna, that fixed amount of money that's coming back drops. So inflation is the enemy of the, uh, of the fixed income holder. And uh, so inflation risk is a lot of what drives the uh, risk or the term premium the higher rates that uh, one gets for uh, being vested further out on the yield curve. So this is just summarizing uh, some of the issues that uh, impact the term premium and the, the slope of the yield curve, how much it changes from the, uh, from the short end to the long end. And again, bond payments are fixed. So higher inflation reduces the spending uh, power and therefore their value. Uh, so inflation is a key issue and um, concern for fixed income investors. So let's just stop now and uh, think about, uh, think ahead, I guess, and uh, think about what a healthy debt market would look like. What, what would be the characteristics of a, of a market in a country that was, that was working and working well for both the investors and the issuers? So bond yields would be higher than inflation. So investors could be earning something uh, over and above inflation if they loaned money uh, to either the government or corporations. Inflation is under control, so I don't have to worry too much about what it's gonna be five or 10 years from now, and I can invest confidently over longer periods. That would mean that the yield curve is sloping gradually upwards. Yield sloping up means uh, possibly that uh, investors have confidence that the economy is gonna be growing. So upward sloping yield curve means uh, growth. An inverted yield curve is often a sign of a potential recession, uh, as you may know. Um, buy, you can buy bonds uh, quickly and sell them quickly. So especially uh, government bonds, you should be able to sell and buy uh, relatively quickly in a, in a healthy debt market. Uh, there's a lot of uh, liquidity so that uh, you, can, you can make transactions uh, happen within uh, a short time period. So debt issuance beyond 10 years is available. So as an investor, uh, you know, as uh, thinking from my perspective as a pension plan or as an insurance company, as a person saving for your retirement, you'd like to have uh, some longer issue debt available that uh, provides for that time when you actually uh, need the money. So debt issuance beyond 10 years is available. That also means uh, that people have confidence in the economy 
uh, 10 years from now, not worried about, um, not worried about the uh, you know, economy blowing up or inflation blowing up. Um, it also means that the issuers uh, are getting what they want. Issuers would like to borrow over, over a longer term. They'd like to get the money and not have to pay it back for a long time. So if I've got a reasonable yield on a debt beyond 10 years, that's a great thing for the issuers. And then corporations that are using a mix of uh, debt and equity financing for their business are going to be healthy businesses. They can choose their debt and equity uh, proportions in a way that suits them best. Debt is usually cheaper than equity, uh, but debt, uh, too much debt can uh, cause problems, can leverage the company uh, up uh, to too great an extent. So these are just uh, some basic ideas that can kind of help uh, envision what a healthy debt market eventually might look like. So think, again, thinking ahead, here's just a couple slides uh, for a market that's uh, maybe a little bit ahead. Again, I, uh, I spoke to uh, Bangladesh about a year ago and uh, was educating on some of these concepts. And, and here's a, a yield curve from uh, Bangladesh from just a year ago. So you can see a lot from this. So one, they have issues out to uh, 20 years. So that's a nice thing. This is the government bond uh, yield curve. It's a nice upward sloping curve. Um, the middle of the curve there, you can see the 10 year yield is uh, just a little above uh, 6%. Uh, so you know something uh, a little bit about growth and inflation and uh, potentially they don't have equity market there, but uh, uh, you, can, you can see a lot, understand a lot just by uh, seeing this yield curve. Here's another thing then that I'd like to look at when I go someplace is I like to look at the uh, maturity profile of the government bonds uh, that are out in the market. And uh, here you can see on the left, the uh, the maturity at issue. So uh, Bangladesh was selling two-year bonds, three-year bonds, five, 10, 15, and uh, also 20-year bonds. And then <clears throat> over time, after say a 20-year bond is sold, it's, uh, it's, out, it's a maturity, time to maturity is 18 years, 15 years, and so on. So you can see on the right, the uh, maturity of the bonds that were outstanding at the time of this chart. And this is uh, pretty typical that uh, <clears throat> short-term bonds would make up the majority of the uh, issuance that's out and available. Long-term bonds would be less. Um, and just gives you a little sense of, uh, again, what a developing market uh, might look like in terms of its uh, maturity profile. This is, these are the government bonds. All right, let me uh, just check our time here um, and uh, we'll try to charge through some stuff here. So <clears throat> here are some considerations related to government bonds. Uh, these are both for issuers and uh, investors. Uh, institutional investors would have different considerations than individual investors, different times to maturity that they wanted, uh, different levels of yield that they were interested in, uh, different uh, covenant requirements that they're interested in. Individual investors would often be invested in funds, uh, a diversified portfolio of bonds rather than individual bonds. Uh, so there's a big difference there. Central bank may be an investor in uh, government bonds. So the, um, uh, the central bank is buying bonds again to help control the money supply. Uh, government may be uh, lending money to other parts of the government. So they may be money, say, lending money, say, to a social security system. That's the intergovernmental debt. Uh, governments can lend in different uh, currencies. Um, and then inflation indexing. In a, in a country with uh, high inflation, inflation indexing is uh, very important to investors. Uh, if you're a retiree and you're wanting to provide for your retirement, um, having a, a bond that pays 5% when inflation is uh, 6 or 7% is, um, is tough. And especially if you don't know uh, whether the 6 or 7% may, be, may go up or down. So uh, indexing debt is, uh, is, and the considerations around providing that are very important to a government in uh, where inflation is an issue in the economy. Uh, corporate bond investing, I'm just going to skip over this uh, quickly. Um, obviously, uh, uh, significant uh, 
advantages for investors and significant uh, advantages for the issuers as well. Uh, risks related to the bankruptcy of the company um, and uh, just the market perception of potential bankruptcy changes the value of a bond. So let's talk about this a little bit. See, in the corporate bond world, there's really two parts to the yields that, that we're getting. One is defined by interest rates, and by interest rates, we really mean government bond yields. Government bond yields really define the base interest rates uh, in an economy. And then for any particular company that's issuing debt, there's a credit spread above that to recognize the additional risk of the company uh, defaulting. So we think about uh, uh, corporate bond as in uh, corporate bond yield as in two pieces, the interest rates and then a risk premium above that, defining the specific risk for the company. And here's a here's a diagram of the uh, of the uh, credit spread split out even further. So first of all, we're showing that uh, as time increases, as the maturity of the bond increases, the yield is gonna increase. That's just that increasing yield curve idea. So all the different pieces of the yield are increasing as we go further out. Um, but the credit spread is made up, uh, this is a little bit simplistic, but uh, you can think about it as made up as one, uh, compensation for defaults that might happen at the uh, at the corporation where they were not able to pay back uh, a risk premium so over and above the expected value uh, an additional premium paid because there are potential defaults and then a liquidity premium where the uh, corporate bonds are not likely as liquid as uh, the government bonds and therefore uh, there's some extra yield paid by corporations uh, for that reason. So um, that's, uh, that's a breakdown of the credit spread. Here's just a picture of uh, the credit spread as a yield curve, just the difference between the government bond yields and the uh, corporate bond yields. Yield to maturity, so a very important concept uh, here. Yield to maturity is the yield on a bond at any point in time. So we have the yield defined at the beginning when the bond is issued, which is based on the coupons paid and the final payment uh, being made. But if the value of the bond changes as interest rates change, then the yield to maturity is gonna change. So the yield to maturity is no longer equal to the coupon yield it's equal to the coupon yield adjusted for the value of the bond as it uh, changes over time. So understanding uh, this yield to maturity, being able to calculate it and uh, using it to compare different bonds uh, is an important thing in uh, fixed income investing. So leverage, and uh, so we're talking here about capital structure. Uh, the fact that debt is lower in the capital or higher in the capital structure than equity, so it's it's lower risk. Debt investors going to get paid back before equity investors. Leverage is very important. So as corporations borrow more and more, their company gets leveraged more and more. Uh, the good thing about leverage is that uh, the same amount of income results in higher and higher profits the more a company is leveraged. So there's, to some extent, there's a, a incentive for a company to borrow more because it uh, increases their profits, but it's also riskier. Uh, the greater leverage in a company, the more likely it is to go bankrupt when things don't go well. All right, so let's uh, finish up just by talking about uh, some different types of investors and, and kind of how they think about uh, investing in bonds and, and their different perspectives and what they're looking for and um, understand things uh, that way. So obviously yield is a big deal. You, you want to know how much you're getting paid for owning this bond. Uh, we talked about term duration and interest rate risk, inflation, and whether a uh, bond is indexed for inflation. Does the investor have income needs like a retiree or a corporation who just wants steady uh, payments and uh, predictable payments? They have confidence that the payments are going to be made. Uh, credit risk and ratings, uh, very important. We'll talk about those in a second. Um, the, the perspective of an investor investing in individual securities versus an investor investing in a fund are very different, um, very different perspectives on risk and um, 
so, so that's a consideration that's, uh, that's very important. And then uh, liquidity. Here we're talking about covenants and bonds. We just talked about this uh, a minute ago that uh, a corporate bond may have uh, requirements for the corporation, requirements that they need to follow for the bond uh, to, uh, uh, to be valid, uh, may, may need to maintain certain uh, financial ratios in their accounting, uh, limit on other uh, debt they can take on and so on. And then this is also where the call option, uh, where the company can call in the bond uh, when interest rates change is, uh, is there too. So credit ratings, a very uh, important aspect to uh, bond investing. So we have credit ratings for both corporations and for uh, countries, and they work exactly the same way. They're the same scale from AAA down to D, uh, or really D means default. So it's really down to uh, C, AAA to single C ratings. And uh, you can assess the probability of default uh, by understanding uh, the rating. So here we're seeing um, what we have on the, on the y-axis here is probability of default on a bond. So from zero up to 60%. And on the bottom, we have the time horizon. Uh, so as time goes on, there's more and more likelihood that a bond could default. So obviously these lines slope upwards. Um, the greatest potential for default for these uh, triple C, or these are the C rated companies, so the highest risk companies, you can see the risk of default um, in the first year is almost 30%. So very high risk there, whereas for a triple A uh, company or government, the risk of default even over 20 years is almost zero. So, and, and <clears throat> there are lots of statistics uh, to back these up, that these ratings that are given are highly correlated with the uh, probability of default. So understanding the ratings, understanding the level of default. So when we go back to that chart where we looked at the expected rate of default, we can get that from, uh, from these lines. We can see the likely rate of default for bonds that are rated at different levels. We can, all these statistics are out there and available from Moody's or S&P, the different rating agencies that uh, assign these. And uh, we can assess the, uh, the likelihood of default and therefore the credit spread that we'd like to get uh, in compensation for that. All right, so let me um, wrap up uh, with a couple things here. I guess I'll <clears throat> I'll talk about uh, Sukuk, which is uh, really not a bond, but it's uh, essentially the uh, Sharia compliant um, replacement for a bond. And uh, yeah, let's just first let's talk a little bit about Islamic finance and uh, just how it's growing and, and the different aspects of it. Uh, we talked a little bit about um, no interest banking earlier. So Islamic banking is 70% uh, of the whole Islamic finance world. Here you can see uh, the growth in the Islamic finance world over the past uh, uh, 10 years or you know, past uh, six years and then the expected growth uh, going forward. So very big growth in the area. Islamic banking, interest, uh, no interest banking here. Sukuk, so the bonds or uh, uh, the uh, replacement, the Islamic uh, Sharia compliant replacement for bonds, 18% um, of these uh, totals, um, Islamic funds and Takaful, the uh, uh, Sharia compliant insurance, uh, which is more kind of a, uh, uh, cooperative in, uh, type approach to insurance is there. So Sukuk, uh, different from typical bond ownership in that uh, you really own a share of the profits of some project or uh, company rather than just getting paid back a loan uh, that was made because of course interest is, uh, is not uh, allowed under the Shari Sharia principles. 
Um, the value is really determined from the underlying asset rather than from credit ratings and market interest rates. Um, fixed payments, whereas in Sukuk, often the payments vary with the asset value. And um, the, way the, the way the structure works often is that the issuer that has the asset or project or business that uh, needs funds sets up a special purpose vehicle. Uh, this vehicle then uh, transfers profits. Um, it's kind of like a uh, asset-backed security um, that we talked about earlier. And the, um, <clears throat> the investors then get a share of the profits. Uh, it may be a, a fixed share, it may be a, a fixed payment that's a share of the profits, or it may be a variable payment. Uh, but the profits come through this, uh, are transferred through the special purpose uh, vehicle. So it's just a way for the uh, issuer to essentially loan money, but then pay it back without, uh, without using interest. All right, so let me just uh, cover one more slide here, which is uh, just some different types of uh, key uh, fixed income investors uh, in developed markets. So insurance companies, uh, number one, they're the big fixed income investors. They have very predictable obligations that they absolutely have to make. So they're very safe in their investing. They use fixed income because they know it's going to make the payments uh, when it's supposed to, and they're going to match that up with the timing of the, their uh, obligations. Same thing with pension plans, although pension plans have a little less uh, formal obligation to make the payments that uh, they're required to. And then provident funds and retirement savings uh, also. Um, so all these different investors have different uh, perspectives on the fixed income they're wanting to buy. Uh, corporations and banks, of course, are, are also a, a fixed income investor and uh, they're gonna be concerned with asset liability management, just like insurance companies and pension plans are. So a lot of the big institutional investors are very concerned about this uh, timing of the payments and the, uh, the coordination of that timing of payments with the obligations that they have to their uh, to either their depositors or their customers or their uh, participants in a pension plan. And so with that, I'll, uh, I'll wrap things up. I'll just say a couple words on this last slide because it goes back to a point I made earlier that an investor in fixed income can have one of two perspectives. They can either uh, hold a bond to maturity and not be worried so much about how the value of the bond is changing uh, over time, or uh, they may be interested in trading the bond for something that's more valuable um, or for whatever reason, uh, uh, selling the bond at some point, in which case they would account for it <clears throat> as available for sale. And uh, they are very interested then in changes in interest rates and how the value of the bond is changing over time. At the end of this uh, slide, there's some, or the deck, there's some resources uh, to go to uh, for more information on bonds and um, how to use them, how to analyze them and so on. So I'll uh, leave it at that and we can have questions in the uh, Q&A period. Thank you. So Evan, with all my power given to me, I, we can take one, one burning, burning, very short, short question. It's a bit, see, I, I see a hand shooting up. So let me give it to one very short, right? Okay. <laughs> Hi, uh, thank you. My name is Merit from Pragma Investment. I'm, uh, I have one very short question. Uh, how does uh, uh, monetary policy work in environment of Islamic finance? When you use Sukuk type of bonds, are you clearly explain? I'm very much curious to see how you know the Saudi Arabians, the Middle East conduct monetary policy by using Islamic financial instruments. Yeah, well, I have to say that uh, that's uh, something I'm not familiar with. It, it's, uh, I don't know that monetary policy really could be implemented in any uh, effective way with Sukuk or Islamic finance because 
it's all it's all about interest rates. I mean, uh, monetary policy is all about interest rates, and um, interest is uh, what Sukuk is uh, trying to avoid. So I'm not aware of a way, or uh, haven't heard of, uh, and as as a Sharia compliant way for a central bank to uh, to control the economy in that way. Okay, like I said, a very short one which is going to bring a lot of conversation for the latter stage as well. So I think we need some energizers. So we have coffee ready, uh, but we're going to make sure that the time is a bit lower. We're going give to give you 15 minutes instead of 30, and we'll have you back after 15 minutes. You can grab your coffee and come back as well if that's needed. Thank you. With the amount of clinking that was happening to call you all back, I assumed few glasses have been broken. So it's good to, to have you back all smiling now after the coffee. Uh, I see one, two late bloomers sitting down. Okay, so before I introduce uh, my second speaker for the afternoon, uh, which then leads us to the Q&A where we would be having an engaging question and answer session. I want you uh, to help me thank Evans uh, for his excellent presentation. I know we did not have time, but I, I really would like to have a hand for him one more time. As Mike has said, uh, because Evans' presentation was fully loaded and uh, it was not enough time, uh, we would make sure to share the slides as well, and hopefully have it uploaded on that academy that we've promised as well. Um, with that, let me introduce uh, Mr. Paul Gucheru, uh, Executive Director and Chief Investment Officer, NCBA Investment Banking, uh, who would be sharing with us some uh, few points around fixed income trade and portfolio management. Here you go. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. I think uh, the challenge I have today is actually I'm sitting between you and going home. Eh? So I'm very sure most of us will want that I finish that fast, and I'll try to do that as fast as possible. Um, Evans, thank you so much for making my work even easier, because I don't think I'll talk about the fixed income uh, market at all. What I'll do, I'll focus on a small piece of information uh, regarding uh, the role of uh, fund managers as far as uh, deepening uh, the fixed income market is concerned. Um, but before I do that, maybe just a bit of introduction. Um, my name's as said, Paul Gishero. I think that second name is said differently by different people. Uh, but the Kenyan way is uh, Paul Gishero. Um, I'm working at uh, NCBA Investment Bank and uh, privileged to actually be performing the role of a chief investment officer in our fund management division or a division we call wealth management. Um, so the conversation I was, want us to have today is really the opportunities and how we see uh, this whole space playing and the excitement that for some of us in fund management have to hear that uh, you know, Ethiopia is eventually getting a, a stock exchange. Because for someone playing in my space, this means more and more opportunities. And I want to believe that by the time we're done with this conversation, all of us will see the resultant opportunities 
by what uh, you know uh, what what's happening in this market. So maybe to start is off uh, is to ask uh, all of us whether you know and this is introspection what we understand by the role of a fund manager, uh, whether a fund manager means the same thing to all of us. Uh, in my yester life, uh, a fund manager meant someone was given money by donors to manage. And the idea was uh, you get uh, 100 million dollars, disburse that money and account to the donor. That is one definition of a fund manager. But the definition I want to focus on here is to focus on the, the fiduciary role or the role of trust that is entrusted to someone. In this case, um, you have your money and you want to look for someone to take care of that money. And the, the reason we are doing this uh, is, uh, if you, as you can imagine, uh, Ivan has given us a very good presentation. Can you imagine that last person on the street trying to understand some of these concepts? you end up losing uh, you know, a good chunk of people and they may never get a chance to actually appreciate what these investment solutions are that ESX is bringing about. I mean, tell someone on the street that uh, you need to look at the duration before you buy a bond. I mean, they can't even tell what exactly you're talking about. You need to look at the yield, what exactly are those things? So what a fund manager does uh, in the market is to take care of the interest of those investors by creating that link that they need to the market. So I come, I have my money, I don't know how to invest it, I entrust a fund manager to actually do that for me. And uh, that can happen at very, very, very many different levels. And uh, with that, just to highlight, uh, for example, what we are doing at, uh, at, uh, at, at, at NCBA. Now, I've just put four, you know, four, 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 four bits there to just illustrate what, for example, fund managers do to help the market. And I hope with this, we can start illustrating what opportunities are there for us as business practitioners to actually take advantage of the development that's coming into this market. So at the first, uh, in the first, uh, what do you call a six-sided chip? Thank you. For those who remember, I, I would never have described it. I was about to say Pentagon. And but then I remembered uh, I'm heading to the US in that case. So <laughs> I would ignore. So the first sector, we had, there's something called unit trust funds. And elsewhere, these are called mutual funds. Elsewhere, these are called collective investment schemes. So what happens in the market? If you go to, for example, to the rural uh, Ethiopia, there are so many people who may have some bit of money that they can invest. But because of the way the market is structured, those people cannot access the market. They may want, for example, when Ethiopia eventually launches uh, a fluid treasury bill market, a fluid bond market, they may actually want to get that to that market. But unfortunately, because of limitations, they are not able to. If I give an example, for example, from my own country, if I want to buy a treasury bill in Kenya, I need, let me just say it in Kenya shillings, I need 100,000 Kenya shillings. And for simplicity, I'll say $1,000, just using the old miles we used to do. We used to divide everything by 100, and it was very easy that way. I need $1,000. If I need to buy a treasury bond, I need, what is half of that? I need $500, for example. Now, not every person can afford to have that money readily. And so these people, unfortunately, for major reasons, are not able to access these markets. Uh, the other way, you look at it, even for us in this room, if you are salaried, the way your money comes, uh, it comes in bits. And when it comes, um, I'm paid 100. By the time I know what to save, uh, I've lost 70 and I'm left with 30. I can't access the market that readily because of the quantum of money that I'm having. So what is happening with unit trust funds? They actually allow the unitization of some of these investments that governments are issuing. So that uh, if the government has issued treasury bills of whatever uh, quantums, and the minimum investment is 100,000. All I'm telling you is that all of us in this table, can we put our money together and we all access the market? And we're able to start buying some of these investments that could not be accessible. Now, the person who has the least amount of money, unfortunately, is also always disadvantaged because think about it. If they come to your bank and ask for a deposit, if you come with a, you know, a thousand bar, is it bar or bill? Bar then uh, you probably don't even get a, you know, a, deposit, a deposit investment. So unit trust funds come to, or collective investment schemes come to help these people come together 
And as an investment group, then are able to get exposure to some of these investments. Now, those roles are performed by fund managers. So you can see almost a long hanging fruit here that as soon as this market is launched, you can actually set up a potential fund management business that start putting all these people together. I mean, you have a good, a decent population of 120 million people, whatever that number, I could be very wrong. But can we start thinking about the opportunity that results to actually bring this to the market? And what that does is then it gives you a very good chance to depend the market and as fast as possible and make sure that everyone is accessing these opportunities. The second section here, uh, private institutional wealth, this focuses on uh, what you call the more high value customers or high net worth investors. This is someone who can afford to invest in large quantums. But for one reason or another, they are too busy even to focus on the market. All, whatever their, their, their space in life, thinking about duration, thinking about coupons and all those things is not the last thing you're thinking about. So what you do as well is you can actually create managed investments on, this, on behalf of these people. And uh, the underlying investments that you're putting in their portfolios will be these bonds uh, that uh, will be issued, will be these treasury bills, and whatever other available investments will be coming about. And then there's, of course, the retirement uh, benefits management. Retirement benefits here is uh, all of us one day, um, and it happens so fast, huh? shall retire from our eight to five, we shall need to have packed some money somewhere. Uh, that money needs to be invested prudently. So mostly by regulation, uh, you are required to put that through a fund manager as an institutional uh, investment manager. That person or that institution by law is required to manage that prudently to ensure as much as possible but that by the time you get to retirement, then you actually have a safety net that will take you to retirement and can replace some of the income you'll have lost in the process of employment. Um, and then you'll have some other people who may have the information, but they just want to take the risk. They just want someone to take them to the market. And the reason is because even here, even here, he's probably very busy doing what he does every day. But you just need someone to actually facilitate you in taking these transactions to the market. I want to buy 10 million of a bond. Can I get someone to facilitate me uh, to do that? So that is what we call execution. And it can be done uh, at, a, for example, a securities broker level. It can be done at a fund manager level. Now, when you look at all these, um, for me, this, this is an opportunity as far as business is concerned. Because for... As, as, as a business, for us, we are actually earning substantial or meaningful management fees for doing this kind of business. So it behoves on all of us then to start seeing the opportunity that's likely to result uh, as this market rolls out so that we can, uh, you know, we can also amplify the kind of returns that we are get, getting from our businesses. I'll, you'll see me skipping uh, very fast through some of these slides. Eh? Um, because what, what I want us to focus on is uh, really what roles that we are really doing in this market and in depending the market as fund managers. So I gave an, an example of a quanta, someone who wants to access the bond market, but because of quantum, they cannot access the market. I gave an example of someone who don't have the space in terms of uh, you know, knowledge and experience to actually access this market. So what does the fund manager actually do? The fund manager plays a very important role for the market in terms of what we call intermediation, which is what I've said. Because at some point, um, you actually want to take a transaction in the market, but you don't have either the, the, the right quantum or the right you know, route to actually take that transaction in the market. We also play the role of uh, what we call aggregation. Aggregation means, as I was talking about earlier, small, small amounts, put them together and take that transaction to the market. And what that does is that uh, you really work on creating some kind of uh, trading opportunities, a growth in the secondary market of the market, so that once the government issues, for example, whatever security is an issue, once a corporate issues securities, then those securities can actually be fairly liquid through capacity to actually trade them. Uh, in an open market. Those are some of the roles that, uh, you know, fund managers are, you know, fund managers are doing and really helping the market, you know, uh, to grow deeper, you know, deep, deeper and deeper. But to actually, for this to actually happen, um, there are processes that goes into it, there are expectations that uh, we have as a market. Um, so what you're looking at uh, for a potential, you know, deepening of the fund management industry 
is actually having diversity in terms of our investors. And this is something that the market always looks for. So if I give an example, for example, in, a, in the Kenyan market, our market is uh, dominated by banks. The second players in, bar, in our market is pension funds. The third level of players could be insurance companies, and then the rest of us fall, you know, you know, fall, 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 fall it, you know, in, in that lower category. Now, the only challenge you have with that uh, kind of a market is banks will uh, invest for a particular objective. And unfortunately, most of those objectives are very homogeneous. So that banks are either investing for liquidity or to diversify their lending risk and all that. So, for example, sometimes I see, and I think it's a, a reality of the current uh, times that you're living, banks are all investing in short-term securities just because of how the markets are looking. So what you end up with is that uh, if there's anything long-term, then there's no, there's no meaningful market as far as that section is concerned because everyone is looking at the same kind of securities. Pension funds, on the other hand, uh, should be investing in the long term, but because of how fund managers at times are evaluated for their performance, they have also moved the short-term market. So that everyone is actually focusing on the same market. Insurance companies should be long-term, especially depending on the kind of business that you're managing as far as, as an insurance company, but also those because of the challenges you're having uh, fall back to the short-term short market. Now, that homogeneity or equal similar approach across all investors really challenges uh, you know, the growth in the market. So then the most ideal situation a market can actually be in is in a place where you are able as much as possible to diversify the kind of investors. And uh, that's how you see for us, then you're saying, if I can bring in the so-called collective investment schemes where the investment approach could be different, if I can bring in high net worth investors whose approach could be different. If I can bring this, all these type of different types of investors, then you're actually increasing diversity and kind, different kind of opinions as far as approaching the market is concerned. So that we are not all moving as one hat. And you also get opportunities to create liquidity when you want, to exit an investment when you want, uh, you know, and all that. Then market needs uh, the right kind of, uh, you know, regulatory environment. And I think uh, that for Michael is certainly something that, uh, you know, that I'm sure you're working well. And the idea here is to make sure that uh, if I get into a trade, that trade will be completed without any hitches. And I think one thing that I think I, I really would say I like about the Kenyan market, in terms of the settlement process or trade completeness, that is working very well. I don't think, I mean, in my many years of practice, I don't think I've had a chance where, you know, a situation where, for example, central bank did not work. Fund managers are really looking for that to make sure that uh, as you ensure, rather, as you and trust me with your money that I'm very sure the capacity to complete transactions is even easier to deliver. Um, then of course, the concern of efficiency. Efficiency here means uh, what is the transactional cost that I have to bear? What is the market impact that I have to bear every time I'm doing a trade in the market? So that um, if it's too expensive to buy a bond, if it's too complicated to buy a, a treasury bill, that investment becomes useless in a big way. I need easy to access investments, accessible in quantums that make sense to me. The cost and process should actually make sense. Otherwise, some of the reasons that some of our markets are not developing that fast, huh? it is that friction that sits within the process so that you're not able to come in and out. And I know a lot of uh, African markets are struggling with that to some extent in terms of the fluidity and the cost and the cost of efficiency as far as the market is concerned. So those are things that uh, I truly believe because, uh, you know, um, as we said, Ethiopia is in a privileged position, can actually be dealt, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know at, at the early stage as, uh, as you develop the market. So how, how is a fund manager uh, business organized? Or how do fund managers organize, uh, organize, organize themselves? Remember, what a fund manager does is a, is a position of trust. And uh, I bring this in the conversation about fixed income because <laughs> taking an example, I think I take, taking Kenyan market, for example, any portfolio that you are building in the Kenyan market is probably upwards of 60, 80 percent in the fixed income market. So the dependability, the reliability of the fixed income market becomes very important. But the decision as to what the fund manager wants to invest in is actually what the process, uh, you know, what, what is driven by the process. What am I saying here? 
So you come in and trust me and tell me, Paul, I want you to manage my, my investment. Uh, and all I need for you is the next 10 years deliver a return of X percent. So what I'll have to do is to actually think about what ropes or what role I actually play to actually make sure I can deliver that 10%. That 10%. So it starts by one, I need to analyze the market and understand where the market is. I need to analyze the opportunities and just figure out what opportunities can give me uh, you know, that return, eh? while at the same time ensuring that I have adequate liquidity to meet your, for example, your, your needs as an investor. So the law of a, uh, you know, a fund manager is really to actually sit and think, this is the objective for which I've been given uh, as far as this, you know, the client, the, the investor is concerned. Where do I get the right assets to meet that objective? How do I layer those assets such that without taking too much risk, uh, you know, we are meeting the objective that the client has actually set and then continuously managing that. Now, the process of managing that entails having, you know, uh, for example, having an investment committee that actually sets the overall risk, you know, the risk parameters, you know, that uh, one wants to work with. Once the investment committee says the overall risk parameters, opportunity parameters that you can work with, then that hands over to actually what we call an investment manager. The investment manager is the person now responsible for saying, you know what, yeah? for this portfolio, this is how actually we're going to, you know, concretize the investment process that is either laid out by the agreement with the client or the parameters that are laid out, uh, you know, by, by the investment, in, 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 uh, investment committee. Then after that, they take these transactions to the market. And taking that transaction to the market uh, takes the role of, a, of an investment dealer. Now, the investment dealer is actually the face of a fund manager as far as accessing market is concerned. So what the dealer does, they collate all these investment decisions uh, by the investment managers and go and look for the right securities to actually purchase. And uh, for, a, you know, for, a, for a fixed income investor, uh, those certainly will be how much do I want to allocate, for example, to treasury bonds? How much do I want to allocate to fixed deposits? How much do I want to allocate to corporate bonds? How much do I want to allocate to these other uh, potential investment opportunities? Um, so as you can see, then, the more there is diversity of potential investment opportunities, the more there is the likelihood that the investment manager is appointed or the, yeah, or, or, yeah, or the fund manager is appointed will actually be able to meet their particular objectives. And that's probably how then the fund manager ensures that they are meeting the particular needs of their clients. But uh, these fund managers certainly need uh, to have a good level of, you know, the, the requisite skills to actually be able to do that. Um, now, there's a technical skill, of course, uh, for, the fund, for the fixed income market is really what, uh, you know, what Ivan was talking about. But beyond that, uh, what other skills do I actually need to deliver, uh, it deliver on this opportunity? I need to be uh, in a good way. I, I need to be a good negotiator. Because, uh, for example, as a dealer, uh, we take you to market every day and you actually have to go and negotiate deals. Um, either through uh, brokers or directly, for example. If, for example, I was placing in, a, in, a, in an unlisted uh, security, which may, may, may be a case, then I need to be able to negotiate good enough to actually be able to get the best deal that I can actually deal. If I'm placing money in a bank, for example, then I need to make sure that as much as possible, I get the best kind of return that I can actually uh, get. It needs to be a good networker. Networker here um, is because if there's a good place to actually get trading ideas, Trading ideas come from dealers. Because these are people who speak to everyone in the market. And their work is really to figure out uh, what is this person doing? What is happening there? What is the psyche of the market? What opportunities can we actually see? And those are skills that uh, will be very important even in ensuring that the market thrives even the more. Networking skills, developing trading ideas, and uh, also have a very good knack for details. Really, this is actually someone who can actually tell this is a bad deal just by looking at it. Eh? You know, there are people who are that, that, that fast. They look at deals and say, this one, kill it. It doesn't make sense. And they will give you a very quick reason. And those are the capacities that will help even in ensuring that eventually when this market is rolled out, that you are actually uh, milking as many opportunities as possible and avoiding 
uh, risks that you are not willing to take. Uh, because eventually you have to calibrate the kind of risk that you want to take and make sure that you actually uh, live within that space. Um, so that is what I was talking about earlier in terms of process, uh, where the process starts, the investment committee sets the themes of investments, the investment managers take over from there to actually decide how those themes reflect on the portfolios that they're managing. And then uh, the dealers are sent to the market to actually look for, you know, for, for the transactions. And then it is these dealers who then interact with the market. Now, how it works from a fund management business, um, they will face potentially uh, the, what we call the sell side dealers. So as a fund manager, I've appointed someone to go and look for these deals for me. But to face the market, then they'll meet, say, brokers, all placement agents who they'll actually negotiate with. And then they can use those securities to actually complete, you know, uh, complete the trading transactions. And within that, they also do a lot of risk management because they have to ensure that, uh, you know, all these trades are fully completed. The documentation is complete because I think we were talking about documentation much earlier to make sure that uh, whatever could happen after that, that every party in the transaction is completed. And for the fixed income market, that could be a contract, that could be... That, that could be a, getting a contract, that could be, you know, agreements, that could be making sure that settlement has happened and that everyone knows. And then they communicate with the, what, what you call the, you know, the middle office to ensure that all the risks are always managed. So as you, as you notice, I'm actually avoiding uh, spending too much time on these slides because I'm very sure these slides will actually be, you know, available for all of us to actually look at. But suffice, suffice to say, um, there are some, so many experiences that we actually get uh, you know, fr 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 from being in the market that can be of much benefit uh, to, to this market. Um, just to highlight, I think, uh, what for me stands out is um, ensuring that over time, you have one um, variety of issuers and a variety of investors. Variety of issuers will ensure that uh, you have, you know, you have a good mix of assets. You come to Kenyan market, it's 99% government. Uh, if you're looking at for listed securities, only a very small portion is a corporate, you know, uh, corporate, corporate issuers. What can you do to actually incentivize these people to actually really come to the market? That would be a very interesting conversation to look at. And eventually, uh, you know, ensuring that over time, liquidity is actually grows. That makes the market the more suitable uh, for would-be uh, fund managers. So I think uh, just to close it, um, I would say if you're sitting in this room and evaluating an opportunity, then uh, there's a real opportunity here to actually set up a fund management business, a broking business, an issuer's business. There's a lot that you can actually do uh, from this perspective. So even as you look at this evolving, then the question is, what role do I actually want to play? And I think there's a massive opportunity that we all should be positioned to take advantage of. So allow me to leave it at that. Um, I know <laughs> time is always never, you know, uh, on our side. Yeah? But I truly hope that, uh, you know, that puts a bit of light as to what role fund managers are actually playing in this space. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Paul. Um... So I think for us to have the Q&A and for us to continue with the next session, I will be calling upon uh, the next moderator, Mr. Joseph Atta Mensha. Am I correct in saying this? Okay. <laughs> Principal Policy Advisor, Microeconomic and Governance Division from uh, ECA to the stage. And please give a warm hand for our moderator. <laughs> I'm stealing one minute from Joseph because um, I have one announcement from the team. Uh, the attendance sheet for the afternoon is actually going around, so kindly sign before you head out. So Joseph, back to you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I hope you are well energized and uh, from the tea and coffee or whatever you had. Um, it's been an interesting session since the morning. And I think ECA is very happy and very proud to be part of this organization. And I think throughout the morning and this afternoon, I think a lot of sunk in. But what they didn't tell you 
is that there were going to be an exam. So please, study hard, to, <laughs> study hard tonight. Tomorrow there'll be an exam. Paul was very detailed and uh, he skipped a lot of things anyway. So, but Evans is easy. And Mike, you are brilliant. So everybody absorbed whatever. And, and uh, with uh, Victor, yours is a cakewalk. <laughs> anyway, just um, look, the point is what we've uh, um, um, learned today um, is to me, uh, epitomizes why we need capital markets. Why do we need capital markets? And I just want to say that the most important thing why you need capital markets, because let's, for instance, we are from village. I mean, I'm a village boy, okay? So you have, you grow uh, corn, right? You grow corn and you feed your family. But then you realize that all of a sudden you need, the neighbor wants more uh, uh, corn from you, right? The next neighbor also needs more corn from you. But you realize, I'm taking you, for those of you who've done um, a little bit of finance in the classroom, the Robin Crusoe ride. That's what, I'm, that's what I'm driving at, Robinson Crusoe. So your neighbor wants also the corn, but you realize that you can't because your family is there. So how can you do that? So there's somebody who comes in, Mike walks in and says, look, I'll give you some money. You can buy more seedlings. Right, and then you pay me later. You get more corn. You feed your family, and then you get to feed the others. They would sell. You can sell that. So the point I'm trying to drive here is that a government may not have enough to be able to provide the infrastructure that you need because it's limited by how much it can tax you. Right, the government is limited by how much it can tax you because you cannot work and give everything to the government. Right? So therefore, the government have to look elsewhere for money. One of the places that he can go, he can say, I can go to the IMF or the World Bank. But the World Bank says, you are not doing well. So I'm not going to give you the money or I'll give you with conditions attached or something, right? But then you look around, you see rich people in this country, they don't know what to do with their money. How much can you eat, you know? You can have, how much entertainment can you use your money for? After a while, you need something, a return for your money. So the government says, okay, I want to provide this for my people. I can't get it from the World Bank. I cannot tax enough. So let me bring something called an IOU, right? A bond is just an IOU. It's nothing that an IOU is just, you go to somebody's house, they give you a piece of paper and it promises you that you pay something. It's an IOU. So the government says, ah, you have a lot of money. You can only build one house. You can only feed your, your family so much. So give me excess of your money. And what would I do with it? At the end of the day, I would pay you back, but I'll give you some return. So that is what the capital market is about. That is what the capital market is about. So you see, I've taken you from the Robin, Robinson Crusoe world, from the village, to what it means about Capital markets. The other thing too, which is most important to be to 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 be more eloquent and elegant in saying that, you know, capital markets are needed so that the private sector can channel their excess uh, excess resources that they have, which they don't need for consumption. Right. So that is what it is. So it is. It helps also companies to mobilize additional resources for what I just said for what they want to do it. Because what is a company? A company uh, asset is made up of what? The equity, which I think we'll talk about it tomorrow, and bonds. That's the value of a company, right? So equity are those who own the company and bonds are the additional funds that you bring in. There's so much that you can get from equity. So you have to break it up. You have to expand. So you bring in bonds. So that uh, creating the market helps that. One thing I think is not been mentioned today, and I'll, be, I'll, fi I'll finish and I'll shut up, is that we should also understand, and I think Mike, Victor, Ivan, and Paul, and all that, one thing you didn't mention is the capital markets. Having a capital market in your country helps to alleviate poverty, or I like the better way to increase wealth. 
right? Increase wealth. Why do I say that? Mike, Paul, wear a good suits, right? Very expensive suits. What it does is that the capital market needs who? They need the skills of Mike. They need the skills of Paul. They need the skills of uh, Victor. They need the skills of Ivan. So what I'm saying is that because of the fact that it's a specialized skill, a country then therefore has to invest a little bit more, right? In terms of the professionals and the skill sets that are needed for that. That is only on the human resource side. On the other side too, who are those who are the drivers? You need the IT guys, right? Because the platform, you said you are going to do, Mike said he managed 12 billion with only three people, it's IT. So therefore what happens? You have to bring in IT. The IT also needs skills people who understand. So overnight, the skills, those in technology will make money. Those who have the skills to do the financing will make money. Then what is left? After they make this money, they have to entertain themselves, right? So all of a sudden, there is a, a lounge which will pop up. They, not, they need to have great food. So a restaurant will pop up. They need to drive nice cars. They don't like my car. They want Mercedes. So he will be driving, uh, uh, what do you call it? The S-Class or something like that, right? So all these things, what does it do? It helps the country to push up its wealth. GDP grows, everybody is happy. A lot of people are pushed out of the, uh, of, 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 of what do you call it, the poverty line. So one of the aspects why you need, I said you need good, uh, good professionals. Now, what we also didn't mention is that the professionals also, who do you need? Mike tells me he's going to give me 10 cities, uh, 10 uh, uh, burr, right? I have to return it tomorrow, but I need, he has to be assured that I'll pay. So what do you, who do you need? You need a lawyer to write a contract, right? So all of a sudden you would have good lawyers coming in. That is why imagine the Wall Street. Think of the number of people that, right? And Wall Street, how much, how much income it generates for the economy. So for me, I'm, I am coming in from this angle that the reason why I need capital markets is basically to push up the income level of the country. We know what it does and Mike is, these are good people They know what they're talking about in terms of how to facilitate the platform and all that, that's good. But I'm coming in from the point of view is that the capital market is a contributor. It's a contributor in terms of services to GDP. And it's important. So therefore, having, having said that, I'm not giving you a lecture, eh? please don't get me wrong. <laughs> we need, how would we make sure that when you give me money, I can pay you back? We need a stable macroeconomic environment. So inflation has to be stable. That's the guarantee for the uh, uh, for a capital market. The next thing you need, we need our banks to be solid. The financial sector has to be solid to make it happen because you cannot have uh, a fly-by-night uh, bank or a financial institution. It will not work. No matter how hard we try, it will not work. And the third thing that I think we need to make it happen is that we need a robust institutional uh, framework, frame, uh, environment where it's simple, there is respect for law. The rule of law has to prevail so that contracts are enforceable. If contracts are not enforceable and property rights don't work, forget it, it will fail. So having given you this, we have more eloquent people and elegant people who know more about this stuff than me. I just brought another angle to it. Um, I think we would invite back Evans, and I would invite Victor to come back, Paul to come back, and uh, Michael. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. So as we take our seats, um, let me see if I've not left anybody out. Um, okay, well, I don't have anybody. So it seems to me this morning, with all the discussions that took place, and also with in terms of uh, your 
good and uh, elegant uh, presentation on uh, how the fixed market works and all that. It seems that the central bank is very instrumental here because everything that the yield curve comes from the central bank, right? The, the riskless assets. So in this case, for a country like Ethiopia, the question I have, I don't know who wants to take it, is what role must the central bank play in ensuring that this fixed market works? What role should they play to ensure? Mike, do you want to, you, you've, you've traveled around, you said you've been to all, all, all over uh, other African countries. So tell us, what do you think? What is the role? And let's, let's, let's be honest about it. I mean, I'm, I'm a, a foreigner, maybe so, but you will not be arrested, don't worry. So, but let's be, uh, let's be honest about it because what we need is to build a sound ecosystem, right? So you need the central bank, you need the institutional investors so that it injects confidence in the system, right? So what do you think about what should Governor Mamo, if he should have dinner with you today, what would you tell Governor Mamo to do to make sure that your exchange works? I was hoping this would not work. Yeah. <laughs> You're hoping the mic would not work. <laughs> I know, I really think this is a question for all of us. For all of us, yeah, yeah, for all of you, yeah. Uh, that's really hard. Um, I don't want to regurgitate what everyone said, but I think this market cannot work without the central bank being involved. I mean, we see it time and time and time again throughout the world. Uh, the markets take off with when central bank is more involved, both regulatory-wise, but also actually operationally. So doing the open market operations, et cetera, that really drives the market. So for example, the primary dealer system, which I don't think we discussed much today, that increases liquidity significantly. I think Uganda is one example uh, that we've seen where I think in a year or two, liquidity doubled in the treasury bill market just because of a primary dealer system. So I think rules, regulations uh, are very key. And even for our central bank, I think modernizing, uh, Wayne Ashant expanded on it a lot this morning, modernizing the way they conduct monetary policy. It's a benefit really for the country. It's not you know, these are not just commercial interests that we have at hand. And even us, I think as a team, we look at it as, as a citizen. You know, monetary policy helps inflation. It helps inflation come down. Uh, it gives the central bank better control over the economy. So that's why I think we really emphasize it, I think, it, it, amongst ourselves. But there's a bigger overarching goal that the central bank has to play a very important role. And uh, building this market, it won't exist without the central bank. I think Evan's, Evan stated it earlier as well. But in terms of what I would ask Mamo, I don't know. I, I think that's a good question. Just enjoy the food. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, let's just make progress. Let's, yeah, let's get yeah, this started. For sure, I think, for I think sure. that's the first thing I would for say. For sure, for sure. <clears throat> yeah, I'll just add from the uh, perspective of the US that uh, the central bank is a necessary um, entity in the functioning of the capital markets and the economy. They uh, control inflation, they uh, control growth, uh, control uh, employment, and, and so very important. But uh, the central bank can be uh, a problem and uh, it can create uh, solutions and, and help at the same time that it's creating problems. And we've seen that in the Western world, I think, uh, in the developed uh, markets where the central banks of countries have uh, really distorted uh, capital markets. And since we're here talking about capital markets uh, today, I think it's important to understand that and realize that, that the capital markets really work best, I think, when uh, it's really the market forces, it's uh, the investors and the issuers and the corporations and uh, everyone who's really got a uh, stake in the capital markets that's driving the prices and the returns that are happening. And when the central bank is having too big an influence on that, I don't really view the central bank as a market force. The central bank is an external force and the central bank has uh, through its actions uh, distorted the capital markets in the West uh, uh, significantly. It's driven interest rates down, driven asset prices up uh, such that our 
generation, I would say, has experienced uh, returns that are much higher than they should have been and essentially stolen uh, returns, capital increases that should have been uh, the, um, for our children. Um, so the, the, the central bank did a lot of uh, good, drove down interest rates, made money easier, and therefore kept uh, people in jobs, kept food on their tables, kept roofs over their head during COVID, uh, but at the same time had this uh, incredible distorting effect on the capital markets that um, is, uh, is not a good thing. So it's, it's not possible to say the central bank shouldn't have intervened like they did because uh, some good came out of it, but uh, it's important to recognize that, uh, that there's not, it, it's not necessarily all good or all bad. Paul, do you want to come in? Maybe just, just a quick addition um, and just learning from uh, the country I come from. Um, the central bank is actually the issuing agent uh, on behalf of the central government. So that uh, all the treasury bills, all the bonds that are issued are actually uh, issued on behalf of the government. One thing that I've seen uh, with our market is that uh, we keep talking around uh, about developing uh, benchmark bonds, which uh, introduces a level of uh, you know, predictability in terms of how uh, the general interest in development will be. Um, and what sometimes falls off is a capacity to actually stick you know, to the issuance program as far as creating a yield curve and uh, developing good issuances around uh, you know, the benchmark bonds. So at times it becomes very hard for the market uh, to really determine the direction in which interest rates are likely to move in a, at a particular you know, issuance level, just because today we are issuing a, a two-year bond, which is a benchmark bond, the next day we move to a 15-year bond, the next time we move to a 10-year bond, and sometimes and other reopens in between, eh? which really distorts the, the character of the market. So I think if there's any role that uh, a central bank should actually do in terms of establishing some bit of pricing certainty in the market, is actually to establish a very predictable program of issuances that, ensure, that helps the market uh, do, you know, do some kind of price discovery. And then uh, once they do that, they also <laughs> stick to the award. <laughs> I think uh, for those of us from Kenya, we'll tell you, Central Bank will come to the market and say, we are looking for 60 billion. And the next day, they have collected 200, 220 billion. And what that does is to end up disrupting the whole market. Uh, from the banking sector to the investors, to the valuation who are sitting on a bond, that becomes an issue. So some bit of uh, predictability, and maybe just to close that by saying, meaningful level of consultation with market players would really help to actually set the right tempo uh, for issuances in the market. Thank you. Victor? Um, well, I think most of what I wanted to say has been mentioned. So um, probably just to arrange it in, in a more digestible way, in the fixed income has two types of markets. You have the primary market and you have your secondary market. So what is the role of central bank in those two markets? As Paul has said, in the primary market, the role of central bank is to issue those bonds on behalf of the government. Why is that important? If, if Mamo was here, probably is, is, I, would, I would say, yes, it would be very good to consider uh, issuing longer term bonds uh, for Ethiopia. That is self-funding your own uh, budget deficit uh, locally using BIR, and you can raise money uh, locally uh, from these bonds issued in the market uh, to finance any deficit or any cash needs that the government might have. Uh, again, as Ivan has said, there are good and bad uh, that can come out of it, depending on how it is executed. The central bank can easily crowd, crowd out the, pub, uh, the, the private money that is by coming to borrow at very high rates, such that even banks have no more need to give loans to citizens. They just want to give money to the government because it's giving an attractive rate and they don't have to think much about it and they can earn their return, book their profits and go to bed. So there's that negative side. How do you limit that negative side? Is there has to be a proper borrowing program, as Paula said, in the primary market, 
And that particular program must be have certain uh, strategic pointers within it. For example, have benchmark bonds. What will the benchmark bonds do? The benchmark bonds actually help the secondary market because the secondary market gets these dots that help price the market and the bonds as they're happening in the secondary market. So having benchmark bonds and even having market makers or primary dealers, probably not necessary for your market to have primary dealers, but necessary to have market makers. Those are people who uh, will be trading and setting the prices in the secondary market. And these market makers uh, must be probably the central bank can have some sort of agreement with them to ensure that uh, they either are funded or if they need emergency funding or whatever it is to ensure that the secondary pricing of the market uh, continues well. Um, how the central bank faces the market is very key. Having forums where the central bank actually meets with the market probably every month that the governor of the central bank sits with the market to understand what are the pressing needs in the market, what are the challenges, and how can uh, the central bank continue participating in both uh, the primary market and supporting the secondary market. Those kind of forums, consultative forums, are very, very key. The central bank gains a lot from the market as they just sit and have an open discussion. So that would also be very key for the central bank to have such monthly forums with the market, to just hear from the market and, and to get advice also uh, from the market on how to place themselves much better. Uh, of course, the central bank needs to appreciate any infrastructure that comes in, either in the primary market or in the secondary market, to assist it execute its monetary policy well, or any other fiscal policy that it has. For example, issuing of bonds, that's a fiscal, um, it's a fiscal, fiscal mandate that is passed down to the central bank. And the monetary policy, of course, this is uh, through money markets and all that. So having an institution like ESX is very key for the central bank because it actually helps it execute both of its mandates. That is both on the fiscal side and on the monetary policy side. So the central bank should, be, uh, should actually be the biggest supporter to any market infrastructure that comes in to support it, execute its duties well. So the anticipation of course, is that the central bank should be behind uh, the setup of ESX uh, 100%. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, one of the issues here, which we, 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 we need in order for this to work, is that we have to have investors, investor appetite, right? And, uh, from what you've just said about the role of the central bank, which I agree um, with most of the things, except that we should also understand that at times there can be market failures and therefore the government has a role to play when there's market failures, but this is a, for a different debate. By the way, what, what I want to ask you is, in Ethiopia, as you want to set up this, is there an appetite? Is there an investor appetite? to invest in the stock market? Um, yes, I think there is a lot of appetite actually, because one of the things we've spent a lot of time trying to understand is where's the demand gonna come for, sure. from? Um, number one, you know, a lot of us, what we put in the bank, we have 30% inflation, we're earning 7%. So there's not a lot of options in terms of where can I invest you know, a little bit of my money. So that, there's number one. Uh, I think fundamentally there's a lot of demand. And you even see this in the bank shares. I mean, a lot of people in this room know it's better than me. There's so much demand for some of these bank shares that they're trading way higher. And it's informal channels through WhatsApp, Telegram, et cetera. Uh, that's just on the financial sector. N another thing you see is in terms of retail investors. So we've never had a functioning cap. We've never had a capital market, but issuers today, they basically go out and raise money from the public. It's direct. And there's a lot of, a lot of companies in an unregulated market raising a lot of money, actually. And it comes back to kind of the fundamentals. You know, there's excess money, just like we talked about excess reserves at banks, but even as individuals, there's excess reserves 
uh, that you see that people want to invest, et cetera. And then you see it into some companies that are not even well, well regulated, et cetera, flowing into that space. So I think there's a lot of appetite from the investor side. Um, obviously, there's fine details in between, but I think there's a lot of potential uh, in that aspect. And I think just like we said earlier, the economy size, uh, diversification, growth, demographics, all these macro features will, will be presented uh, when you see a capital market. And I think also maybe a proxy for it is if you look at the banking sector growth, uh, I think someone had asked me a question about it earlier. If you look at the banking sector growth, you see all these real estate projects, uh, construction, there is appetite for investment. I mean, it costs you probably more to buy a car in Ethiopia than anywhere else. Yeah, that's and true. that just shows you distortion right there, because you're basically buying a depreciating assets but parking money into it, and I think we paid double, triple the price of cars in Kenya, and that's even accounting for the excess the taxes, it's still very high, uh, real estate the same thing. So there's a lot of pent up demand in my view, so I, I believe there's appetite for it, especially in the in the short term. Well, the reason for higher prices of cars, I think, if you cut down the duties, you get cars would become cheaper. I think. Even accounting for that. Accounting for yes. that. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. Anyway, so Paul, in your presentation, you talked about uh, um, infrastructure bonds. I know you didn't talk about it, but I saw it on the... Uh... So can you share a little bit with us how it works in Kenya and how do you think um, um, Ethiopia can benefit from issuing a, uh, that, that type of bond? Great. Thank you. Um, so... What, what the Kenyan market what, what Kenyan market has done is to segment uh, its uh, garment paper offering um, and do, so focusing on infrastructure bonds what uh, <laughs> the initial intention uh, of issuing infrastructure bonds was actually to raise financing towards infrastructure project and so the presumption here is that uh, you know as you are doing a particular issuance that you actually have a, a list of projects uh, to which th those monies are going. But I think over time that has become quite broad, and uh, unfortunately that money ends up uh, for general, you know, uh, general government uh, get government spending. But from my uh, from my investors' perspective, what they do is that um, they've actually created these bonds that have no tax on them. So the returns that you earn on uh, infrastructure bonds uh, are actually tax exempt, uh, as compared to the other two categories of tax taxable bonds. We have taxable bonds that are above 10 years that are taxed at 10%, and uh, taxable bonds that are below 10 years that are taxed at 15%. So the idea here was to really create an incentive for the market to actually provide long-term funding for the government. And generally, for a long time, these bonds were, were long-term. Of course, I said, I think uh, over time, as uh, you know, the fiscal space changed, uh, you know, that has actually been changing uh, quite a lot. But uh, by their nature, they were very attractive uh, to individual investors, to taxable investors, and to foreign investors, because you will come and inherit, you know, the tax character uh, of those bonds. Um, so in terms of issuance, uh, what the government does, they probably have a bond issuance every, every month uh, of the year, but for infrastructure bonds, you probably see two or three issuances, uh, you know, in a year, um, which also somehow uh, impacts the kind of dynamics as far as the secondary market is concerned as to how those bonds are traded. Thank you very much. Uh, Ivan, um, one of the issues that you presented was uh, uh, asset-backed securities. We are reminded of the financial crisis of 2007, 2008, where it was an asset-backed security precisely the mortgage bar security that brought us down. Do you think Ethiopia is ready for that type of uh, asset-backed security? What would be, again, if you were having dinner with Prime Minister Abe and he's thinking of raising money and he wants to go and talk to his bankers to securitize all the mortgages here and then parcel it off for others to buy or others to own, would you advise him to do that? Yeah, well, I, I'm afraid I don't know Ethiopia quite well enough yet to advise uh, the uh, prime minister, finance minister on uh, what kind of bonds to issue in the country. But, okay, what about Yellen? <laughs> but, Treasure yeah, Yellen. But I, I, <laughs> I certainly have a, opinions on uh, asset-backed uh, securities. I mean, the, the 
the big one, the one that's, uh, I guess, kind of replaced um, uh, mortgage-backed uh, obligations is uh, CLOs, collateralized loan obligations, where business loans are packaged and, uh, and uh, passed on, just as I was describing earlier, in a uh, investment-grade tranche, a little bit riskier tranche, and a, um, and a higher-risk tranche. Uh, so there's new flavors of this. I mean, there's many flavors already, but CLOs are kind of the, the, one, the flavor of the month, the new, uh, the one that's uh, trending up. Insurance companies use uh, CLOs because they get- uh, Can you explain the CLO a little yeah, bit? What CLO, does it stand so for? CLO, so uh, again, the asset-backed securities are packages of uh, some kind of loan. Back in 2008, the collateralized mortgage obligations, the CMOs, were uh, mortgage securities. They were packaged up, and it's just the uh, the money that's being paid back in the mortgages that are passed through to uh, the investors. So it's just uh, taking the money from the mortgage loans, passing them on to the investors, but doing it in this structured way. So passing it to uh, there doesn't have to be just three levels. There could be five levels or seven levels of uh, securities of of risk. And uh, the highest level gets the payments first. So uh, if there isn't a lot of defaults, the highest level tranche is going to get all their payments just as they're promised. But as soon as there start to be defaults, and uh, uh, there's always going to be some defaults, um, you know that there's going to be some defaults and uh, uh, investors, uh, borrowers that aren't going to be able to pay. As soon as there start to be defaults, the lowest uh, tranche is not going to get all the money. Uh, that they're uh, promised, so they're uh, they're they're losing these uh, payments that are supposed to come through to them. So therefore, they start with a higher yield because everyone knows this risk exists. So they start with the higher yield, but if the uh, level of defaults gets too high, then they start to lose money relative to their initial investment. But so you can do this with any kind of loan. You can do it with a business loan. You can do it with a credit card loan. You can do it um, with a commercial real estate loan. You can just take the money, package up a thousand of these loans and start passing the money on to uh, two investors. And by doing that, then the, uh, the uh, issuers get money so they, they don't have to wait for the payments to come back. They, they, get, they have money there right away because someone else is uh, taking on the responsibility to, uh, to get the money back. But so it's, it's a dangerous structure because uh, it's easy for the... Uh, easy for who's ever selling these to the investor to uh, speak a little too highly of, uh, let's say you're invested in the third tranche and uh, you say, well, there's hardly any risk here. You know, all these uh, tranches below you are uh, going to take the defaults first and uh, you, you're going to uh, have to, there's going to have to be a huge level of defaults for you to uh, experience any loss on this. And that's what happened back in 2008. Uh, even the top level investors uh, started to experience uh, losses because the mortgages that were behind them were such poor quality mortgages. So the, the structure itself is a, is a dangerous structure. It's easy to um, lose track of how much risk is in the original uh, loans. Uh, package them up and start selling them in these tranches, and it's easy to lose risk of the original, uh, lose track of the original risk. Easy to get it confused in this uh, tranche system where you're separating all the securities out. Uh, so it's definitely a risky, or a, you know, a, uh, an approach that needs to be treated with care. And uh, you didn't get that care and understanding back in 2008, both with the rating agencies and the way they were rating these tranches and with uh, the investors who are investing in them. Now, I think given that 2008 happened, there's a lot more awareness of uh, this type of security, the type of dangers, the type of risks. Uh, there's better understanding of the way it works. Uh, but there's still the potential for uh, whatever the you know the uh, underlying loan is to in aggregate end up being much riskier than was expected experience a lot more defaults and then ultimately the investors to experience uh, much greater losses than they expected so I think there's better understanding 
uh, maybe less risk than there was because of what we learned through 2008, but still um, something that needs to be, uh, you know, treated with uh, care and respect and, um, and not, uh, don't go too far with it. Okay, so one more question uh, for the panelists and then I'll come to you. I've not forgotten you. Um, Victor, you are from Kenya, right? So you, you go to outside Nairobi, you will have an old man who is a farmer and he invites you over for Nyamachoma and Insima or something like that. And as you are enjoying the food, he asks you, Victor, I hear you are in Nairobi. You are advising people and you've gone to even Ethiopia to advise them to set up um, a, a, a capital market. So for me as a farmer, what can I get from it? And Ruto will ask you that I need my votes. And it's the people in the rural areas that will give me my votes. So with this, it appears to me, what you have set up is only for the rich. So what about me, the poor person, as you are enjoying the Nyamachoma and the beer and all that? What would you tell this man? Well, that's a good question. Um, and let me, let me attempt to give it a shot. Uh, first of all, I like Nyamachoma, so... I, I also do. <laughs> <laughs> so definitely, this is a conversation. I will sit comfortably and make sure I finish my meal. Uh, but yes, so um, there are several angles to this. As a farmer, um, this particular farmer uh, needs certain inputs for his farm. Uh, he needs good quality seed. Uh, he needs fertilizer to plant his seeds. Uh, and he also, depending on if he's a large scale or small scale farmer, he might need some mechanized equipment or tools to actually help him uh, do the first phase, which is the planting or preparing of his farm. Now, this needs capital for him to actually do whatever he needs to do. Uh, and that means the farmer actually needs some access. He, he might not have enough credit, especially we know the cost of fertilizer and cost of all these inputs. He might actually need a place where he will access this particular uh, credit to be able to do that farming that he needs to, to do. So um, he might, for example, go to a company that hires tractors or has certain farm equipments that he needs to till to prepare the farm. This company is a corporate or a small business or SME or enterprise that was actually able to raise money in the capital markets by either issuing a corporate paper or a bond to fund its equipment and its purchase of its equipment uh, since it didn't have any security then but had a very good business plan. Uh, to buy this tool and was able to sell its business plan. So now the farmer is able to access and lease this equipment from this enterprise that actually was able to raise capital through uh, the capital markets. So that's first of all, a direct effect to the farmer. For the fertilizer, fertilizer, uh, depending on if it's, if it's Kenya, we import a lot of, most of the fertilizer is imported. And for the import, you need, as you know, you need to buy it in bulk. You need to buy a whole ship or something uh, for, for that particular level. So you'll have a big, large company that actually will be buying that particular fertilizer. This company could also have funded itself through the capital markets or could have gone to a bank which was able to fund it, but the bank is able to access that liquidity to fund this guy through uh, either import, uh, uh, facilities or give the, the, the import company a line because they could access money through the money markets. They could use their treasury bills to borrow money and all that. So the bank is able actually to raise enough liquidity in the money market to be able to fund this company to import this fertilizer since the bank knows the fertilizer will land within three months and within those three months, this company will be paid and it will have money back. So again, the farmer is able to access fertilizer because of these capital markets. When it comes to harvesting and the farmer has harvested and needs uh, to deposit uh, this, uh, say he planted wheat 
and the wheat he has put in a warehouse, but it is not sold yet. So what he's received is a warehouse receipt, but doesn't have the money. And yet his children are going back to school. school. He needs school fees. Uh, he has a wedding coming up for his nephew. He has, you know, he has all these financial needs that he, he needs to, to help. So he needs to unlock part of his cash of the wheat that has been deposited in the warehouse. He can actually walk in and trade that warehouse receipt if the capital market is developed enough for him to start trading those, for, for, for the market to be able to trade the warehouse receipts. So you have an agent who buys the warehouse receipts, pulls them and trades them now in the market because you actually have the stock of wheat which can be audited and verified. That is this amount of kilos or tons that has been stored and therefore those receipts start trading. So you now have all those things that start happening. I have, no, I have no doubt that you'll be invited for another Nyamachoma because yeah, you've, you've, you've really explained it. And this is the point, I think, Mike, when you are selling this, to really reach out for people to understand that it is not only for the banks, right? It is a way that it would uplift all of us. You know, brilliant explanation be given by Victor on this as to the role, how the farmer can benefit over Nyamachoma, you've explained to him, he'll be a very happy man. Now, I, I now the how, how many minutes do you have? Uh, how many minutes? Please control it. Eh? Uh, you, so, you control the time. <laughs> so, how many questions do you want? I'm sorry. The, you know, the that, session uh, was so engaging, yeah. and with even taking me to a movie, The Big Shot, uh -huh. I lost track of time as an MC, so I apologize. <laughs> we literally are out of time, but we can take one round of question just yeah. to ensure that it's fair. Okay. And then so I say, leave it to you to close it. Okay, so three questions, maybe? Three Who, very short questions, short, yes. Precise, <laughs> precise questions. Okay, so. Any questions? I have one hand the, there. There's a gentleman here. Okay. And it's uh, equal opportunity. So the women, the next one should be a woman. Okay. <laughs> Please be brief, sir. Be brief, sir. Okay. Go ahead, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, my name is Das Salim from Commercial Bank of Ethiopia. But as a moderator said, worried about the farmers, that's good. But my issue is for the new entrants of bankers and investment bankers. Uh, my question for the panelists is, what are the major challenges as a new entrant? that we should consider for the new markets. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any lady, any lady wants, uh, there's a lady over there. Okay. Okay. I'm tempted to give to another lady <laughs> because uh, men are dominating. The panelist is very, you know, I am, you can see them, you know? So women have to participate. Yes, madam, briefly. Hi. Hi, I'm Kofi from ECA. Um, my question is, uh, how can farmers raise capital from the capital market? What are the intermediaries that help farmers raise capital? Any other lady? Any other lady? So we cannot be accused of uh, not being gender sensitive. Okay, one more question. One more question. His A gentleman over here, off. please okay. be brief since uh, we have to go and uh, queue for uh, taxes okay. to go home, so. Uh, thank you, I am Stefanos from the Capital Market Authority. Can you speak up a little bit, sir? Okay, I'm from the Capital Market Authority. Uh, my question is uh, related to the tax policies, tax policies on uh, income from uh, fixed income securities. So how does the cap, uh, tax policies uh, impact the uh, development of uh, the fixed income markets. Uh, just to give you some context, uh, in Ethiopia currently, uh, government uh, fixed income securities are free from any tax, whereas uh, income from corporate bond investment is taxed at a 10% rate, and while the simple bank deposits are taxed at a rate of 5%. So 
how do you see how do you see uh, this distinction between uh, deferred fixed income securities uh, to affect you know the development of the particularly the corporate uh, bond investment and also uh, currently uh, there is no uh, a pass through tax arrangement for investment funds so how how do you, do you see this uh, impacting uh, investment funds uh, working on uh, money markets funds like or other fixed income okay thank you very much thank, thank you very much so three questions and all of you should take it if you can but then you i give you how many minutes do we have so i want to give them one minute to wrap up so i can give them how many minutes can i give them two per person okay great so we have eight minutes oh good good so um we have the question one is new entrants new entrants into the um, uh, financial market how can a farmer access the market and the last one being the impact of tax policy. And as you answer the question, you can wrap up with your closing remarks, whatever you want to say. So let's start with Mike and then Paul and then Victor and then uh, Evans will have the last, but it, all in two minutes. Eh? Uh, otherwise I should grab the mic from you. <laughs> Go ahead. Worry. Don't worry, I'll be very fast. Yeah. I think the first question about new entrants, I think in my view, uh, I think the major challenge is just strategy wise preparing, you know, how do you want to go through this market understanding as a business what is what makes sense for me, you know, what type of service, uh, you know, whether it's fixed income or equities, or service providing, how do I approach it, I think setting up a team to study the markets, I think is key, that's one area you can, uh, you know, quickly start you don't need a lot of people having a project office structure I think a lot of banks here are already starting that. But understanding what are the fundamentals, you know, for fixed income, for treasury, what do you need for um, corporate debt market? What do you need for equities that, you know, it will be discussed tomorrow? How do I participate in that market? I think capacity building is the biggest, I think, uh, challenge. Um, next question. I really can't add more than what Victor said I, in terms of raising capital uh, from cap how can farmers raise capital? Um, I think education is actually the most important thing, more than the infrastructure necessarily, educating farmers, educating, doing outreach, uh, doing extensive training outside to help them understand the market is, not, is more important in my view than the actual product. The product will come, I think, once people understand it very well. Um, Stefano's questions are very hard, so I might let the others answer this, but tax policy, um, yes, I think it does influence it. Obviously, if I'm being charged 5% versus 10, I'm always gonna lean towards the bank savings, but also the, I think the market matters too, you know? Can I outperform that 5% is also a valid question, I think. Uh, but tax policy is very important. I think government securities will always have an advantage. Like my colleague said, I mean, 80% is government securities, I think. Very high proportions are in government securities, even in other countries. So even if taxes are equal, equal it doesn't necessarily translate uh, in terms of um, <coughs> where the investment will be. So. Uh, I think the risk aspect needs to be really you know, appreciated. Um, I'll stop there. Hopefully I didn't take more than two minutes. I think it's a little over, but uh, it's okay. <laughs> she didn't come after me, so it's okay. <laughs> so Paul. Thank you, thank you. So starting the question on challenges uh, for new entrants, um, I think uh, you will be in a market development state, uh, state uh, as a new entrant. And um, I think one thing I... I see uh, being a challenge is sometimes getting the right balance between what you'll consider risk management and regulation versus the opportunity to grow the market. If you start the market too stiff, uh, most likely you'll actually lose on the momentum that you may create uh, in terms of uh, creating opportunities. So there needs to be a very good balance uh, between uh, risk management structures and creating opportunities uh, for the market, uh, you know, for the, for the market players to come in, both the issuers and the investors. Uh, on the second item on farmers raising capital, I think if I got it right, uh, it was uh, which intermediaries can actually help farmers in raising capital. So my, my guess is that uh, over time, uh, then uh, you'll actually be creating a good number of intermediaries, be in the form of uh, investment banks, who actually do help advise, uh, you know, uh, you know, potential capital raising entities in terms of how to go about uh, raising, you know, finances. You'll also probably eventually get placement agents or investment advisors 
uh, this also, they, they play a great role, especially in raising capital within the private space so that uh, <laughs> they may work, for example, with fund managers to say they have, if a fund manager have clients who are seeking to invest uh, in a private way, but president agent may also know that is a farmer seeking to raise money. So they become very good uh, opportunities to actually uh, provide that capital. Uh, on the issue of tax policies, um, it's, a, it's, it's a tricky balance, uh, honestly, because no government wants to give up all the taxes uh, just to incentivize a market. And uh, they need to be very clear on exactly what objective they're achieving by giving up those taxes. Uh, and I can see the reason for why, for example, uh, governments will do tax incentives for long-term investments and not provide any incentives uh, for short-term investments. Uh, so it's going to be an issue of balancing those objectives and the capacity of actually uh, enticing or rather bringing in a variety of investors. Because if you have those kind of incentives, certainly you get more variety of investors. Uh, so that uh, it, people who don't like a particular tax character of an, of an issuance will avoid that and go for a different, you know, different structure. But can there be the right balance to decide, I'm losing this tax revenue because I'm trying to receive uh, to get this kind of advantage as far as the market is concerned. Thank you. Victor? Yeah, thank you. I guess Ivan will have the easiest time this time around. We'll probably have addressed everything. Uh, I think in terms of challenges, probably um, one of your key challenge right now is understanding the regulatory environment that is being set up by ECMA. I would strongly advise for you to be very close with ECMA, um, understanding what type of regulation is being set up for the wealth management side, that is the investment banking and all that, because then that will advise you uh, once you understand those regulations, then it will be kind of a symbiotic relationship. You'll be able also to give feedback back on what you think works for this jurisdiction and what you think doesn't work. I think one of the single largest opportunity you have is wealth management. If you're able to pull those funds, and I think uh, Mike has highlighted, there are signals that there's money and money is looking for somewhere that it can earn a return and it needs to be packed somewhere. If you provide that port, then the money will come to you. So I think as, as an organization, you need to sit down and make sure that this is within your corporate strategy and therefore you chase it and make sure that the regulations that are being set right now are regulations that are relevant for this market. So that is, I think, the first place I would advise you to start. Uh, for farmers, I'm very passionate about farmers, but farmers are one of that ecosystem that you cannot touch one side. You cannot just touch the lending side of the farmer without touching then how do they sell their inputs at what price? How do they transport their inputs to where they're supposed to be sold? You have to touch the whole ecosystem. Once you mention the name farmer, you cannot just touch one side. You have to touch everything and look at how everything will be, will be taken care of. Most of this is through organizations, either cooperatives or uh, through organizations that the farmers themselves have organized. And that is usually the easiest way to go through because through that organization, you can take care of the whole ecosystem whereby they're able to receive whatever inputs they have. They're able to manage their farming practices and these farming practices are, are, are keep, keep adjusting to the current climate change. As you know, even here in Ethiopia, I'm, I'm aware the weather has changed and therefore that means farmers have to change even the way they do their things. So, you, you just can't supply credit to them and the farming practice they're using is against the weather, they will not be able to pay that credit. So they'll become defaulters. Once they become defaulters, your financial institutions run away from them because they're high risk. Once they're branded as high risk, then they, they won't access the capital again. So you can't touch farmers without taking care of the whole ecosystem. And therefore, it's not one of those questions I'm, I'm, I'm able to answer one, but we have to look at the whole value chain and see how to make sure you've taken care of the value chain until the farmer is able to sell the produce at a preferable price. And they can actually even receive, once that value chain is taken care of, the farmer can even unlock the price 
and sell goods that are still in the farm. They can sell their wheat and get paid even before they have it, harvest the wheat. And that is what a proper capital markets will now help those farmers unlock, such that even when you go to the farm, the farmer will tell you this wheat is already sold and have been paid for it, though it's, it has another two months to mature, another one month to mature. And therefore you have quick liquidity and proper liquidity coming through to the farmers. But that means the whole value chain is taken care of and there are risks that have been covered in that. I think that's it. I don't have to yeah. tackle the other one. Evan, uh, I think uh, I'm getting yeah. pressure that we should wrap up. Yeah, it. I'll skip the first two questions. I don't think I need to cover those again, but I'll just uh, share the tax policy in the U.S. on uh, fixed income. So the way it works in the U.S., uh, corporate bond, uh, the uh, income on a corporate bond is taxed fully at uh, the income tax rates. Uh, federal, so, and then there's, two types of income tax. One is at the federal level, that's the main income tax. And then at the state level, depending on the state that you live, uh, there's likely to be a smaller uh, level of income tax at the state. So uh, if you invest in uh, the federal treasury uh, bills or bonds or notes, uh, you're not going to pay state tax on those federal uh, securities that you're invested in. So you have a very small tax advantage on investing in the federal government securities. If you invest in the state securities, you don't pay federal tax. So you have a very significant uh, tax advantage uh, to the uh, state and local uh, government securities. And therefore uh, those securities provide a significantly lower yield, uh, butter in favor by uh, people in high tax brackets. Uh, so that's uh, essentially how it works in the US. And uh, to wrap up then, I guess I'd just uh, say thank you to uh, Mike and Victor and the whole ECX uh, team that uh, organized and uh, planned uh, the event here. It seems to have been a great uh, first day and I'm uh, grateful to have been a part of it. Well, that brings us to uh, the end of this discussion. And I think join me in uh, Thanking uh, Paul, um, Mike, Vixo, and Evan for an excellent job. Um, uh, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. So the next session is closing, so I have to say something. Oh, okay. Anyway, I want to thank you all for coming for today. It's been a wonderful session. Um, but before we go, please bear with me for just two seconds. Um, what have we gotten out of the whole day? And uh, what is my view of the summary of this? I think it's been emphasized by all these speakers today and you through your questioning that Ethiopia needs a capital market. And therefore there has to be support given to it um, for us to create that um, securities exchange. So it's important. I mean, I don't think anybody said here that we don't need it. Ethiopia needs it. That's one thing I take away. The other thing we also all said uh, through, through the discussion is that it is good to have this securities exchange because the major beneficiary of this is the is Governor Mamo and his national uh, uh, bank, the central bank. And so Governor Mamo should be the number one cheerleader for Mike. He should be the number one cheerleader in the sense that the central bank should be fully, fully, fully behind this because that would help us to have transparency in monetary policy. That's the most important thing. It will help us to have transparency in monetary policy. And when you have uh, transparency in monetary policy, it means that it brings trust and credibility into the financial institutions. So that's why he has to be. The other thing too, which I think came out here is that uh, through questions, through the discussions, Ethiopia needs long-term assets. Ethiopia needs long-term assets because you couldn't man, uh, develop with just treasury bills. Treasury bills or short-term market may not be enough. It needs long-term projects or uh, securities that would go beyond 10 years. Ethiopia needs that. What I also got from you is that these markets 
should not, or the central bank should not operate in isolation. It should continuously, each and every time, engage with the key stakeholders, consult with them, so that the market is not disruptive. And what is most important, which I heard, is that you do not want the central banks to set up interest rates in a way say that they crowd out the private investor. Because what would happen is that the banks, CBE, Ethiopian Commercial Bank, would just say, ah, why should I loan to Joe, who is not going to pay or it will take a long time to pay? Let me just go and buy treasury bills and pack it. I'm guaranteed at least I'll get 30% from it. That's what is happening in Ghana. So you don't want that to happen, right? But you, if, if that is not going to happen, then the central bank and the, there has to be coordination between the Ministry of Finance and the central bank governor to ensure that we have macroeconomic stability. That would be the only way to ensure that interest rates and inflation will be appropriately done. So we need that. We also, through you, we've understood that there is appetite in Ethiopia for investor, investment to put their money in capital markets. Investors have excess liquidity, which they want to pack. And so one of the places that can support the government is true investment. So it's important to do that. And what also we pointed out, and it was eloquently uh, uh, um, said by Victor, is that capital markets are for all. It is not only for um, the banks or the rich, it is for all which he articulated, he articulated through his example about the farmer, although he was talking about the Nyamachoma. But, uh, you know, um, it's for all. And it's a whole ecosystem that you cannot help only the farmer, but you have to help. And one thing I liked about what you said is, through the capital markets, Victor, you were saying that Ethiopia can develop, you know, um, uh, warehouse receipts so that the poor farmer may be able to say that, look, I have this, wheat which i've made can i here's my receipts it's been verified can you give me some money and i think again that is a a very brilliant policy for poverty alleviation for the farmer so therefore i think it is for all and i think when we talk about capital markets let's not think about it as for the rich this is what we got from that and the last thing which is important is to ensure that we find the right calibration between regulation. We shouldn't over-regulate the market, but at the same time, we should find the right uh, calibration between risk management and uh, uh, regulation. So this is for the policymakers to think about, to have that. And also with the tax policies, I think you need an appropriate tax policy that would not discourage investments, but rather would incentivize investment into the capital market. So this is my takeaway, this is my summary. But on the other hand, as I close, I'd want to thank each one of you for coming. Um, please study hard. Tomorrow morning at nine, eight o'clock in the morning, there'll be an exams. So make sure that you cover all the topics. Mike is the uh, professor and he will be marking your grades. So, and he's a very strict professor, so please. But enjoy the evening. Uh, tomorrow we come back at what time? 8.30? 8.30. So we are all invited back at 8.30 tomorrow. Thank you all. Have a great evening. Thank you very much. We will be sharing uh, a feedback form through your emails. So kindly don't put it on the junk box. Complete it. It would help us improve the session. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you.